morning, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, and feel free, for those of you who are in the room, to please move up. Um, there are a few seats up front. It makes it feel like an experience. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just get us started on, on this amazing morning and day we have planned. Um, I'm Paul Butler. I'm the President and Chief Transformation Officer here at New America. We describe New America as a think and action tank. So we're engaged in both the policy and the practice. Um, and we're responding to demographic, technological, and social change around the world. Uh, we focus our work in five areas, education, democracy, technology, family well-being, and global security. Um, and so that last one you'll hear a lot more about today. On behalf of Anne-Marie Slaughter, our CEO, and all of the staff here at New America, welcome to the Future Security Forum. This is our ninth forum, um, co-organized with Arizona State University, um, who you will meet shortly and be seeing throughout the day. Um, this is our premier event with ASU, and so we're glad to be here again. We are working together with ASU on a full range of security issues facing the U.S. and the world. And how do we do that? We produce new and original research that pr promotes transparency and understanding of America's counterterrorism warfare. We report on the origins, and we have reported and continue to report on the origins of the future of proxy warfare, including much work on the Wagner Group. We report on the impact of climate change and the study of the future of security as it relates to our climate around the world. And we're working with many, many different techniques to do this work. One of the things that we do across all of the work of New America is fellows and fellowships. And so we are very proud to be working with ASU to support fellows on their groundbreaking research and writing. Um, two of those uh, we're delighted to support and just call out um, Kamir Kidia, who's working on the colonial origins of global mental health. Fascinating work. We're very excited about that. And Philip Bennett, who's working on a biography of the journalist Anthony Shadid. Also important work, uh, which you all will see shortly. Um, we're also supporting major books. Um, and all of the staff and fellows across both ASU and New America are partnering on a number of publications. Uh, one I wanted to call out came out last year. Um, it's a book with Oxford University Press. It's called Understanding the New Proxy Wars. Um, so you will hear more about some of that work through the day. It was written and edited by members of ASU and New America. We've also helped push U.S. combatant commands to provide better reporting of U.S. strikes and their death toll in Somalia and beyond. And we work closely with ASU and the Future Security Initiative, which you'll be hearing about today. And we want to thank, in particular, our partners at the Strategic Studies Institute at the U.S. Army War College, who have partnered with us in many prior years. And finally, as you all are experiencing today, both here in the room and online, we convene. Through events and gatherings like this, with experts like those assembled here, we bring critical discussions of the future of security to the general public, not just here in DC and in Arizona, but literally around the country and around the world. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce James O'Brien, who's the Senior Vice President of University Affairs and the Chief of Staff to the President at ASU. He's been a longtime partner and supporter of New America, and I'm delighted to introduce you to him by video. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Welcome to the Future Security Forum. I'm James O'Brien, Senior Vice President of University Affairs at Arizona State University. This is the ninth annual convening of the Future Security Forum by ASU and New America. The impact of this event is really quite extensive. We've had more than 3,000 participants, um, attendees in the event over the years, and more than 23,000 uh, participants in uh, live streaming broadcasts. Additionally, the content that you see today 
and content from the past is incorporated into ASU's master's degree in global security so that the learnings, the ideas, the innovations that may uh, uh, arise from the discussions and, and the presentations today can carry on and, and be brought into the uh, uh, teaching and learning environment that uh, ASU uh, brings to the forum. Uh, uh, the kind of content that you um, will be able to see today and, and, and I think benefit from involves uh, speakers and participants from really all sectors of our society who uh, are interested in or participate in question addressing questions of national security, whether that's the U.S. military, uh, the United States government, uh, industry, um, uh, uh, think tanks. So it's just a broad base of talent integrated into these discussions and from which we hope to draw uh, new ideas and, and new energy. The uh, forum now is um, part of a larger uh, undertaking, uh, also initiated by ASU and New America, and that is the Future Security Initiative which will be an expansion of the um, kinds of work, uh, the, the kinds of ways that the work will manifest itself. And so we're going to build on the, uh, uh, the prior nine years here and, and do more um, and incorporate uh, more ideas and more people into this, this, um, uh, these kinds of uh, undertakings. So uh, great success in the past. I think a great event today. And as we move forward, I, I, at ASU, we just want to celebrate the tremendous energy, the tremendous opportunity that these kinds of convenings offer. Um, the ASU New America relationship in many ways is a continuing experiment. How do you take the nation's largest public university and have it work with and collaborate and integrate with um, New America and Washington, D.C.? That has, uh, I think, as this forum uh, suggests, produced tremendous value and impact for the benefit of the country. I think there's more to come. I think today's uh, activities are an example of that. And it's really with uh, great pleasure that uh, ASU um, is able to work with New America to produce this event and um, uh, enjoy what you learn here today, enjoy the discussions. And we all look forward then to taking the ideas, the best of the ideas and uh, putting them into practice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to introduce now the, our first panel. Uh, we have um, Hila Rasul Ayub, who is the director of our Pl Planetary Politics Initiative at New America. She's going to moderate the panel. Um, it is uh, the title of the, of the panel is What Systemic Shifts Will Shape the Future of Conflict? We're going to particularly focus on climate change and also migration issues. Thank you, Peter, and welcome everyone. Um, and welcome to this panel discussion on the nexus of climate change, migration, and conflict. Climate change is rapidly remapping where humans can exist on the planet. As optimum conditions shift away from the equatorial zones to the poles, more than 600 people, million people have already been stranded outside of the crucial environmental niche that best supports life. By later this century, three to six billion people between one third and a half of humanity could be trapped outside of that zone facing extreme heat, food scarcity and higher death rates, unless emissions are sharply curtailed and mass migration is accommodated. So because we have 30 minutes for discussion and 15 minutes for uh, audience questions, I wanna just dive right into it. It gives me great pleasure to introduce this illustrious panel from across several time zones and climate zones. We are joined for, by, from Baghdad by Ambassador Farid Yassin, Climate Envoy of the Republic of Iraq, former ambassador to the United States. From Texas, I am happy to introduce Jeff Goodell, a former New America Fellow Jeff's latest book, very scary title, is a New York Times bestseller, The Heat Will Kill You First, Life and Death on a Scorched Planet. He is the author of six previous books, including The Water Will Come, Rising Seas, Sinking Cities, and The Remaking of the Civilized World. 
and from Geneva gives me great pleasure to be joined by Director General Elect Amy Pope for, uh, for the uh, International Organization of Ma Migration. DG Elect Pope is currently the Deputy Director General for Management and Reform of IOM. Prior to jo joining IOM, uh, she served as Senior Advisor on Migration to President Biden. And in the Obama administration, she served as deputy assistant to the president and deputy homeland security advisor. And so with that, I will just jump into uh, my first question uh, for Ambassador Yassin. In a country like Iraq, which is the fifth most climate vulnerable country to climate breakdown, not only is climate induced water scarcity exacerbating conflicts, but some of the origins of the water scarcity are from previous rounds of conflict, which has led to a great deal of instability, to say the least, and weakened institutions. As we see greater migration from rural areas facing uh, acute scarcity, what is the absorbative capacity of these urban centers to take in these new migrants internally within Iraq and to temper any rising communal conflict? Over to you, Ambassador Yassin. Switch on my microphone. Um, thank you for asking this uh, question. that goes to, right to the, the problem. Um, so first off, um, in Iraq, uh, urban centers, and like in many parts of the world, are already operating at, at uh, above capacity in terms of infrastructure, whether it's roads, whether it's uh, water facilities, whether it's electricity. Um, uh, so Baghdad now is, I don't know, um, multiple times the population that it's that it's was designed to to accommodate so this is something that we we, we have to take into account what really helps in terms of um, uh, handling uh, migrants and uh, and refugees if you will in in a country like Iraq is that that we have very uh, powerful cultural um, uh, solidarity networks whether they're family oriented or clan or religious they really help and uh, remove uh, remove a lot of the tensions on this uh but the truth is we won't be able to accommodate uh, more of these uh, waves as they as they become uh, more frequent uh, our climate change what the migrations that we're seeing right now in iraq are not really due to climate change they're really due to uh, lack of water um, droughts, uh, but these droughts uh, are in induced essentially by upstream damming uh, in uh, damming in upstream countries. We've lost some like 40% of our water inflow over the last uh, 10, 20 years. Um, we also have to do a lot better in terms of water management, but this is an issue that we will have to be dealing with and, and, and dealing with more and more, more appropriately. I think uh, the answer to uh, for Iraq's problems, as it is for other countries, is to develop and revive our countryside, to develop a network of you know um, climate resilient uh, villages, towns uh, that can accommodate uh, lack of water uh, through technology. I mean, we're very fortunate to be living in the 21st century, and uh, there are examples of new technologies that are making it possible to develop agriculture in extremely uh, arid areas. Now, there are some technologies, for example, that have reduced the water intake of, um, uh, of um, olive plantations by 96%, sorry, 94%. So instead of having uh, the need for 100 liters, you need only six. I mean, these are, these are things that, that, that can change the uh, the, the the overall conditions but of course you have to prepare for that and you have to prepare for that by developing the appropriate infrastructure by developing the the right culture uh, and by getting your populations ready nonetheless uh you know water water scarcity is not the only thing that will accrue from climate change <laughs> as was very well expressed in the book you just mentioned um the heat will kill you first and I can tell you that uh, the heat is no joking matter. Uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we had five successive days of uh, 50 plus uh, temperate degrees in, in, in Baghdad. It's nothing to joke about. We have to be ready. 
Thank you, uh, Ambassador Yassine. And, and kind of uh, on your point on adaptive technologies and the need for them, especially um, given that we're, we're unlikely to get ahead on, on mitigation measures, I'd like to turn to Jeff. You say in your book, The Heat Will Kill You First, that as heat waves become more intense and more common, they will become more democratic. But until that happens, the heat is exposing deep fissures of inequity and injustice. Not everybody has access or can afford adaptive technologies like air conditioning or some of the technologies that Ambassador Yassine just mentioned. You also delve deep into the idea that heat is predatory from a migration and security point of view. It preys on the most vulnerable first. So how do we reduce the impulse to flee within these places that are most vulnerable and the people that are most vulnerable? And how do we democratize access to adaptive technologies? Thank you. Those are um, really uh, excellent questions and um, very complex questions about, um, you know, I th for, let me start with the idea that I think that, you know, for too long in the climate discussion, there's been this binary uh, between, you know, mitigation or adaptation. And we haven't been able to have both conversations kind of at the same time. Uh, people think, have thought before that talking about adaptation takes away from the political uh, inertia and energy towards mitigation. And if you talk um, about um, mitigation, uh, that will take away from any kind of um, political momentum for adaptation. First of all, so I think we need to really reframe the, the larger conversation because obviously what's driving, um, you know, th these uh, migration problems that we talk about in my book, I talk about heat as a uh, kind of force of planetary chaos. Um, and so we need to like turn down the thermostat, right? And that's the you know, like number one thing that we can't forget about, which is reducing fossil fuel emissions as quickly as possible, much faster than what we're doing. But then, you know, we also have to think and talk about adaptation. And, you know, that gets into um, technology for sure, um, like uh, Ambassador Yassine was talking about, but it's also, you know, deeply political. And it's about um, this divide between you know the wealthy and the vulnerable and that is i see that here in texas i live in austin you know uh there's it's been a summer of uh, brutal extreme heat and you can see you know the outdoor workers people who are working on the streets uh, farm workers you know incredibly vulnerable to these outdoor conditions and and then there's you know the knowledge workers and others who are sitting inside in their air conditioned offices and you know just think that it's like a little bit higher of an electricity bill so how do you how, how do you deal with this um how do you deal with this separation and you know we have a governor in texas who for political reasons decided to pass legislation making it illegal for any city or county in texas to pass laws requiring water breaks and shade breaks, rest for outdoor workers. I mean, it's, you know, climate has been politicized in a very powerful way here. So, you know, the answer to these questions is technological. Yes, we can figure out ways to um, develop cheaper air conditioning, better access to air conditioning um, for people who can't afford it. We can subsidize um, uh, electricity rates um, to make it cheaper for people who do have AC to, to run them. We can think about cooling technologies. There's a lot of technological um, solutions to some of these problems, but it's also, you know, a deeply political problem. And it's a deeply political problem, you know, in the most straightforward sense, but also in, you know, just like money um, in the sense of uh, we see that in the international climate negotiations with the Green Climate Fund and things like that. So it's it's a um, the, to me when we think about you know how we we're going to deal with this gap, we have to think uh, first about politics. Thanks, Jeff. And and on politics, <laughs> I'd like to turn it over to Director General um, Elect uh, Amy Pope. You know, IOM as 
an agency, as an organization that works very much directly on the ground with the populations most affected. Um, in, in my previous work in development, I've worked very closely with IOM, and they've always been on the forefront acknowledging the impacts that climate change over time, and then as well as uh, immediate um, climate-induced disasters have on populations in the displacement of people. But it's it's also a very political question, and uh, given your where you sit in some of the not necessarily aversion to delving into politics, but acknowledging the impact that climate has on politics and that politics has on acknowledging climate, how much is uh, IOM investing in activities that? Um, address ad ad adaptation measures and if there are any specific initiatives or uh, programs that the IOM is planning to implement to promote climate resilient migration both within countries and internationally um, we'd love to hear more about that. Thank you, Gila. And I also just want to say thank you to New America and ASU for even raising this issue. Um, it's one that, frankly, I think is not getting enough attention given how significant the impact will be on hundreds of millions of people into the future. Um, I was actually just in Kenya for the Africa Climate Summit. Um, and when I was there, in addition to engaging with the, the government officials, I also made a trip out to Dadaab which many of you will know is one of the world's um, largest and longest standing refugee camps where over 100,000 people have come over the last um, about two years because of the drought in Somalia. And those people are joining um, hundreds of thousands of people who are already displaced and are unable to go home because frankly, they don't have a way to live at home, right? And when we talk about Somalia, we're talking about conflict, Obviously, they've had a long history of conflict and continued threats as a result of al-Shabaab. But when you layer that on top of the inability of communities to make a living, and many communities are agricultural or pastoral, so they are literally depending on the land to feed themselves and their children, um, you, you immediately see how climate change is becoming a threat multiplier. So it is, first and foremost, if you cannot make a living, if you have no future at home, moving is the most human adaptation strategy that now exists, right? Um, and if you add in communities that have been facing conflict, especially for a prolonged period of time, you can see how climate is actually destabilizing and preventing um, more durable solutions in those communities. So from my point of view, number one is just building awareness about what's happening. And, and you know, for a lot of these communities, there is no low cost air conditioning solution. They, they just, I mean, they have very little, right? They're living um, in, in very basic circumstances. So building awareness of what we're seeing right now on the ground and how that will impact communities across the world, that's, that's key. Two is driving the political consensus that, that this is happening. So I was in uh, Africa, in, in Kenya, because we are helping to facilitate what's known as the Kampala Declaration, which is basically an acknowledgement by African member states of the impact of climate on human mobility. Because that consensus doesn't yet exist. Everybody sees it. You know, one of the, the ministers said to me, well, but it's obvious. It's obvious, but but there's still this unwillingness to acknowledge. And the reason why that's so important is because then that allows us to build climate change and climate adaptation into national planning, into resource mobilization, into strategic um, thinking. So for me, this is, this is, there's an awareness raising, there's a political consensus driving, and then there's on the ground, what is our direct response and our ability to provide more stability for communities that are impacted? So there's a tremendous amount of work that needs to happen. And we are so far behind where we need to be given um, the real threat this poses to existing communities and then the destabilizing uh, follow-on impact it will have as a result. 
Thank you. I, and I particularly appreciate that that last point, because I think for those of us who work in this space, we take it for granted that there is consensus, but there is, in fact, not that consensus that is necessary. In fact, there are powers that be that are shifting the consensus to the other side. So on, on that, and Ambassador Yassin, you do get very political in your role, as you should. But, you know, I think um, we think measures and uh, we think about these large-scale COP uh, convenings and the like, but a lot of the agreements that we have to come to must be done at the regional level. You alluded earlier to um, uh, the lower flow rate of the rivers in Iraq due to uh, some of your regional neighbors, Turkey and Iran in particular. Can you share a little more with us about how uh, Iraq is engaging with those regional um, neighbors on um, the urgency of shared water resources and how that figures into other regional considerations? Uh, thank you. This is a, a critical issue. You know, oil is precious, but water is even more precious because it's vital for our life. And so um, in uh, every country has to take into account the requirements of its own uh, population, even before uh, looking at the requirements of the of, of downstream countries. But, uh, you know, there are historic precedents. One has to take into account Iraq would be nothing without its two rivers. Uh, my, my slogan is, you know, Iraq, the land of the two rivers, let's keep it that way and let's keep them flowing. Um, so I, I think there are examples that we could uh, we could emulate in terms of uh, wise management, equitable management of, uh, of, of water uh, that uh, have been implemented. I'm, I can think, for example, of the um, Mekong Delta Authority or the way the European Union uh, handles uh, their rivers that cross, go through several countries. Um, uh, but the, 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 the real issue that I want to raise uh, uh, here is, is that in fact, there is, even though action has to be local, but the resources that are needed uh, are of such a magnitude that this has to be a global, uh, global collective effort. Uh, there is so much need. And the issue is really down, boils down to equity. Uh, the countries that will be most vulnerable to climate change have done in the uh, end of the calculations very little to uh, raise the level of, of, of CO2 in the atmosphere, which is where it is because of history, because of the fact that, you know, the industrial revolution has been going on for, 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 for actually more than a century. And so we need to uh, focus on this aspect of equity and to uh, uh, force a consensus to get the countries of the world all to chip in to, as, as they can, according to their resources, and also, according to the needs of the countries that will be most at need. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to point out here is that uh, we are all trying to uh, talk about achieving the Paris consensus, which is, you know, uh, capping the uh, increase of uh, average temperatures uh, to 1.5, uh, but that's an average. Uh, you know, uh, there are countries that will get less, there are countries that will get a lot more really a lot more. And uh, my concern as an Iraqi climate envoy is that Iraq is going to be, is most likely to be one of those countries where uh, the temperature rise is going to be way more than uh, than 1.5 degrees. And that's going to be also the case of our neighboring countries. Uh, and so how do we deal with it? Well, we have to get our act together, do what we need to do, but then we will require the help of the international community as as, as much as they can in terms of technology, in terms of resources, uh, and perhaps in terms of a little more water from our neighboring countries. Thank you, Ambassador Yassin. And, and to that point uh, on, you know, the impact of increased carbon emissions does not stay within borders. Um, and so we are seeing the impact of it uh, on the more vulnerable countries, most vulnerable communities. Um, and so this uh, it brings me to a point that you made, Jeff, in, in your book. Um, as a lawyer, I really appreciated your um, examination of the science of extreme event attribution, especially as we go into the next COP and ongoing discussions around loss and damage funds. 
what will it take for the international community to accept attribution and attach monetary value to it, um, particularly with special interests playing a very significant role in these discussions? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think, um, I don't know what it will take to, um, you know, uh, gain recognition of the of of the power of this attribution science and, and how that will exactly play out. But I think it's one of the most important developments in climate science right now, and actually in kind of climate politics right now, um, because it is, um, you know, for a long time, um, scientists have when they talked about attribution, you know, of uh, extreme events, a hurricane, a drought, a heat wave, uh, they always quoted uh, James Hansen's line about, um, you know, climate um, loads the dice so that, you know, these extreme events are more likely, but we could never say, oh, this heat wave or this storm was caused by higher levels of CO2. Well, now, Attribution science, which is, um, I have a chapter about in my book, it's basically um, a kind of modeling that, that looks at extreme events and, and, and asks, would this have happened without the, the higher levels of CO2 in the atmosphere or not? And I write about a German scientist named Frederica Otto, who is on the forefront of this. Um, and, it, and, you know, they've been able to advance this science far enough that, you know, she and others tell me, you know, it, it can stand up in court. And what they've done is, is, it's not that they look at every event and say, aha, you know, uh, this was caused by climate change. They're able to discern that some um, events are climate driven, like the heat wave in the Pacific Northwest in 2021. They've said virtually could not have happened without the elevated levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. Then they looked at the Pakistani floods last year, and they basically said, no, this was within the range of sort of natural events, and we don't see CO2 as a driver. But what's really important about this is it begins to, um, you know, change the political dynamics, because you can now look at this and say, look, you in the, in the global north, or you ExxonMobil, or, or, you know, um, caused this. In the same way that, you know, uh, it's not an exact comparison, but it's a fair enough comparison of smoking and tobacco, you know, um, we now can attribute these events. And so once we can attribute these events with some degree of actual, what's close to factual certainty, that changes the political discussion in a big way. And, and, it, and it recalculates this big question that's at the heart of what we're talking about, about mitigation, adaptation, and security which is what do the rich, you know, who are causing the problem owe to, you know, the people who are in the refugee camps and um, that Amy is talking about, and what does justice and equity mean in this world now? And um, this attribution science is changing that in a very dramatic way. Thank you, Jeff. And then for Director General-elect Pope, you know, I, I threw out some very dramatic numbers earlier uh, at the top of this conversation. And, and while that might resonate for some, I think it's too far removed from people's day-to-day -day realities. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, IOM has been doing excellent work on documenting and researching and seeing where the, that nexus is between climate change, disasters, uh, conflict, and, and migration. So, you know, there are conversations within these COPs, the UNF, Triple C, uh, among others, but they seem so high level. How is the IOM working with these um, other organizations to create a coordinated and effective responsive strategy that deals with the day to day of people's lives and brings it down a few levels? So I, I wish I could say that it was fully coordinated and effective. I think because um, we're, we're not fully at the point where we have appreciated the threat, the response is actually not where it needs to be. I mean, take, for example, um, what we know about communities that are going to be most impacted by climate disaster. And the truth is, um, we know very little, right? So part of my um, priorities coming into the organization is to engage with our sister agencies as well as, as those other entities that are collecting the data 
on which communities are going to be most impacted by climate disaster, drought, flood, um, sea level rise to, to start, right? And then identify which vulnerabilities exist in those communities. So for example, um, if you are completely dependent on um, uh, you know, farming and we project that you're actually not going to be able to farm, what are we doing now to engage? Right now, that's not happening. There is not a concerted effort globally to, to approach the problem set that way. And so that means that the solutions are lacking and they're very ad hoc. So we have really great solutions, you know, working with a community in South Sudan who has been displaced by flooding to help them do better water management. But we do not have across the board a strategic approach where we're systematically applying the data, overlaying it with uh, vulnerability of communities and then coming up with interventions on the adaptation side. So that's where the work needs to happen. Um, and that's why the awareness raising is so critical to, to the future. Thank you so much. And I think we are almost at time, but before we go to audience questions, one thing that I like to do with panels, I always acknowledge that when we have such a, a gathering of great minds and experiences, I, I, I like to give people the opportunity to ask uh, one another questions. And so I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you all if you have any questions for one another. Well, at the risk of betraying my age, I'd like to make a comment. So I, I, uh, most of the models that uh, are looking at uh, our evolution as a, as a species under the impact of climate change take 2050 as uh, a target uh, for net zero or 2040. Uh, 2050 is, uh, to me, not that far off. Uh, I started working on climate change issues in 1996. That's 27 years ago. And 2050 is 27 years from now. So this is real. It, it's no joke. It's it's something, I don't know if I'll be there, but you, sir, I hope, I'm pretty sure you will be. And so this is about the livelihoods of all the people, or actually a great chunk of the people who are attending uh, this, this workshop. This is about you. It's not about strangers. Uh, this is something that engages us all, and we have to address it because we'll have to live with it, hopefully. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add one thing to that, which is, um, you know, the reason I gave my book the, as you described, scary title of uh, The Heat Will Kill You First is because I really wanted, I, I think that the discussion about climate and impacts has been kind of marooned in this sort of middle future um, for too long and um, dominated by scenarios and arguments about scenarios and future people that will be impacted and future you know, water flows and future projections of heat and all that. And, you know, I think that, I, I mean, in my book, I really wanted to underscore that this is happening now, that these impacts are real. They, it, you know, heat can, you can go for a walk on a hot day um, in Baghdad or in Phoenix. And if you're not prepared, you can die in two hours. Um, and this is not hypothetical. This is not some risk that's far in the future. This is a risk that is playing out around us right now in real time that all of us are dealing with. And, um, you know, I just, the, the attempt in my book was to, is, is to do exactly what the ambassador talked about, which is shift this conversation to today, not to 2050. Just to add that um, the, the other angle we, where we are thinking a little bit differently about this is starting to understand and appreciate how migration can actually be one of the climate adaptation strategies. So if people no longer have the opportunity to make a living because of climate factors that have completely eroded uh, their economic opportunities at home, how do we build strategies that enable them to take opportunities that may be elsewhere. In some cases, that's gonna be within a country. So um, we've seen a lot of um, uh, natural rural to urban migration, but it's important that we start to do planning around that. And then when we think about the demographic changes that we expect to see in the world um, much more broadly, can we think about how do we enable communities that cannot adapt at home to take the jobs that might be elsewhere. So again, thinking about 
not just how do we avoid a mass migration, how do we do migration that's going to work in the face of a changing climate? Thank you all. And I think then we can turn it over to audience questions. I think we'll have some questions coming from our virtual audience as well as the mic in the room. So we'll give it a, a minute or for questions to come through. Question for Ambassador Yassin. Um, uh, this is Peter Bergen. Um, can you sort of assess? Obviously, there's great wealth disparities in the in the Middle East. You know, the, the Saudis, the Qataris, the Emiratis have a lot of resources. How are they uh, doing compared to, say, the Yemens or other countries without many resources that are equally affected? Well, both the Emiratis and the Saudis, uh, and I've observed their uh, attitude during the uh, climate change negotiations. Uh, in the very beginning, they, like many uh, people working in the oil industry, uh, were dubious, were deniers, if you will, and uh, in fact tried to um, not scuttle but delay discussions. And uh, in fact, I remember their their chief negotiator was very often uh, offered the Fossil of the Year Award by uh, organizations like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, um, you know, climate activists. Uh, the attitude that you feel, uh, that you sense from the chief negotiators from Saudi Arabia, from uh, the Emirates, is completely different. It's very responsible, and uh, there is a concerted effort on their part to try to use their resources to develop technologies that will help uh, to the greatest degree, mitigate uh, the uh, impact of uh, uh, climate of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, they're they're doing a lot of effort, for example, on on carbon capture use and storage. Whether uh, that will be a, a, a silver bullet, I I don't know, uh, but it's certainly something that needs to be uh, to be pursued uh, and 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 worked on. Uh, one of my pet uh, ideas is to try to uh, talk about the countries uh, in, around the Persian Gulf, uh, Arabian Gulf, call it what you will, um, is to see whether we can develop a common stand in these negotiations. Because, uh, in fact, uh, one of the reasons why I think Saudi Arabia is moving in the direction that it that it did um, is because they are confronted to heat. And uh, you know, you mentioned uh, Jeff mentioned. Um, uh, heat in in in, in Texas. Uh, I, th I think I heard that uh, the municipality of Riyadh just passed a law forbidding people from working outdoors between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. Uh, so these are adaptation strategies that would not have come to their minds had they not been so aware of the of the impact of of climate change and uh, the, the fact that it really can kill you. I think one thing we were remiss in mentioning um, in the course of this panel was, you know, there is some focus on adaptive measures and mitigation measures, um, but we are also going into a new great competition over a battle of resources for renewable energies themselves. And so this is creating a, a new kind of geopolitical tension and geopolitical competition, um, primarily between the US and China, but among others. And so I, I would like to pose this question to all three panelists. How, how do you see this impacting those communities that currently house those resources? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about this. I, I think it, you know, this is going to have a profound impact on uh, geopolitics as, you know, the kind of um, power structures have been developed uh, around the world by this wealth of fossil fuels. And, and um, we can argue about the timing and, and we can argue about this pace of the decline, but clearly this transition away from fossil fuels is happening and will continue to happen. And there will be um, sort of winners and losers in this end game, but the end game is happening, right? And so everyone now is scrambling for, you know, the, the, the next kind of oil. And, you know, the, so we have 
the rare minerals that are needed for, for batteries. We have um, things like lithium that are, were never considered valuable, you know, 20 years ago, who cared about lithium? Um, and now, so, so places like Greenland, for example, right, um, which, which was just seen as this place, you know, uh, with a lot, of, a lot of ice and some fishing villages and just like not a part of the sort of geopolitical um, strategy map in, in any powerful way, now all of a sudden is, you know, in, in the middle of this mad gold rush for, for rare minerals and things. And that gives them a lot of leverage and a lot of power and, you know, is shifting the, the sort of larger geopolitical conversations about where the future lies, you know, what, what impact will this have in the Middle East as, as, you know, oil declines in value? I mean, obviously there's all kinds of um, ways of propping up value and, and prices, but in the long run, you know, this is going to change. And as you mentioned, the Saudis and others know this, but it's still going to be a, a great geopolitical shift as we, in the decade or two, as we see this transition accelerate. Um, for sure it will. Uh, my advice to countries uh, that are fortunate enough to have uh, resources is to pay attention to what happened to countries with oil. Uh, the oil curse is a reality. So uh, they really should formulate their thinking in terms of long-term uh, planning. Uh, look as far ahead as they can, think of their future generations, and get the best international lawyers they can to work with them. <laughs> yeah. We have one uh, question from our um, virtual audience, um, and this is to all panelists. Um, how to persuade, convince national governments that need to address, mitigate climate change that it is now and immediate? I actually think that um, this tie to mobility and, and migration is actually a really concrete example of how climate is impacting communities, right? If you are um, in many places around the world, you're seeing people who are displaced by climate. There are many, many um, uh, senior officials in other parts of the world who are concerned about mass migration and what the destabilizing impact that might have on their communities. Um, for me, talking about and seeing the evidence of people moving is one of our best ways to, to demonstrate that this is happening, right? People are leaving because they have no other choice. And so um, tying it to what we're seeing on the ground, making clear what the connection is, driving the political consensus around that, um, that's all part of persuading national governments that, that this is no joke. I mean, it, it also helps, by the way, that people in places like Arizona felt it firsthand. Um, people in places like Switzerland, where I am, felt it firsthand. And so um, that is that is part of, you know, the lived experience, if you will. Well, um, what, what I'll say is that uh, um, what we're doing right now is part of what we need to do. We have to raise awareness, as Amy has said, and a lot of people are doing excellent work to make that to make people aware of what's happening. Uh, Jeff's book was mentioned. I really urge you all to read it. But there have been some remarkable uh, pieces of reporting by journalists across the globe. Uh, one I will mention in particular is, is a, a piece by um, um, Alyssa Rubin and colleagues of the New York Times, who went and followed with technical equipment. I mean, this is not something you could do on a on a print paper, but you can do it online, where they took uh, instruments that could measure the body temperature of an Iraqi worker uh, in Basra, um, going out to work very early in the morning before sunup because he wanted to get his job done before temperatures would be uh, too unlivable. Uh, compare that to the life of one of the you know his neighbors, not two distant neighbors, the Kuwaiti university professor who lives uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a protected environment with uh, an appropriate infrastructure. Um, these are things that will uh, can make people sense how direct 
this threat is uh, in terms of impacting our lives to be a, a you know a, a a worker under uh noon te noon temperatures in texas or in iraq or in arizona or, is not something to be envied and uh and I, and I think this is something that we have to factor in and i have to say i i know jeff in your book you do mention this a, a great deal uh, you know and what i appreciated most about your book is that it started off with stories of families that look like mine young families, healthy families in the U.S. with the means to adapt to the heat, and yet they are being affected too. And so it, I think for so long, so many people in positions of power and for who can influence those in positions of power have felt fairly inoculated because it's always, you know, those people in Bangladesh who are facing flooding and are going to be underwater and those poor people in the Horn of Africa who are facing droughts and, and water scarcity, it's not going to affect me in the immediate term, but we're seeing the impacts of it uh, coming to life um in a real way and so how can we catalyze on this moment to shift public opinion in a way that can influence large-scale policy decision making yeah and that goes to this question of you know 15 years ago i had a conversation you know with al gore about um you know kind of what it takes to wake people up to the risks and consequences of climate change and he talked about everybody having their kind of oh shit moment as he called it where they realize the scope and scale of what we're really talking about here and you know I think I've over the years I've talked to many people and it's true many of us have had our our oh shit moments you know I asked President Obama um a couple of years ago when I was traveling in Alaska with him and he talked about seeing um the changes in the barrier in the coral reefs in Hawaii and that he used to swim and snorkel among when he was a kid and seeing them bleached out and changing and that was really kind of you know one of the things that really woke him up but you know I I've put aside this notion that we're going to have some kind of collective awakening this is going to be trench warfare you know two steps forward one step back this is you know we see that in America very clearly now where you know we have one political party that essentially thinks that climate change is a hoax and to the point of security and migration that we've been talking about, you know, we would like to think that as we get educated and smarter about this, we'll see people in mo in, mo in motion, understand the risks and consequences of that, understand how the threat to security and deal with it in a kind of rational way. Um, in fact, in Texas, what we see is, you know, razor blades in the Rio Grande and, you know, more calls for armed, uh, border patrols I mean it can also work in the opposite direction right which is one of the great dangers um, that I think we face now is especially with migration is you know using that as an excuse to divide and to build walls and how do we how do we broaden the security question to be not just about you and your family but about us and the world no, that's an that's an excellent point. Um, if I may avail on our panelists to take just one more question from our live audience. Yes, hello. This is Andres Martinez, the editorial director of Future Tense, another ASU New America collaboration. Um, this conversation has been great, and it hits very close to home. We've mentioned Arizona. I was um, live there now and, and survived the 31 consecutive days of 110 <laughs> plus degrees. That is Fahrenheit, so it's, um, just to, to clarify. Um, I was, I've been really struck, Jeff, to hear you talk about the tension between um, adaptation and mitigation and the sense that the politics doesn't allow to talk about both. And I, um, what feels like a lifetime ago, I think we had you at a or your first New America events talk about geoengineering of all things. And so a question for you and, and for the others is, um, are we in a place that you feel we can still explore uh, and deploy technology to serve as part of the answer um, to this looming crisis or, or present crisis really? Um, or are the politics where, as you said, you know, some people want to say this is a hoax, other people perhaps want to say we need to change our behaviors 
I, some days I worry that there's actually no space to really at least look at technology as, as part of the answer, but uh, really eager to, to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thanks, Andres. Um, so I think we, when we talk about broadly about technology, you know, that's a very um, broad subject. So you, you brought up geoengineering, which is the sort of Frankenstein of technologies, which for people who don't know about this, what we're talking about is, you know, um, basically some nation or even individual putting a, a fleet of aircraft into the sky that distributes particles that act as sort of a solar shade, kind of in some sense, creating an artificial volcano, which would which would um, uh, help reflect away some sunlight and, and cool the earth. It's um, a really bad idea that um, it has some kind of political inevitability as temperatures get hotter and hotter, um, which is a whole other subject that um, uh, I don't think is worth going into right now. But I do think technology, you know, it can be a huge, is obviously a huge tool in, in dealing with this, whether it's, you know, when I was writing my sea level rise book uh, in, in Lagos, uh, I'm reporting in Lagos, you know, they were, I, I um, wrote about a um, uh, Dutch um, Nigerian architect who built a community center it floating in the sort of water slums of, of, of Lagos that just out of sort of, you know, oil drums and uh, spare wood. It was this beautiful structure that changed the relationship of the community um, with the, with each other and was a great example of the kind of technology that sort of anti is not technology is not always, you know, Elon Musk and um, you know, Tesla's and things like that. And here in Texas, you know, we see technology happening and, 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 you know, changing things at a big rate. You know, Texas is the home of fossil fuels. It's the, you know, ancient home of oil and gas in America. And yet during the heat wave, 30% of the power on the grid was coming from basically solar. And, you know, Texas leads the nation in, in, in solar energy, which nobody talks about. Um, this is happening, right? These techno technological changes are happening. There's technology to deal with water shortages, as the ambassador mentioned. You know, more efficient systems of all ways, all kinds. Uh, redesigning how cities uh, are built, more green spaces, all kinds of things like this. Um, but ultimately, you know, I feel with the technology discussion is that it plays into the idea that there's a kind of silver bullet for this problem, that we just need to figure out the right gizmos deployed in the right places and everything will be fixed. And it's not. And, you know, the, the, that's why this conversation is so important is because it's really political and it's about, you know, who gets these gizmos first and where the money flows and what the relationship is of you know these questions about justice and equity that we've talked about that's where um, the difficult part of this transition is is um, stuck right now thank you so much and yeah. Yeah, um, I say something? Uh, um, please uh, please do such a we have so, after time I, I, and I recognize you guys are i'm, I'm a little biased i i think there is a silver there potentially is a silver bullet and it's fusion uh but even if we achieve it if we ever will We'll have to work together to deploy it throughout the world. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't need to uh, mitigate as much as possible, reduce our greenhouse gas emission, emissions as much as possible. But there are things that we could do to uh, to see whether we can come up with a with a silver bullet. And uh, I think we need to do all of the above uh, to ensure the future of mankind. Don't want to be too dramatic, but that's what it, that's what it's all about. Well, we. Hope to continue these conversations um, uh, here at New America and elsewhere. But I think to both of your points, justice and equity um, and human rights really have to be centered in these conversations. Um, I know that we are over time and we have to keep the agenda moving, but I really do want to express my heartfelt appreciation for all of your time. Um, I know that calling in from across different time zones and with your very busy schedules isn't always easy, but appreciate the time that you've made for this all important conversation. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this important thing. Thank you.
Here is Lillian Corral, who is the Vice President of Technology and Democracy here at New America. And we're going to consider what will the future of AI accountability look like? So I'm going to hand it over to Lillian and she will introduce our, one of our keynotes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hi, Alan. Hi. Hi. It's my great pleasure um, today to have uh, this wonderful conversation. Thank you for joining us. Um, with us today is Alan Davidson, the Assistant Secretary for the Department of Commerce um, for Communication and Information. He's also the head administrator of the NTIA. Um, uh, Alan, um, uh, a little bit about you just uh, for this audience, although um, you, do, you know, everybody knows who you are. Um, <laughs> <Sure> but <laughs> um, but uh, Alan has over 20 years of um, experience uh, at the intersection of public interest advocacy and technology and the law. Um, obviously now as the administrator of NTIA, you oversee a lot of the issues that are at the forefront of discussion in the American uh, public debate, uh, AI being one of the most important ones that we'll be talking about today, but other critical ones like our internet infrastructure um, and so on, which we care a lot about at the Open Technology Institute at New America. Um, prior to uh, being at NTIA, um, Alan was the senior advisor for the Mozilla Foundation, um, which is a global nonprofit that also promotes openness, innovation, and participation um, on the internet. And then obviously Alan has a long history of being here at New America, where you know, he was once uh, the director of the Open Technology Institute and also uh, vice president um, of technology policy. So, um, so thank you again for, for joining us. Oh, it's so great to be back here. Thank you. So today is an interesting day to talk yeah. about AI. Um, uh, I, I know somewhere um, in DC, uh, there is also um, a strong uh, a cohort of individuals, uh, leaders in the industry, having um, uh, an important conversation as well on, on the future of AI and AI governance as part of uh, 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 Leader Schumer's Insights Forum. Uh, can we start the conversation here just talking a little bit about how you at NTIA think about balancing the need to police AI and optimize AI. Obviously, a lot of the debate is sort of this, what feels like extreme polarization around, is it really great for our society or you know, will it lead to our extinction? How do you kind of set the tone or it, it kind of lay the ground for your own thinking around this? Uh -huh. Excellent question. Um, well, actually, let me first, by the way, start by saying it is really, truly great to be back here, back at New America, back at this forum. Uh, and I have to say congratulations to the leaders who have been. I, I very vividly remember the, I think it was the first forum that we did uh, in this partnership between New America and ASU. And... Uh, admiring the quality of the conversation. I felt in some ways it was sort of the best of uh, what uh, this community can bring to furthering our thinking on the hard policy issues in front of us. So I just say congratulations to, to Peter, uh, to our colleagues at, uh, at ASU, and for the continuation of the forum. And it's an honor to be here today um, for me. So um, terrific question. And I think uh, the answer is going to be yes. and both, right, like that. Um, the truth is that uh, I think the administration is committed uh, to the idea that responsible innovation in AI is going to bring enormous benefits to humanity, to people. At the same time, we know that there are very real risks and that those risks need to be dealt with and need to be dealt with today, real risks that we are seeing today uh, if we're gonna realize that promise of AI. And, um, you know, I think just to unpack that, the president said it himself very clearly. He said, we have to be clear-eyed about and vigilant about the threats emerging technologies can pose, but there will be enormous, enormous potential upsides as well. And uh, I think that encapsulates our approach, right? You know, the, the rise of these machine learning techniques has been pretty incredible. Uh, it's been coming and building for years. I think many of us have been surprised by how uh, fast some of the most recent uh, developments have been. And we see this is going to transform our society in many, many ways. And the benefits are very clear. You look at something like medicine, uh, disease detection, drug discovery, access to healthcare information by uh, sets of people who might never have had that access. 
All of that is not just on the horizon, it's happening now because of these techniques. Uh, and that's just one area, precision, agriculture, climate change, all these things will benefit from these new machine learning tools. At the same time, we see real risk, right? And we, it's long-term risk and it's also immediate risk. And that we need to address that risk if we're gonna realize those, those promises. Do you think that um, some of this notion that it will lead to our you know, extinction, <laughs> does that sort of obfuscate or kind of make it difficult right. to really address the, the concerns and the, and the regulations that need to be in place? Well, it's a great question because I, I think we see really what should be best thought of as a, a spectrum of risk, right? Uh, and in, in some ways it might be easy to, to, to try to bifurcate it uh, mm -hmm. between the ends of the spectrum. There are longer term risks and we've heard pretty clearly from fairly senior people in the field about their worries about some of those longer term risks. And I think we've taken an approach in the administration to say we need to address those, there are real national security concerns, safety concerns, and we should look at those in the long term. But I think we benefit also from bifurcating that and saying, but there are also, that should not hide the fact that there are immediate risks too. And there's, it's a different track, the immediate risk category. And I think we are seeing real potential harms to privacy, to security, um, concerns about um, human rights and civil rights, concerns about civic discourse. And those do need to, bias, you know, bias in these systems and equity. And those do need to be addressed. You may have already answered it but uh, in that remark, but are there specific issues with how NTIA and the administration are, are, are thinking about the, the concerns around the, uh, the large language models? Are, is there a nature or already some framework that you're thinking about in terms of categorizing right. these issues or risks? Yeah, it's interesting because the, um, you know, it's funny, I'll just say the large language model, for those of us who've been following this space for a while, right, it's not even clear that the large language models are going to be the most impactful or economically consequential, um, you know, developments in this space. Um, but they've really captured the public's imagination. And they're being used already today. And certainly my kids are using ChatGPT. Um, I hope it's not on all their homework, but uh, <laughs> they're using it. And so um, it behooves us to be thinking in a, in a clear-eyed way about what those risks are. Um, and that work has already begun, and it's been in progress, you know, um, uh, from the administration point of view, OSTP, the Office of Science Technology Policy, put out a blueprint uh, for an AI Bill of Rights. Um, we have worked with companies, uh, we'll talk more about it, to, to get commitments from them to address some of the harms that we're seeing today. And I do think that, um, there are these really immediate questions that need to be answered about uh, the large language models and how they're being used and how they're impacting our society. And I'll just say at NTIA, we're thinking a lot about accountability in that space. That's a piece that we've, we, we launched a project about a year ago to talk more about it, but um, to think about how we make sure that models are accountable and do what they say they're gonna do. Yeah, um, I mean, it's interesting you talk about your kids using it. I mean, the yeah. large, I mean, right now it has captured the public ima imagination and being a longtime native Angelina, um, I mean, we're seeing the real dynamic so early on in the development of the technology, that real conflict between the use of AI and then what it's doing to, um, you know, like the creative economy is an example, right? I mean, the, ho the Hollywood strike is very much centered around issues of how AI will impact right. the ability of a whole industry, which is, you know, one of the reasons why our country, um, I, I think, has been so economically and, um, and globally powerful on a cultural level. Um, how do you, I know that the use of it and copyright laws are definitely not within your purview, but how do you, just getting your thinking on how do, does NTIA and commerce more broadly think about the use, balancing kind of these large data sets and the use of them and, and helping that innovative industry and economy grow. And at the same time, how do we protect the rights of creators um, that are, you know, whose work is being absorbed by these models um, and then being used to generate new content at, you know, at, at literally no, no or very little benefit to the, to the original creator? I think it's a, it's a great example of the kinds of dislocations that are coming and some and the pace of it is what is probably in some ways quite surprising. Uh, I will say there this is a very hard set of issues around intellectual property and um, and the and 
particularly large language models, but also just generally in the training of models uh, in, the, in what models produce, um, the question of who owns uh, uh, what a model produces, the question of uh, can, a, can, a, uh, can, a, can an AI own a patent, <laughs> uh, or what does that look like? I think there are people who are thinking about these hard legal and policy questions right now. I'll just say at the Commerce Department, our colleagues at the Patent and Trademark Office have launched a number of inquiries, both on the copyright side and the patent questions that are really interesting, and to also think about how we promote in the United States more innovation, how we provide the kind of intellectual property protections that will promote more creative uses. And um, I think this question for, about artists is quite a real one. We're seeing it play out right now. Um, uh, and I think that will have to, in some ways, that will have to be resolved. Uh, I don't have a great comment on the actual conflict uh, that's going on right now in Hollywood, other than to say I think it's a very good example of the kinds of dislocations that were, or changes that we're going to see. And we need to think about how, um, across the board, these new tools are going to affect work. Uh, in some ways, uh, in, a, in bursty ways. You know, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, I think many of us, I probably would be included, predicted that you know, driverless autonomous systems would, you know, would be here within a decade, and that you know, we might not need truck drivers. Would our kids learn to drive even? Yeah. That has been slow to come. Uh, it turns out some of these problems are harder than we think. Uh, we've made am amazing progress, but we're not there yet. And so the, it's sometimes difficult to predict, but there's, a, as I say, a burstiness, a nonlinearity yep. to these steps forward that I think is part of what's unsettling here. Yes. Um, I, I love that example um, uh, of the autonomous technology because yes, four or five years ago, you know, we thought we were seeing cars on the road any time now, and we right. we know that the progress is made, but then there's definitely a plateau in terms of um, in terms of the development, but also then is the infrastructure really ready to support it? And, and is our policy infrastructure ready to support it? The right? policy and yes, so that's a good question about then kind of jumping ahead to how you see your own policy making. Um, especially, I know that you've had inquiries yourself at, at NTIA about AI governance. What are you hearing? Can you sort of, one, give us an update on where you see your own, the agency's role in policy making over the next year? And then also, what are you hearing from the inquiries that you've made to civil society and others about how we should be uh, governing this space? Well, it's terrific. I, uh it's an interesting time to be working in this area. And I should say, you know, NTIA, um, our statutory mandate by law, our role is to serve as the president's principal advisor on telecommunications and information policy. So what does that mean? We, we are basically policy advisors. So we think not, we're not regulators. We're not here to, uh, to regulate, but we don't think necessarily about what the law says today. We think about what the law ought to say. And so we have been engaged in this project across the board of thinking, um, how should we as an administration respond to these, uh, these new developments, which have been coming for a while? How do we engage internationally? Uh, we haven't even touched on the fact yeah. that there's a giant, um, giant issues internationally to think about, national security issues, a strong desire to make sure that innovation happens here in the US and with our trusted uh, partners around the world. Uh, and that we're building AI in ways that promote our, our foreign policy goals as well. I think all of that for us has been, um, uh, uh, it's, it's gonna be a far-flung enterprise for the administration. There are a number of big things that the administration's working on. At NTIA, I mentioned one of the interesting things we've started on. We started on this about a year ago, before all of the oh, chat. Hi. Yeah, so it takes a while to do some of these projects. We embarked on a project on AI accountability. And really thinking about, this is just one example of an area, but uh, AI accountability, this question of how do you make sure that models are actually behaving the way they say they're behaving, right? A key step to making sure that we can actually put rules in place or guardrails in place is being able to understand what a machine learning model, what an artificial intelligence system does. And um, it's a lot like financial audits, right? If you think about financial audits and financial systems, if you're gonna represent that you've done X, Y, or Z financially. There are a whole set of rules around that. There's a, there's a policy backstop. There are standards for accounting. 
And so we embarked on an inquiry to say, like, what would it look like to create that kind of ecosystem for AI so that we would know what the standards are that people should be measuring against and then like, figure out how you actually do that measurement. We put out a request for comment in the spring. We got over 1,400 comments, which for us, our, our little agency, is a ton. <laughs> that was a light, we touched a nerve. And people are very interested in this question. Um, we got a lot of comments back. And I'll just say, um, I think there's a keen interest in, in putting tools in place so people know how to m figure out what accountability looks like and then making sure that we um, think about where we might need policy backstops to make sure that when companies or developers, could be private sector, public sector, when anybody represents something about what, how their AI system is working, we've got tools to measure whether that's true. That's just one example of a kind of, I think, full spectrum approach to these issues. Um, you know, one of the things obviously that we really care about is the connection with public interest yeah. um, policy and technology, right? It's not just about advancing open technology, but right. it's really about ensuring that it's serving the public interest. And while a lot of these technologies tend to feel like they'll benefit society, um, we know that they're, obviously we've talked about the risks. Um, and so as you're engaging the, the public more broadly, um, how do we actually engage the resident citizens of the US whom are interacting with AI. I mean, the conversation right now gets really focused on generative AI, but the reality yeah. is that AI tools, AI, AI supported tools have been around in our mix for at least, you know, obviously for decades, but you know, right. definitely in cities. And we see the issues with it, um, whether it's, you know, the bias around um, any image based, um, right. technologies. So how do you, I mean, how do we, are there things that make you optimistic? Are there challenges you see to having a more broad-based conversation where the public can really be engaged? Right. My concern is that they're not one of the four, you know, like a general public is not really part of the 1400 that get to, um, you know, that get right. to give their input to NTIA. And it does seem like this is a different kind of technological moment that does require more public input and debate. Absolutely. So I think it's essential that we have an inclusive conversation so that we are building systems that reflect th these, these real impacts on society. And if we, um, we, if we, we, we develop at our peril without that input, right? And um, I think it's going to ultimately be, it's, in, it's important for developers, it's important for us if we're going to meet our, our goals as a society, we've got to have that, that equitable conversation. So how do we do it? I think part of it starts with good with storytelling, with good narratives to help draw people into this debate. You mentioned, and I think people are seeing it and feeling it. Um, you mentioned some of these other advances. We've had uh, you know, machine learning in our lives for a while. Facial recognition is a terrific example. And I have to say it is quite surprising to me as an observer how far and how fast we have moved to bring these tools into everyday life. Um, you know, there have been, as a great example, the stories about local police departments using facial recognition tools and in, in, improperly arresting people, right? Taking people into custody, taking them out of their lives. The biggest thing that the state can do is deprive you of your freedom, and we're doing it based on a set of tools um, that we know, that we know we've shown are biased against people of color, right? That don't work as well. The, the, the pace of that change, the pace of that adoption just shows how much we need to do to, first of all, educate and inform people to understand the limits of these tools and put good guardrails in place. But I think those stories help us bring people in. And even though, as you say, large language models aren't necessarily the, the longest running or most impactful thing, I think we have to lean into this moment. This is a teachable moment for us. This is our society's moment. People have stepped up. Everybody I know is talking about ChatGPT, you know, this winter and spring. I, admittedly, I run with a set of really nerdy people. But, um, you know, I think a lot of people were talking about it, and we have to use those moments to bring people in. The majority of the comments we got, those 1,400 comments, were individuals. People worried about their jobs. People worried about um, their security and privacy. And I think we can 
bring people in. And if there's anything that's encouraging here, it's that we're actually a bit earlier in this discussion. I may not feel this way than we were in some of the previous generations of technology. So there has been some, I mean, um, there has been some conversation in communities across the U.S. around, like, facial yeah. recognition technology that has been somewhat contentious that, in fact, a couple years ago forced a couple companies to stop using, um, to stop allowing, you know, police right. departments to use the technology. Um, how do you, when we think about the public, when we think about public interest and equity, are, how do we incentivize? I mean, are we in any position to really incentivize companies to take that view in mind first and to really focus on serving the public good and equity, not just assume that it's a benefit to society, but to actually really center a lot of their development around these kinds of values and principles? I, uh, the, the truth is, and this is what will help us, it is good for businesses and developers more broadly to be thinking about these issues up front. The success of their products and of their companies is going to depend on their ability to get ahead of these issues. Uh, privacy, security, the impact of bias uh, in, the, in the models that they choose. And I think we need to do more work to lift that up. I don't want to be uh, uh, naive about uh, the work that it takes to make sure that people understand that. But I talk to leaders in, in the developer community. I think board, in boardrooms across the country, people are starting to ask the hard questions, as they did with cybersecurity before. How are we getting ahead of these issues? You know, are we actually doing the right thing and making sure that this isn't going to come back to, hurt, to haunt us in terms of our reputation or in terms of our liability? I think there will be more to do, There's the starting point is that public attention that drives um, uh, developers and companies and others to like really think we've got to get ahead of this and that's partly why it's important to talk about it. I think these accountability frameworks that we are trying to put in place in government, starting with tools that show people how they can measure you know, their risk and then moving to ultimately, I think these commitments, codes of conduct, ultimately are there going to be rules on the books that actually people have to obey. And that will be the path to making sure that companies are thinking about this. And it strikes me, you know, it's important to say, I mean, I think at New America, one of the, you know, opportunities here is also to just create more dialogue, I yes. think, between industry and civil society to really ensure that, because I think the conversation is happening perhaps in the boardrooms, but, um, but it, you know, like sustaining it, I think, is going to require a lot of, uh, convening and constant dialogue over the next five, ten years of development, yeah. so that we're working, yeah. in essence, in concert to make sure that this, that whatever harms are emerging, we can identify them quickly and address them and have some level right. of accountability, but also yeah. like create more, right. more um, perspective and trust. And the problems are really hard. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's part of the challenge for us. It's not like these. Some of these are very obvious. Some of them are harder. And so I do think you know, if, and the solutions are not so easy either. So. We're early days, but this is the part where we really need you know, thought leaders, and honestly, it's going to be groups like New America who can step up and represent the broad views of um, the public and also have this dialogue with, with developers, with companies, with the technical community, because we need it. And I think a lot of people are asking the question, what does good look like? They don't even know, right? And that's where we can help. And I, by we, I mean oh. us. Oh. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I, I have a couple more questions I wanted to get out of the way before we open it up for audience um, questions. But you've been around this industry for a long time. Is there something that strikes you as different in terms of how we're approaching this moment versus other waves of development? Um, you know, what gives you a little bit of... <laughs> of it yeah. is, I mean, it, these are really hard problems that we don't... There's so much unknown... Um, yep. that it's hard to, um, you know, it, 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 it's going to take a while. But what gives you hope and confidence in this? Um, well, I think the biggest thing is that we're engaging reason relatively early. Uh, so I have been in the sort of technology and policy space, particularly around the Internet. And I think if you compare this to the early days of Web 2.0, cloud computing, social networking, even the development of the Internet, I'd argue we've leaned in more here. Uh, than we did in any of those places. We've learned some of the lessons. Part of it is that the developer community has learned. Like I, um, I look at, I used to have this great chart of 
when did each company hire its first policy person? You know, Microsoft, it was like employee number 20,000. Google, it was like employee number 3,000. You know, Twitter, it was like number 400, right? If you look at these, uh, these relatively small companies doing some of this very impactful work, they're hiring policy people. They're bringing them, they're getting themselves to Washington. They're part of this dialogue that's happening on Capitol Hill right now. And I think there's, they're engaging earlier, which is great. I think also we have a much more sophisticated set of civil society players than we've ever had before. Um, New America and others out there really uh, digging in hard on, um, you know, how do, we, how do we make sure the public's represented here. And I look at, um, I have been involved in teaching over the years, and I look at the next generation of computer science students. This is what they want to be engaged in. Not just the development of AI, but they care about the impact of what they're building. And that, to me, is the biggest reason for hope. We've created, we're, we're, and we're building a generation, um, uh, and it's partly what they care about, of, of, of young people who really want to make sure they understand the implications of what they're building. So that's, that is the biggest yeah. reason for hope, that we're early on, but it's, it's going to be hard work and a lot to do. Well, I would not be doing my job if I didn't mention to that point that, um, yeah, you know, New America has um, an amazing program, public interest technology program yeah. with universities across the U.S. that's focused just on that, trying to build the next generation of technologists who have the, the, the rounded perspective to really think about the implication and the ethics yeah. that go along to building these powerful I, tools. I think the one, and it is extremely encouraging, I think probably the one thing that we need to worry about a little bit here is that we don't really have the luxury of time. We don't, yep. And that is a little bit different than it felt 15 years ago, let's say, or 20 years ago in the internet space. The internet was relatively new. Uh, when I started working in this, there were, you know, we would measure, like, it was 40 million people online. Now there's 5 billion people online. The pace of change and the uptick in these technologies is very hot, is fast. And so we need to be figuring these issues out now. So there's a sense of urgency as well. So I'm glad we're engaging early, but we also need to be engaging early. And I'll just say the administrations we're working on this, right? At the highest levels, we've worked on this set of commitments from companies. Uh, we're engaging with our international partners to make sure that we're bringing that, we're working with them about global solutions. Um, and we are actually, you know, thinking about what does the legislative world look like just today? You know, Senator Schumer is convening this yes. very high level group of uh, CEOs. Um, that's exactly what they, we should be doing, right? Thinking, educating ourselves and thinking, what are the rules we need to put in place? Well, um, that is a great opportunity yeah. to talk about something we, uh, you know, we've been advocating for, for a really long time, which is you know, some comprehensive federal privacy legislation that really sets us up to address not just the existing technologies that have been out there that amass and use all of America's data, um, but also new the new technologies um, and a lot of these LLMs in particular. Like, it feels like the time, the time says we need to act and there's some urgency around this moment that's been building up, but there is a little bit of just in action. So what, I mean, I don't know what you think about, um, you know, our inability to get some comprehensive federal privacy <laughs> legislation out the door um, as the Europeans have been able to do. Um, and, uh, and, and more generally, with the kind of urgency we have, there are so many, there are still foundational pieces of legislation that we don't have in this country around, um, around technology policy that, that need to be advanced. I mean, how quickly do you, I mean, I know it's a yeah. complicated question, but how quickly, what will it take for us to really take yeah. these kinds of actions on? It's a great question, and I think partly because it tells us something about how we as a society are able to react to some of these technologies. I, do, I will say it is surprising for those of us who've been in this space for a while that we don't have a comprehensive federal privacy law in this country. If you had asked many of us, not to date myself, but 20 years ago if you had said, we will be in 2023 and there will not be a federal privacy law, a privacy law on the books. I think people said, that can't be, right? These two, this is going to be too important. We know these things are going to affect people. And, and we know, by the way, the, poll, the data shows us that the public wants these rules as well, right? And so, um, well, the administration has said, the president has said, we need to be doing more in this space. We would really benefit from a federal 
comprehensive federal privacy law, partly because it is the right thing to do to protect consumers and have a, a baseline that everybody's protected, but partly also for our global leadership. I mean, I work with a lot of people, uh, talk to a lot of uh, other leaders around the world, thinking about this question of how we can address these hard issues. And it's hard when the US itself doesn't even have a baseline privacy law, and how do we think about our leadership moving forward? So um, I'm hopeful that with the right incentives, we can move quickly. I do believe that um, there's a strong sense that, these, these tech, that, that there's a, the moment is upon us. We have to act. We're starting to act. And um, there's going to be a lot more to come in the coming months and years. I would love to um, open it up for questions uh, from the audience, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. Um, it's good. Uh, I mean, I think we're all um, happy that somebody is well informed and as uh, long, you know, with your deep background is effectively the point person on AI on the commercial side in this country. But I wanted to, I, you, I, you may not be responsible for some of, the, some of this, but I wanted to get your thoughts on this question, which is we saw essentially the news media business essentially more or less get destroyed by the fact that social media companies were sort of giving away this product for free and no business can survive if the, if the product's uh, being given away for free. And so picking up on what Lillian said, and one of the reasons we have a very prosperous country is because of copyright and, pat and patents. And so if you look at the large language models, I mean, essentially, they've hoovered up 170,000 books. Uh, the authors involved have, no, and, and that's just one example in, on, in the terms of creative content. So, I mean, this seems like a very big problem. And Alan, you said, you know, time is sort of running out because this thing is moving very quickly. So what are the safeguards that realistically could be put in place for content creators, whether they're writers or artists or any other form of content creator, including to developers themselves, right? It's a terrific question. It's a hard problem. I think the problem, this is one where um, I suspect that law will, will play a major role <laughs> and, and have to fairly quickly. And when I say that, I'm also, I mean, not just you know, new legislation, but the interpretation of our existing laws. And I think there's a, there, there's a lot of work being done at the Copyright Office. I talked about the Patent and Trademark Office at Commerce to try to get ahead of that and think about it, hearings on Capitol Hill. But I suspect we're going to see litigation, and that litigation will give us some insight pretty quickly about what the, how our current legal structure will work. And then we'll have to go from there. I'd also say there's an international dimension to this, right? You know, math does not stop at the border. <laughs> You know, innovation in AI is happening all around the world. And part of what we're so keen to do as an administration is, yes, work domestically, think about also the companies that are leading here and getting commitments from them, but also then work with our, with our partners. We're going to start with the G7. There's a big effort, uh, the Hiroshima process that's, being, that's been kicked off by, the, by Japan um, to come up with codes of conduct around uh, AI and, we'll, and, and then move out from there. Uh, the Indian government's been a big leader in the global partnership on AI. Um, uh, we're very keen to be working with the UK. Uh, they have a big safety summit coming up. So I think you'll see more and more of these international efforts to try and get ahead of these big problems. I'm getting the Peters today. <laughs> hey, Alan, Pete Singer. Uh, great to see you again, and thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, I wondered if you could speak about um, your own personal, but maybe the administration's view of the effect of this on jobs, not merely in an economic sense, but in a political and societal sense. There was, um, there's a variety of contention on how many jobs will be either uh, replaced or redefined or reduced because of this and you know we've got estimates all over the place but what I was struck by recently was um, there was a poll that came out about two months ago and uh, the way it was labeled in the media was quote only 14% of Americans worry that they'll lose their jobs <laughs> to AI and robotics only so one out of seven people in the room um, and then there was a Gallup poll that came out earlier this week that said, actually, now it's up to 21%. Um, so can you speak to uh, what your view on this is and how the administration is thinking about it, it particularly in terms of there's very clear um, social anxiety that also has real potential security effects? 
I think a starting point for us has to be to, um, to engage in that conversation and to really understand that there will be impacts, but also um, you know, try to be uh, clear-eyed about where they'll be and, um, uh, and how we might mitigate risk. But I think the, the biggest thing is you know, starting by understanding that there's going to be a lot of benefit and that that benefit in itself will create economic opportunity. Um, I just think about, for example, the use of, this is a little bit of, not a perfect example, but you know, I was speaking to the uh, head of a local uh, private school here about how they were handling the rise of, rising use of chat GPT. And he said, well, this is just like a calculator, right? Um, you know, we are gonna to have to change the way we assess people. It's not the end of education. It's not something that he was planning to ban in their school. It was something that they were going to embrace and think about how it was gonna to have to change the way they do evaluation. You know, students use the calculator today, use calculators today on their math tests in high school. We still learn arithmetic. The point is there are gonna be these benefits in unexpected ways. There's, an un, there's a different view of many of these things. And not to be, um, you know, to be dismissive of concerns because they're real. But you know, there's data out there that also shows there's a tremendous amount of job creation that comes with these new technologies. And so figuring out how we make that pivot to help people respond. And also to recognize you know, our predictions are not necessarily so good. We talked about you know, driverless cars a little while ago. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, we might have said, oh my gosh, we need to embark on a massive project to rescue the trucking industry. That's not here yet. It might be here. We need to be really clear about it. We need to prepare for it. Um, but right now, you, it's very hard to find enough truck drivers. Uh, and, and it's going to take a little while, we think, for some of these things to happen. Um, so I do think there's, there's a level of preparation, being ready for this, and then also trying to make sure we're benefiting from the upside. The last thing I'll say, because uh, I think this is such an awesome question, I was just down um, visiting Miami-Dade College down in... Um, uh, in Miami. Uh, it is a giant college system. Uh, I say this with, with, with uh, it's an ASU like college system, just massive in its scale. Uh, I think they have 100,000 matriculated students. Um, and I went, they invited me to see their AI lab. And I'm like, you don't even really have a PhD program. What is this AI lab going to look like, right? And I went and I was kind of blown away because their approach is we're not here to train. PhDs in creating frontier models. Our, well, but what we do think is that every business in America is going to need somebody who knows how to use you know, machine learning, who knows how to use chat GPT, who knows how these basic tools work. And we are going to be the place that trains people with an associate degree to go out there and be a user and a smart business leader on uh, the use of AI. And I think it's brilliant because the fact is we need to stop thinking about the frontier models as the only thing and the job dislocation is the only thing. We need to be thinking how do we train a next generation of workers to use these tools across the board, whether it's radiologists, you know, scanning scans <laughs> or, uh, you know, people using ChatGPT in small businesses across the country. And that's the retooling that we need to do and start getting ahead of. And that's how we're thinking about it. Florida is a great model. It's the largest, that Southeast Florida region is um, yeah. the largest producer of Latino engineers in the country. Um, I, this question, um, you know, makes me ask, how, can you describe what efforts, or maybe if, if they're not already in place, um, what kinds of investments we can be making to really up the digital readiness, especially of kids? Um, it, it just seems like part of the, I think what you're describing is sort of the augmenting capabilities um, and potential of AI. But as we know, a lot of our children, especially children of color, uh, poor children have just the least access to a lot of technology and even just basic um, tools to be successful in today's economy. So how is a country do, I mean, what I'd love to see is a country where we're starting to invest early on in really equipping our kids to be, all kids to be successful in this moment. But how do you, from your vantage point and in the collaborations across the federal government, where do you see the opportunities to do more of that? Well, it starts with, you know, the investments that we've been making in STEM education across the country, uh, or STEAM education across the country. We really do need more investment and more help for people and, and for diverse communities to be 
starting at a very young age, uh, learning about these tools and the tools that they'll need to be able to succeed in a you know, very STEM-oriented world. Um, I think we also need better digital literacy and media literacy, and uh, there's a, a lot of work that's been done on that. So a lot of it, some, some great work here done here at New America. Um, but uh, uh, that's got to be very real. And uh, you see groups, uh, a shout out to Common Sense Media is a great example, uh, who've put out toolkits and are thinking about this, how do we embrace this, make sure that we're teaching digital literacy and digital media work. Part of our um, efforts even at Commerce, at NTIA, as we think about building out broadband infrastructure, we've been given big grants to do work on digital equity. And our view of digital equity is it's got to include thinking about the workforce of the future, helping uh, communities that have been left behind, and particularly vulnerable communities, making sure they have the tools to thrive online. So there's a, there's a lot of investment that's going on right now. And like I say, with the Miami-Dade example, we need to take a very expansive view of this. This isn't just about, uh, it will be partly about investing in those frontier models, in those PhDs who are creating the newest technologies, the big NSF investments in those ac academic leadership centers. But it's also about how do we reach a very broad cross-section of America and make them understand they're going to be part of this revolution too. Yeah, I mean, I often say um, no child should graduate high school without right. digital literacy training. I mean, that is the new civics curriculum of this country. Right and we should figure out how to make that happen. Um, uh, Alan, this has been a delightful conversation. I don't know if we have any more questions from the audience, um, but I think with that, we just thank you for your time. And I'll just say thank you, and I'm, thank you for the conversation. I will say this is it, is, it is a moment of great opportunity, but also some peril, and I think there really is a big global conversation going on of, the, of are these gonna be technologies of openness are closed, used by closed societies? Are they going to be technologies of freedom or of control? And how do we create more equitable uh, outcomes as we embrace this new you know, machine learning revolution? So I'll just say thank you for the conversation. The thing that does give me hope is conversations like this and the engagement of, mm -hmm. uh, of leaders like we have here today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael Garcia, who's a chair of the Mike Cyber Fellow at New America and has a new report coming out on the cybersecurity risks of extended reality that will be released fairly soon. Uh, so you know my name is Daniel Rothenberg. I co-direct the Future Security Initiative. And thanks so much for being here with us. Hi, I'm Michael Garcia, and I'm a fellow in the Share the Mic and Cyber Initiative. In 2007, the first iPhone was released, and 4G connections rolled out a year later. With wide-scale adoption of smartphones and access to 4G, mobile apps took off. It was unthinkable back then that we'd use a cell phone to get someone's car, translate a menu into different languages in real time, and FaceTime someone from across the world with literally no lag time. Yet the cybersecurity implications of these apps were not thought of until the incidents started happening. Few, if any, raised alarms about foreign interference and in elections by manipulating social media, the sale of American data to unregulated data brokers, that could then be bought by law enforcement agencies was one of dystopian future. And the proliferation of virtual currency, starting with Bitcoin in 2009, helped give rise to devastating ransomware attacks, all of which brought on by the onset of 4G applications. With the deployment of 5G towers throughout the United States, 5G cable phones and other devices will increasingly proliferate. But the true benefits of 5G will be those taking advantage of reduced up and down data streams primarily virtual reality and augmented reality applications, or VR and AR for short. The increased adoption of 5G devices in the United States was for widespread use of AR and VR, primarily known as extended reality applications, or XR for short, and it will become accessible through a single or set of metaverses. By this, I mean a collection of virtual ecosystems that will allow users to interact with each other and their surroundings in a creative and collaborative manner in virtual spaces or physical environments that are digitally manipulated by static or mobile devices. In other words, one does not need a VR headset to access the metaverse, but one simply only needs access to a cell phone and the internet. The global XR market could be anywhere from $476 billion in 2025, which would be an increase from $46.4 billion from 2019. 
The EU estimates that it could create anywhere between 440,000 jobs to 860,000 jobs by 2025. Indeed, one prediction estimates that the world could see 23 million jobs created. While these numbers may seem a bit fantastical, admittedly, it becomes a bit more realistic given the amount of users who could be using XR applications. Today, Americans from 16, 64 years old spend an average of seven hours a day online. You're doing it right now. If that trend holds or more likely expands, one estimate projects that the metaverse will increase the data usage of each internet user by 20 times. Importantly, XR applications must be thought beyond video games or form of communication. Rather, they must be seen as technology that's currently being used or one day will be used in various industries. For example, since 2017, a water utility in Australia has used VR to allow users to walk through a virtual model of the treatment plant, helping them identify more design problems than traditional walkthroughs. US Army Corps Engineers is identifying AR, VR solutions to help with flood risk management infrastructure. But more consequentially is how militaries will use XR technologies and metaverses. US military has used XR technology for decades, starting in the 50s, in which the Air Force used simulations to replicate cockpit experiences for pilots. Since then, the importance of XR technology across all US military branches has only grown. Just one point, the US Army has created a synthetic training environment to help train soldiers in realistic battlefields. Highlighting these use cases is important to detail the significance of the cybersecurity implications that could arise if a bad actor successfully exploits vulnerabilities within these systems. VR headsets, for example, will introduce a host of new vulnerabilities that could allow hackers to record audio and steal sensitive information. Malicious actors could also exploit XR software to achieve their goals by taking over a user's VR headset, to look at their screen, to turn on their microphone, and install a virus on their computer and others. But one of the more unique outcomes that a bad actor could achieve is by physically manipulating a user. This has honestly been dubbed the human joystick phenomenon. In fact, one study found that nearly 90% of subjects could have their movements controlled by addition of content to their VR screen. One could imagine the consequences that could happen in a military context. Moreover, bad actors don't need to exploit a headset or an XR software to achieve their goals, but they could potentially a data hosting provider, like a managed service provider, and launch additional ransomware attacks that would encrypt the data that is necessary and needed for the XR application to function. Lastly, all these examples touch on various aspects of users and organizations' privacy, an issue that we've been grappling with for decades. The United States must also contend with how other governments are developing policies to incentivize or regulate their XR market, which could impact how they're used within the United States. The European Union, for example, has created a strategy to detail how it will incentivize its XR market on one hand, while simultaneously initiating processes to decide how to regulate this market on the other. South Korea and Japan are investing millions of dollars to provide government services to their citizens in the metaverse. But more consequential is how China views the metaverse. China's created a five-year plan that details how it will become a global leader in supplying the XR technology supply chain. In this plan, it notes that they will develop dedicated processing chips for VR, near-eye displays, and other key devices. China has also taken a prominent role in developing international standards, primarily through the UN's focus group on the metaverse. Through this working group, the UN is analyzing the technical requirements of the metaverse for the international community. China has representative in nearly each of the 10 sub-working groups and recently held the focus group's second forum in Shanghai this past July. As an aside, the United States is absent in this focus group. Lastly, and maybe most concerning, the People's Liberation Army is looking to build the Battleverse to assist in military training, simulating war scenarios, testing new weapons, and Panel. It's going to be led by Sarah Levinson, who, uh, or Sarah Levinson Moriarty, who is a fellow at New America. Uh, she was instrumental in getting the, the Levinson Act passed, which was named after her father, who was the longest held American hostage in Iran um, and who died in captivity. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Sarah, uh, and she will introduce the panel. Thank you, Peter. And thanks, everyone, for joining us for what I think is a really important discussion, and I'm sure everybody here will agree. Um, do we have Cindy? Okay. Okay. So virtually, we will have Cindy Lurcher, who um, is joining us from the Foley Foundation. She's the Director of Research, Hostage Advocacy, and Government Affairs. I have a little handy note to myself, so I'm going to put the phone away afterward. Don't worry. Um, 
I'm happy to introduce Roger Carstens, who's our Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs. Uh, there's Cindy, I see her now. Um, we also have Ali Soufan, who's the Chief Executive Officer at the Soufan Center, and he's also a former Supervisory Special Agent at the FBI. And then we have Elizabeth Whalen, who's the sister of Paul Whalen, who's currently um, held in Russia against his will. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I am going to pass it over to Cindy for a moment. I know she wanted to share a little bit more about the Foley Foundation's annual report, Bringing Americans Home. Thank you very much, Sarah. And, and first, we'd like to give a special thank you to Peter Bergen at New and Sarah Levinson Moriarty, both former Foley board members, I might add. And we're just so grateful for you leading the discussion today, as well as our panelists and and our audience for joining today. Uh, just to give a quick little introduction to the Foley Foundation, we are named after James Wright Foley, who was a, a freelance conflict journalist who reported often in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and Syria. Jim was kidnapped on Thanksgiving Day in 2012 and held captive by the Islamic State until his public and brutal murder on August 19th, 2014. The Foley Foundation began three weeks after Jim's murder, and since then, our president and founder, Diane Foley, has been advocating for the freedom of all Americans held hostage and wrongfully detained abroad, and promoting journalist safety around the world. What brings us here today is our fifth annual Bringing Americans Home report. Our reports consist, uh, consist of over 250 interviews with hostages, wrongful detainees, and their families, as well as interviews with current and former U.S. officials across what we like to call the U.S. hostage enterprise, that was stood up by Executive Order 13698 and Presidential Policy Directive 30, also known as PPD 30. Uh, that was back in 2015, which all was later codified by the Robert Levinson Hostage Recovery and Hostage Taking Accountability Act in 2020. This year's report's findings, uh, which can be found on the Foley website, are based off of Foley, uh, two Foley data sets, which consists of 215 hostage and 207 wrongful detainee cases going back to 2001. However, this year's results uh, focus primarily on the uh, 2022 up to July 31st of this year. I should first begin by defining a hostage versus a wrongful detainee, uh, which we adhere to the U.S. government and how they distinguish between the two cases. Specifically, a hostage uh, is an individual kidnapped by a terrorist organization, criminal and militant group, as well as pirates. However, we do exclude criminal cases in our data set. Wrongful detainees, however, are, are individuals held by foreign governments, i.e. state actors. Uh, however, we do at Foley recognize the strong similarities between hostages and wrongful detainees, such that both groups are targeted for being Americans and both are held for the purpose to try to affect change in U.S. policy, force concessions, and or requests of prisoner swap. At the time the report was written, there were 59 U.S. nationals held hostage in wrongfully detained overseas, and over 90% of those cases were wrongful detentions, and it's been consistent that way. Uh, the majority of those cases, 79%, were U.S. nationals that were held in China, Iran, Russia, and Venezuela. However, 14 other countries either detained or wrongfully held a U.S. national in 2022 and 23. Uh, while we have seen historic levels of U.S. nationals wrongfully detained by foreign governments over the past decade, specifically 175% increase in the number of wrongful detention incidents and a 580% increase of the number of U.S. nationals who continue to be held year after year. However, there has been, which is very good, a 31% decrease since the publication of uh, last year's report of U.S. nationals held abroad. Uh, this is due to 25 releases that, at least public releases, uh, th that occurred from 2022 up to July 31st of this year. And the year 2022 also contained the highest number of wrongful detainees released overall within our database that begins in 2001. However, while there have been significant a significant number of releases. It's important to note that the number of U.S. nationals who continue to be held remain at historic high levels. At the same time, the, U the number of U.S. nationals held hostage by terrorist organizations, militant groups, and pirates have fluctuated over the past two decades. Overall, there, overall though, uh, there's been a uh, general downward trend since uh, 2016. Since 2022, there have been nine U.S. hostages released, which occurred in Yemen, Afghanistan, Niger, and Burkina Faso. 
groups responsible for holding these Americans were the Houthis, the Taliban, the Haqqani Network, and JNIM. While there have been several successes over the past year or so, I'd like to end with a very stark reminder that we continue to still see Americans held hostage and wrongfully detained overseas. Currently, the Foley Foundation is tracking at least 60 of those cases, and of the current hostage and wrongful detention cases, six U.S. nationals have been held for over 10 years, which is an average of 14 years. Thank you very much. Um, and I think that is a great place to kind of start the conversation and, and think about it. I think there's a lot of details and statistics that are in the report, and I want to get into kind of the nitty gritty and a little bit of the meat behind it. Um, before we do, I do think it's important to acknowledge the death of Governor Bill Richardson. Um, the funeral is tomorrow. And so I wanted to take a moment, given the success over the past year, and I know that there was a close partnership with Governor Richardson and um, a lot of the people on this stage, I wanted to give everyone a moment just to say a few words about his impact on the hostage ecosystem as a whole. I'll, I'll go ahead and start if I may. Um, uh, Bill Richardson uh, was a great American. He uh, spent pretty much a good part of his life trying to free Americans around the world, whether they're hostages or wrongfully detained. Uh, I consider him a strong partner. He gave me a lot of advice, especially when I was just starting out. And I can go back to my time uh, trying to work the Venezuela portfolio. There was a time when the United States government just was not gaining traction in Venezuela. And Governor Richardson was able to get uh, a meeting with the Venezuelans, flew down to talk to President Maduro. And it kind of highlights how, uh, in a way, this is a team sport. And there are times when the United States government can't get the job done for various reasons. And yet we're able to work with titans of foreign policy like Bill Richardson, who can still try to get the job done. So he'll be missed. He was a good friend and ally. And uh, my heart goes out to not only his family, but also the Richardson Center and Mickey Bergman and the team. Thanks, Roger. Ali? I second everything Roger said. I mean, uh, Ambassador Richardson was the trusted third party before there were any third parties. Uh, he definitely will be missed, and it's going to be very difficult to have somebody fill his shoes. Elizabeth? And I'll just add in that we really appreciated uh, the help that he offered early on when um, we couldn't get any traction with the Trump administration, and it was good to have somebody down in D.C. going around and knocking on doors for us. Yeah. Thanks, Elizabeth. And Cindy, I'll pass it to you. Sure. It's, it's a tremendous loss. And I think uh, for most families that worked with Governor Richardson, it's, he was almost a center of gravity in this space. You know, he was a champion, a leader, a trailblazer for decades, um, focusing on hostage and wrongful detention cases. And, and truly, my heart goes out to the family and to Mickey during this time. And uh, he will he'll, he'll be missed greatly. Thanks, Cindy. So great, let's uh, jump into a bit of the meat of it. Roger, if you could just level set a little bit for people, how do wrongful detention cases come to your desk? Someone finds out that their family member is being held. How did they get to you and how has the Levinson Act helped to enable you to do your job? Fantastic first question. So first off, I wouldn't mind thanking uh, New America Foundation and my former boss, Peter, for hosting this. I'd also like to thank Arizona State University also for their, for their part in, in putting this together. And to thank my uh, fellow panelists up here, uh, this is a team effort. It's not just the government. It's people like Sarah, Elizabeth, and Ali, who actually do a lot of the hard work behind the scenes to pull this all together. And in a way, you're all included in that, except for Colonel Liam Collins. You are not included in that. <laughs> and Liam, you'll see I wore boots just in case I have to quickly escape the stage and ex Ian, exfil all the way back to the State Department. So I'm ready for it. Looking forward to your panel. Um, anyway, um, so wrongful detentions come to us in numerous ways. Uh, I've had mothers uh, send me an email saying, Roger, I got your email from so-and-so. Uh, my son is being held in country X. The details are such. Would you please look into that? And that's actually a good thing. We take that seriously. In, in other words, we're, we have a hunger to get Americans out. And so however it gets to us, that's a good thing. So if we take that, we will go straight to consular affairs and reach out to the embassy of the country in question and start gathering all the facts that we possibly can. Because at the end of the day, we want to build a file with the facts of the case, take the Levinson Act criteria, and apply that criteria over those facts to see if it's strong enough to send to the Secretary of State for a recommendation. But we also get them from embassies. You might have an embassy, uh, a consular officer, uh, see that someone's been arrested in a certain country, 
and they'll say, you know, something looks wrong about this case. They'll dig into it a little bit, and eventually we'll get a cable coming to the Department of State in, in Washington saying, Embassy such and such believes this case, this, uh, uh, case to be uh, that of a wrongful detention. And again, it's not a done deal yet. At that point, we still start gathering information. Uh, journalists, by reporting something, uh, I would say uh, Catherine Swadon gave a wonderful interview. I, I want to say it was in the Houston Chronicle many years ago. And I don't know how I, I, I read it, but I read an interview with this grieving mother and was like, we've got to figure out whether this case belongs in our, in our desk or not. So they come in, in, in various ways, but once it hits the State Department, uh, it's really, the starting point is really SPIHA and consular affairs, taking a look at the case, and then starting to do all the queries, whether it's going to the CIA, the embassy, talking to reporters, talking to the families. We're essentially trying to vacuum up any bit of information that allows us to build the facts of the case. And when the facts of the case are there, then, as I said, we apply the Levinson Act criteria on the top to see if it feels wrongful. Um, and that maybe gets to the, the, maybe the crux of your question. The Levinson Act has been seismic um, for, for various reasons um, in that it codified what we do. It's actually put it into law. It's allowed us to garner resources. Uh, it's, it's allowed us to uh, write a report to Congress that fulsomely explains what we've done and what we're trying to do. But I would say the most important part to my mind is that it gives us criteria with which to evaluate these cases. Before the Levinson Act came out, I think we were just kind of winging it. We, we would try to get a sense of whether someone was held purely because they were an American citizen and they were, a country was leveraging us. And now we can take a look at that criteria and, and actually take a look at some of these cases and bring them on board. And I would argue that one of the reasons that we've seen a, a, an, an uptake since 2020 in the amount of wrongful detentions is because we now have criteria. And as you probably know, and I'll end on this, when the criteria came out, we sent a cable out all over the world, and every single U.S. embassy and every single consulate had to relook every single arrest, and that was like thousands upon thousands of people. And I said, I know you've probably seen all your cases before, but take the criteria, apply it to the facts, and let's see if we've missed something. So uh, I, I can't thank you enough, and for members on Capitol Hill and everyone else who put uh, that, that legislation together, but uh, it's, again, it's an example of the partnership of working with family members, members on Capitol Hill, their staffs, and, and such to, to bring something together that has been of great value to this enterprise. Thanks, Roger. And I ask the other panelists to forgive me because I'm going to ask the second question to you as well because I think it's at the top of everyone's mind right now is the Iran deal that's happening. Oh, good. Um, no comment. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to ask you just a bit because there's a lot of people out there who might be saying things to the effect of this in incentivizes hostage taking. Um, and I, I wanted to give you a chance to respond to that in, in this kind of setting. And then Ali, I have a follow-up question, but how do you see this deal coming about and uh, what do you say to those naysayers about uh, whether this incentivizes through these I, different channels? I think on the deal itself, um, these are things that we hope for and I can't really say much at all because it's something that we want to wait until it's all over and then we're going to be very uh, open and engaging with uh, members of the public, press, Congress, et cetera. Uh, but in terms of your question, um, the United States has made some trades in the last day, two and a half years. The, sec the Secretary of State and the President have together worked to make some very hard decisions to bring Americans back. They're hard decisions to make. And yet, in some of these trades that have gone down range, uh, we've just not seen the bump up in numbers. And we're still going to run the math. But I would say anecdotally right now, despite the fact that we've, uh, I would say, I can think of five people that we've traded uh, and during the Biden administration, we've just not seen an uptick, uptick. And if anything, I might say that the number of wrongful detainees is actually going down. So you think that if you made a trade, that would incentivize everyone and everyone would be out there trying to grab every American that they possibly could to use as leverage against us. And the data is just not showing that. And I do want to get a bit into deterrence on top of that afterward. Mm -hmm. But Ali, I wanted to give you a chance to speak from your perspective as a third party um, intermediary, how you see the Iran deal and how important adversaries or partners um, in other countries might be helping us and how we should be thinking about that. I think as uh, an outside third party, <clears throat> I just care about the people who are going to be released and their families. So towards the end, Everything is going to be political. We're in a political year. Um, people will have different view of anything that happens based on their partisan lens. And to the most 
part, the American people understand um, the importance of having uh, these folks back with their loved ones and their families. So uh, if a government official can say no comment as a third party, <laughs> no, 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 no comment, uh, other, one, uh, other uh, one I said. But, you know, third parties play a very important role. Uh, and they play an important role uh, in trying to help the government uh, sometimes go around bureaucracy, sometimes open channels that it's difficult for governments uh, to, to open, uh, reach out to the, to, into regions that's difficult for the U.S. government to diplomatically reach out to or operationally reach out to, and dealing with um, you know, other partners and government partners overseas in explaining the U.S. view in order to kind of like grease the wheels uh, for Roger and others to, to get involved. I think it's extremely important for third party to be very well trusted by all players, especially the U.S. government, have the knowledge, know exactly what they are doing, because sometimes third party can complicate a case more than it need to be complicated. Sometimes uh, for reasons that has to do, let's say, you know, I want to say promotion or whatever, it might also, um, you know, create some difficulties in moving forward and solving a case. So I think uh, from the report that the Foley Foundation just put out, we had about uh, 25 cases this year that were solved. 17 of them were uh, from the, um, there's two different ways. There's a, the t two different categories here. The, you have the t uh, hostages and you have the wrongfully detained. From the wrongfully detained, I think we had 25 cases. 17 of them were just diplomatic efforts of State Department and the U.S. government and Roger. 12 of them were uh, third party and government. So there is definitely a big space for trusted third parties. They have to be trusted uh, in order to get involved. And uh, I think they, they, can, uh, they can help. Um, the families, and they also can help the U.S. government um, reach to a good conclusion in bringing those folks back to their uh, loved ones. Thanks, Ali. Elizabeth, I want to ask you a bit about your own experience. So your, your brother has been held since 2018. You've seen over two administrations how these kind of cases are being handled. What's your perspective on what we can be doing better? How should we be thinking about this? And how has the hostage diplomacy as a foreign policy grown from what you've seen since 2018? Well, uh, it has been, it's almost been five years uh, since Paul was um, wrongfully detained. And I actually, I don't like the term wrongfully detained. I, I consider Paul a hostage because he's being held by a foreign government who wants something for him and that's hostage taking. So I tend to refer to it as state sponsored hostage taking rather than wrongful detention because I think wrongful detention is a, too soft of a, yes. a term to describe what's going on. And I would say, I'd like to speak just for a second as part of this response um, to this whole business about, uh, you know, does, uh, giving some kind of trade or whatever incentivize uh, further hostage taking. And I'd like to point out very particularly my brother's case because Paul was arrested, no trade was made for him, but then Trevor Reed and uh, Brittany Griner were both taken. So the Russians were incentivized by their own yes. uh, minds <laughs> as to <laughs> what they thought, behavior, you yes. know, it had nothing to do with anything that we have or have not, uh, you know, done in response. So what a hostile foreign government decides to do and why they decide to hold Americans, uh, there are a myriad of reasons, but it very rarely, in my opinion, from what I've seen in five years, has anything to do with a trade that went before. Now, I will say, though, in Russia's case, that uh, you know we have seen them try to play the U.S. government with their trades. Uh, in other words, release Brittany Griner uh, and not Paul, because they knew of the partisan chaos that that would cause back here. And so one of the things that I have been doing recently is uh, is pushing to make sure that Paul is not left behind for a third time. You know, we have another case, uh, and I feel for any family in this situation and any detainee, but I want to see Paul home. And so my job, you know, when I'm here in D.C. is to go to the NSC, the State Department and such, and say, thank you for all the work you're doing, because we have seen a huge 
upturn, particularly after the Levinson Act um, has passed and in this administration, of people really caring and trying to do as much as they can. But it, you can't say that every stone is being left unturned if there are some stones that still need to be turned over, if there are some boulders that we've gently pushed against, but we haven't done anything more with. And so I have to come down as a family member, representing Paul, who can't be here, and ask the government to push over those boulders, to do what it takes, to actually get my brother home. It is no good to go 80%. This other 20% that would result in a win is what is necessary. And I'm, I look for a winning mentality from any administration. Thanks, Elizabeth. And Cindy, I'm going to ask you to speak for a minute just to build on that, some of the big boulders that we see. Mm -hmm. um, what, what information from the report could we take and, and really push, maybe if we had to prioritize one or two of the findings in the report, that we should be encouraging Congress and um, new legislation to build on the Levinson Act? What would you say we should be thinking about? Yeah, yeah to build, you know, I think it's great, it, everything that Elizabeth just said, because the fam she represents a family's voice and, and the work that we do at the Foley Foundation, we come alongside family members. So we understand, so we work with them, you know, days after their loved one is, is either kidnapped or, or picked up in a foreign government. And so we understand the, you know, we understand the challenges families face as they nav try to navigate the DC in hostage enterprise. Most families don't even know what the hostage recovery fusion cell is, the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs. They're just not aware. Um, but the Levinson Act has been, and I, you know, I, I agree, it's been a linchpin to the hostage uh, enterprise. But the biggest challenge, and I would say this even for wrongful detainee families, and for the audience, I think it's important to know, the only one that has the authority to make the determination for a wrongful detention is the Secretary of State. So some of these families, to be able to get that wrongful detention determination, to be able to get access to Ambassador Carson's office there is, is, a, is an enormous challenge. And I think the largest challenge and one of the biggest takeaways is the fact is to identify the fact that there's a gap between how the State Department might view a case versus how a family views their case. And you, a family can have a lot of information, a lot of intelligence, but it's unclear whether or not that internal process in the State Department before it reaches the Spihaw's office, if they have all of that. So it's really an opaque process for a lot of these families. So one of the things that we would like to do, and it builds off of our recommendations as well, is to help try to close that gap. So it's less of an opaque process for the families, so they know what they're fighting for, what they're fighting against. They really just don't know. And, you know, it can take, you know, a few months to get the designation or it can take a couple of years. And it would be, it would just be advantageous and helpful for families so they can know what, you know, they want to put that right foot in front of them, right? They've made the left step. They want to make the right step. Which, which direction does that need to go? And I think there's a lot of room within our U.S. government to be able to close that gap to help uh, make that more of a transparent process for families. Thanks, Cindy. And I, I think that there is work being done on the Hill in that regard. And I'd love to give you a chance to respond, but I'm conscious of time and I really want to get to deterrence because that's where my passion is right now, because I think that it's great that we're bringing so many people home, but we need to stop this practice. So I wanted to ask both of you, and, and I'll have you guys weigh in in a second, but um, the Secretary had, in 2021, been part of the Canada Initiative, the Declaration Against Arbitrary Detention and State-to-State -state Relations. Um, what's happened since then? What should we be looking to? I know the Secretary is very big on deterrence. How should we be thinking about this, both from a government, non-government, and private corporation perspective? I'll try to be very tight in that. By the way, I should say thank you to Cynthia for that great report, another, uh, another wonderful report that you've put out and also to the Foley Foundation. I see Ellen back there scribbling uh, notes, but thanks for all the work that you've done in this report. is actually very important to us, so thank you. Um, in terms of deterrence, uh, the Secretary, uh, I think within the first uh, 14 days of, of his time here, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, we've got to get this to where this problem goes away, that we put it on the dustbin of history. And this may take 10 to 15 years, but we have to start it now. And since then, we have been working with the Canadians. They, they're up to 74 signatures at this point. Uh, you may or may not know, but at the UN General Assembly in New York next week, the, the Canadians are hosting a gathering to talk about the declaration. The United States is co-hosting along with Costa Rica. 
so the Secretary has stayed uh, right on top of this. He's kept it front and center. And I would say, as I just, as again, I want to make sure that everyone else has a chance to talk here, we try to look at this um, very holistically. I think right now something happens uh, in the foreign policy arena, and the United States feels they have to go for a deterrence effort. They'll quickly reach in their bag of tricks and pull out sanctions. And it's probably, it might be an overused tool by this point. Um, we would like to take a look at this more broadly across the uh, all elements of national power, what you might call the dime bill. Diplomacy, information, military, economic, law, uh, legal efforts, uh, economic, financial, um, informational uh, aspects. What can we do across the entire elements of US national power to start using tools to uh, make a country not do this anymore? To raise the price of this so that a country like Iran, for example, will say, you know what? We used to do this, but now if we do it again, the US is going to raise the cost. But in a way, that's not the entire answer. This has to be a multilateral effort. Right now, the Iranians are going to take hostages from the Swedes, the Belgians, the French, the United States, country X, country Y, country Z. And then they'll make their separate deals with each. We want to get it to the point where a country uh, suffers one of their citizens being arbitrarily detained in Iran and 10, 20, 30 countries all band together and tell the Iranians, you've done something wrong, we believe this person's wrongfully detained, and we're all getting together to use these tools across all elements of our national power to raise the cost of this. If, that's, if we can successfully do that over the next 10 to 15 years, we can take a practice which is essentially 4,500 years old and put that away. Thanks, Roger. And I'm just going to weigh in here as an active moderator and say that I think there's a couple of things that you and I have talked about that would build on that, and the U.S. can lead the way in, in terms of making wrongful detention officially a crime as part of Title 18, or opening up the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act to allow for private litigation against wrongful detention. I also think, from an American perspective, we need to stop having people travel to these countries and build more awareness so the State Department has a website for do not travel to certain countries or um, the risk of wrongful detention, but making more awareness of those risks so that people don't go to these countries. Ali, I know you had some thoughts on the um, declaration. I, I wanted to give you a chance to add it. And I think we're wrapping up on... Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I think the Canadian initiative is a very important step. As Roger said, there is, I think, 70, you know, more than 74 uh, co-signers. I think we need to have a common definition between all our partners. And because what's, what's happening, like for example, I'll give you an example instead of talking around it. Uh, Jeff Whitkey was kidnapped in a Sahel region. But he was kidnapped because they thought he was French. And they know the French policy in giving concession. But when they found he's an American, they kept him for seven years. Mm -hmm. Same thing with sister Sue Allen. So every country, even from our allies and partners and Western partners, have a different definitions in dealing with these things. Uh, you know, constraining the liberty of any individual is illegal according to international law and according to UN um, laws. However, they always define it as a hostage, not wrongfully detained. So states are using this, like states like Iran or Russia or China. And many of the entities that's using uh, the wrongfully detained, just to use, it, to use that term for the sake of argument, um, they are using it because... Um, they are, they are um, trying to get something. And those individuals or these countries are heavily sanctioned anyway. And they are pariah states, some of them, anyway. So just putting additional sanction on the regime is not going to you know, affect the people who are making these decisions. It's probably affect the people. So we need some kind of an international uh, coordination with the international community in dealing with these two issues, not only from a hostage perspective, but also as a state, nation states using um, detention as an international relation tool that they have. So this is essential. This is important to have something like this. And hopefully that down the road can be an international Levinson Act. Right, yes. codified all these things in international law and international treaties. The other thing is um, prevention. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I would love to see, for example, if you're buying a ticket even online from any of the platforms, something comes up that, you know, it explains to you the danger yes. of going to that place. And you have to say, yes, I agree or I read that and understand the complication of what you're going to put your family through, you want, what, and what you're going to put your country through. 
So I think that can be something uh, the travel industry and State Department hopefully can work together on something like. The third, I think, is um, pre-deployment to training. Um, mm -hmm. Journalists, I think the Foley Foundation, they have uh, a course for journalists who, uh, you know, independent journalists especially who go overseas. Um, also, you, you know, uh, this pre-deployment training can be done with coordination sometimes of the U.S. government or by independent uh, third-party experts um, for NGOs, uh, faith-based organizations, um, you know, uh, individuals, you know, groups of people who are more at risk, uh, students and so forth, to go for research to these areas. So they know what's going to happen if they get picked up. They know uh, what their families need to do. They prepare themselves just in case. Yes. Uh, they, so so these, these are things that um, uh, you know, can happen, and I can yes. see them happening. Uh, but we definitely need to do it in order to create prevention and also uh, to create deterrence. Thanks. And I'm going to go to you in a second. I just want to say, for the record, that I've been trying to get in touch with the Ad Council. I really think we need some public service announcements around this. And I think when somebody goes to search for a location in Google, you should get targeted ads as a result of travel to Iran or travel to Russia so that you see some of these risks and have more of that awareness, as well yeah. as the hostage flag being up at passport agencies. Or I understand that Congress is putting in the passport book um, some legislation to have information in your passport book about the risk of wrongful detention. Elizabeth, I know you have some thoughts on this. Well, I had, I had wanted to throw another sort of uh, uh, entity in there that I think could play a part in helping with hostage taking and wrongful detention. We tend to look to the government and to NGOs to solve these situations, but we're, we are letting corporations, large corporations uh, who already operate globally and have contacts and connections in different countries, we're letting them off the hook. They are allowed to not participate in helping bring Americans home. Um, and I, I feel very strongly about this um, because my brother was a corporate security director for uh, Borg Warner Automotive um, and would travel around the world doing business for, um, for them. And so uh, he was not in Russia on business. He was there to help a friend with a wedding. But they had contacts and the ability to potentially help Paul in those early days. And instead what they did was they made sure that the, their investors were protected and they eventually a few months later terminated him so that he was no longer an employee. Uh, he hadn't at that time, um, there was no Robert Levinson Act, so we, it took him almost a year and a half to be declared wrongfully detained. And it was just the biggest blow to him. Um, that not only was he the global um, security director, but he had created a process um, for dealing with hostage taking and kidnapping, and his own corporation didn't apply it to him. Uh, another case that I only know of, of course, as an observer, is the Citgo Corporation, when the Citgo 6 were taken, and they did not do what needed to be done for their employees. So we see, on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal are doing what they can, you know, uh, for Jason uh, Rezaian and now for um, Evan Gershkovich, um, they have a bully pulpit and, and they're definitely able to weigh in. But is that at, at the expense of some of these other detainees, like, like my brother, for example? So what I am looking for is for a way to, uh, whether it has to come from the government or how else, um, to have uh, a level of accountability from global corporations who might have connections and ways to help whether it's help the US government, help the Svihar, or whatever, but that that is considered um, only the, uh, that's the acceptable standard, and not helping is considered unacceptable. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I think we, we brought a lot of information into a really small discussion. I think we could talk all day about this, but I know we're out of time, so. Oh, good. Oh, I got the hook. Okay. <laughs> Okay, good. All right, perfect. Then I can go over to Cindy. I don't know, Cindy, if you want to weigh in on your perspective from everything that's just been said. Um, five more. Okay. Sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, of course, going last, there's everybody had great, um, uh, great, great opinions on this. 
it's it's challenging. At the end of the day, accountability is what matters. Um, having having the world watching when you're committing crimes that does something. Um, you know, and I agree. I agree with sanctions, right? Like you, you know, there's sanction fatigue, right? And but at the same time, you know, if we look at the sanctions that we do have, is do we have the ability to delist some of these individuals? Does that help? Would that help in steps in negotiations uh, or lead to future and further negotiations? Um, in addition to that, you know, along with what Ali was saying, having that international um, attention, having that broad definition so it impacts globally. You know, there's the International Convention Against the Taking of Hostage. That, you know, that was written in 79. That has not been updated to include hostages taken by foreign governments. That would be a good tool to use. Uh, my last suggestion, I'll be real brief here, and this is kind of a long stretch here, is the is United Nations, again, what would happen if you had, um, if you, here's the word again, if you do sanction somebody globally, we do, uh, with the uh, specially designated global terrorist list, uh, we will designate, an, you know, a foreign ter or a terrorist individual here in the United States, which restricts their travel and, and their funds. But in addition to that, the UN will come on top and also sanction that individual if it meets their criteria. And they usually, and they typically do that within the first week, up to a month, when the U.S. does designate, and that restricts travel globally for the, for the countries that do participate as well. Uh, so that's just another look at that. But again, it's really difficult. The challenge here with uh, holding individuals responsible for for state for state hostage taking essentially is how high up the chain do you go? You know what? You know how how is a sanction effective? If you know if because you can't hold the entire regime accountable. Um, well, you can, but at the same time, how effective are individual sanctions if uh, it's difficult to be able to identify which individual is responsible for those human rights violations, I would say. They have to feel the direct impact of that. Yes. Can I give you some good news? I would offer that um, when the president put out his executive order last summer, President Biden, he actually uh, directed that we keep pull, pushing on this deterrence effort. So. It's not even just the Secretary of State saying you will, it's the President of the United States with all executive authority saying to the interagency, figure this out and let's get a deterrence effort up and running. And additionally, he did give us a sanctioning authority uh, within the sphere, and we've so far used it against the, uh, the Russian FSB, their intelligence services, and the Iranians IRGC IO. So there is an ability within the SPIHA realm to like throw a sanction down uh, on, on an offending organization or person. But the most important thing is, um, everything that we're talking about, we have an order and a director from the president to figure this out and make it happen. Yes, and I think when those sanctions did come out, Josh Geltz, I'm not sure who it was exactly, but said that it's okay to build sanctions upon existing sanctions yeah. because it's about hostage taking. It's about yeah. wrongful detention taking. And so I think seeing more Levinson Act sanctions is something that's very much welcome and then building upon that. I do want to allow for one or two questions out of the audience. I'm told I have a, a time for that now. So Peter... Um, so this is really, uh, first of all, a comment about Roger. Roger is, I think, one of the very few uh, p um, senior officials who was held over by the Trump administration, from, uh, from the Trump administration into the Biden administration precisely because he's been so effective and the families really wanted him to stay in that position. Uh, so just wanted to thank you for all the work that you It was did. your leadership, Peter. I learned <laughs> when I worked for you. The other thing is I wanted to put a little meat on the bones because Ali had been talking about third parties and I... Ali was involved in, in an effort, and I think it's all public now, uh, that involved David Bradley, who's the former chairman of the board here at, at, at New America, which is Theo Padnos, an American journalist, was taken by an Al-Qaeda affiliate in Syria uh, and held for, I think, at least two years. Uh, and Ali and David Bradley were instrumental third parties in getting him out. So Ali, just if you could reflect a little bit on what you can say about that. Um, you know, I think the way we were dealing with hostages and, excuse me, wrongfully <laughs> detained was very different before than it is now. Uh, it was very complicated and frustrating to deal with the government. And I think um, due to, uh, you know, the leadership in the FBI today, there is a different culture and looking into things and more cooperation between the Bureau and outside third party. And I mean, just to, to build what you said. I, you know, Spiha, Roger, his office, Beth, everybody in the office, they have been fantastic to work with. Um, we really feel that 
we are one team. I think with Theo, it was very difficult to reach out into the groups in Syria. We uh, dealt with a trusted, uh, uh, I think at the time, Qatar, uh, to reach out to some opposition groups in Syria. And those opposition groups reached out to uh, the folks who were holding uh, Theo. And uh, there was uh, you know, a deal that was fa facilitated uh, through, you know, I think, Secretary Kerry and other folks who were involved in this. And uh, I don't want to go on a lot of details because sometimes we utilize, we still utilize some of these tactics. So I prefer to keep it, you know, and, and, and one of the things about uh, third parties, I believe that uh, uh, the moment that they start talking about what they do a lot, uh, the moment that means that uh, we're, we're, we're having a failure um, because um, you need to operate a little bit behind the scene just to facilitate what needs to be done. And we have a lot of friends around the world, a lot of partners around the world. And uh, those um, you know, partners have been instrumental and continue to be instrumental in uh, solving a lot of the difficult cases. And uh, I think um, what I can talk about, what I cannot talk about, I think it's better to have Roger talk about these things. <laughs> <laughs> I think you already said no comment. <laughs> we have one more question. Yeah, Liam Collins, senior fellow with New America. Uh, I guess as many of the panelists know, my background in hostage recovery is probably a little different than what we're talking about here, though it might have a role in deterrence for non-state actors. But I don't want to ask about that, but the, the media, we haven't really talked about that. So I can imagine the media can be helpful in bringing awareness, but at the same time, when you're trying to get a deal across the finish line, you're just like, can you just stop? We're, we're, we're closed. Now you're causing problems at home with po po politics at home or the actor you're trying to deal with. So it might be a question for Roger or, or someone else on the panel, but what's the role of the media and do you find them helpful or, or harmful in, in your efforts? Well, thanks Greg, uh, for that question. Liam and I, when uh, we were young officers, we served together in Germany before we went off and did some more high-speed uh, hostage rescue stuff. So great American hero right there. Um, I look at the media as, this may be kind of strange to say from a government perspective, but I look at them as a part of the hostage recovery enterprise. Um, they've done so much to bring awareness to this whole topic. Uh, they've brought cases to our attention. Uh, they've held us accountable. I mean, I, I probably have one or two uncomfortable interviews, I would say almost every week, right, <laughs> to where I'm held accountable by the media. And we actually, strangely, I think appreciate that. Uh, I think uh, the, when you have a journalist, uh, asking hard questions, uh, that's all right. I think they have a reason to, and you all have a need to know a lot of this stuff. When it gets classified, I've been encouraged by the amount of journalists who, when we say, um, this is going on, please hold that story, I would say almost 100% of the time they do that, even if they lose what could have been a groundbreaking uh, release. So overall, I would say the journalists uh, we've had the opportunity to work with have done a great job of, of doing all the things that you would expect of a journalist. And yet in that one area, those, uh, I guess those few examples where it could actually violate national security, they've been kind enough not to report. Specifically, you might talk about what's going on right now. Um, I, I think everyone's doing their job and part of our job is to not say too much uh, or even say nothing until after the fact. And I think we have that relationship. But to my mind, we've not really uh, had anything go uh, seriously into the ground because of reporting. Maybe that will happen in the future. Uh, we make sure that we work with journalists. Uh, we have a very good relation all day long. We're talking to them. So I think in building those relationships, we can make sure that we, um, uh, we do our part and they do their jobs as well. And again, I'll repeat, because of what they do, I feel like they're a part of the hostage recovery enterprise. Does that, does that scratch the issue? Did I answer that? Uh, and I'm just going to add to that, and then I know we're now officially out of time, but I'm just going to add from a family perspective, I think that they're really, it's really important that they also have the courage to cover the stories that maybe aren't as sexy. Yeah, right. um, we were talking in the green room before this about how important it is to recognize when people come home that yeah. they actually came home. Um, as opposed to the mechanics of the deal and beating up poor Roger or others about the deal itself, but focus on celebrating that five Americans hopefully, God willing, come home next week or the week after or whenever it might be. Um, I also wanted to add, I've been doing this since 2007 when my father was first taken. I think we've grown in this um, ecosystem tremendously and we continue to move forward in such a great direction and I hope one day we won't have to have these discussions because maybe we'll have brought everybody home and stopped it but um, until that day it's been a pleasure to have 
these uh, colleagues next to me, and hopefully we'll have something similar in the future. So the next session, which we're going to start our afternoon with, is how are others preparing for the future? And um, the moderator of this panel is Colonel Liam Collins, who's had a very distinguished career in Joint Special Operations Command um, and uh, instrumental in setting up the West Point's Counterterrorism Center and also the Modern Warfare Institute. Uh, he's also a fellow at New America. I'm going to hand it over to Liam. All right, for this panel, I'll be joined by Brigadier General U.S. Army retired Brian Davis, who is the director of China Research Division at Blue, pa Blue Path Labs and former defense attache to uh, Beijing, China. Uh, Dr. Andrea Kendall Taylor, senior fellow and director of Transatlantic Security Program at the Center for New America uh, Security and former deputy national intelligence officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council. And Dr. Tricia Bacon, associate professor at American University and author of uh, Terror and Transition. So we had about 30 minutes for this panel, so we'll try to work through it and cover these three important uh, topics during that time, uh, which will be a challenge. Uh, but I will not, I promise I will not monopolize the full 30 minutes, so audience, be, uh, please have uh, some questions in mind, so we'll have some time at the end for that. Uh, the most recent national security strategy states, the most pressing strategic challenge facing our vision is from powers that, lay, uh, that layer authoritarian governance with a revisionist foreign policy. Russia and the People's Republic of China pose different challenges. Russia poses an immediate threat to the free and open international system, recklessly flouting the basic laws of the international order today, as its brutal way, war of aggression against Ukraine has shown. The People's Republic of China, by contrast, is the only competitor with both the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to advance that objective. So, so it is important to understand the intentions and capabilities uh, of these two nations. Uh, so General Davis, I'll start with you first and ask you, how is China preparing for the future? Thanks, Liam, and uh, thanks to New America and Arizona State for the opportunity to participate in this forum. So before I address your question, I guess I would ask the question, so what is China preparing for? And I would offer that China's preparing to regain its position as a, a major global power, uh, but not just necessarily a major global power, but potentially the major global power by the middle of this century. Uh, and they do this in several sectors. So politically, <clears throat> if you look at what Xi Jinping has done since he's uh, taken over as General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, he's strengthened his control of the party, uh, and then he strengthened the party's control of both the state and the military. He centralized decision-making around himself, leading both established uh, formal committees in charge of all, all of the major key issues that he's interested in, but also ad hoc committees. Uh, and finally, he has um, driven the system from what was primarily a consensus-based decision-making system after the chaos of Mao Zedong uh, back to where he is at the center of that decision-making structure. Why, is he do, why does he do that? Well, he, it appears that he thinks he's the only person that can lead China to its rightful place in the future, which is the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation. Uh, economically, uh, for example, China is finding ways to maintain connectivity across global economies with major economies of the world, but also ensure that several of those economies are reliant on China. Uh, and they're taking efforts to improve technologic, tech, technology innovation, modernization, and independence. Uh, for example, uh, this year in the spring in the National People's Congress, uh, a law was passed to both reform and reorganize the Ministry of Science and Technology, which uh, will oversee strategic technologies, policies, investments, funding, etc. And they're also taking efforts to strengthen their uh, supply chains and domestic production, and, and specifically some of the key areas for domestic production, production are 35 technology, what they call choke points, that are critical for China's economic development. Uh, finally, they're also strengthening their domestic sector of their economy to help better insulate China from foreign, um, foreign influence, uh, negative foreign influence. 
be it sanctions or just the ups and downs of the global economy. Economically, uh, I'm sorry, diplomatically, China's working to reshape the international institutions that it's a member of, but also at the same time establishing parallel institutions. It's also courting the global south. You see that play out in the United Nations, but, uh, but elsewhere as well. Militarily, we, we do tend to, I follow that more than the others, but obviously the PLA continues to modernize rapidly. Uh, with the goal, as stated by Xi Jinping, of achieving basic modernization by 2035 and become a world-class military by the middle of the century. And then finally, in the information realm, China continues to strengthen its influence across global media, uh, its propaganda system, both uh, directed at its uh, domestic population and internationally, and is strengthening its influence operations across the world, led by the party's United Front Work Department. These are just a few examples of how China is preparing for the future. So what has China learned, if anything, from the Russia's invasion of Ukraine in terms of impacting their goals, vision, strategy? Has anything changed based off of what's, how that's played out over the last 20 months? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's still playing out. So they still have the, the ultimate lessons, lesson or lessons that they take are not necessarily fully established. But I think a couple examples or if you look at the run-up to Russia's invasion in February of last year, it's how the United States and its allies leveraged intelligence and got it out into the public sector. So how, how is China going to prepare for that and insulate? That, that's probably a major lesson that they took prior to and right after the invasion. I think another area that they would see is you know, information aspect in general, controlling the narrative, shaping that narrative for multiple audiences. Uh, Russia has not necessarily done that as well as uh, what China would be prepared to do. Looking at the will of the Ukrainian people to fight against uh, Russia, I mean, I think most of us were surprised at what they've been able to do. Uh, that obviously is a key factor for what could play out if there were to be some sort of a Taiwan military scenario, whether it's the will to fight or at least the will as a, as a, as a, population to hold out until potential help could come from the United States. And one thing that we're learning, I mean, you shouldn't say we're learning, some of us are learning, some of us already know it, but you know, technology matters, but the people are probably more important than technology as we're learning in the war once again. And I wonder if you can build a professional non-commissioned officer corps or, or empower junior leaders in an authoritarian state where that is a kind of a risk to the nation. You know, is that something, what is China doing to ensure that they have, or do they have, you know, junior officers that are able of taking initiative on the battlefield with the speed of warfare in the 20th, 21st century? So, yeah, the Chinese military, it's a, it's a different system than what we think of when we think of Western militaries. Um, part of it is the Leninist control over the army, and so it's different. There's the influence of Chinese culture on the army. There's the influence of the Chinese Communist Party's influence and culture. But in general, um, it is a much more centralized decision-making system. The party and the PLA senior leadership values that. They do understand that they need more junior officers and NCOs to be able to take initiative, but it's more constrained than what you might think of from your military background or my military background. Uh, and, and NCOs tend to be more, not necessarily technicians, but more uh, able to execute tasks than be that key small unit leader that develops, that has grown in our military, that, that's the strength of what our military is. But it continues to involve, evolve, they continue to uh, change their personnel policies and their training to make their NCO core better. But I wouldn't say it's going to be an NCO core that is a mirror image of a Western NCO. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I'll, I'll now turn to you, Dr. Kendall Taylor, and ask you a similar question. What, what's Russia doing to prepare for the future? Yeah, I'll start with your point about the national security strategy, talking about Russia as immediate threat. And I think that's right, but we have to also understand that it's a persistent threat. And so what do I mean by that? I think we all understand that Russia will emerge from its war in Ukraine weaker in all ways, economically, geopolitically, and certainly militarily. Uh, and there will therefore be a really significant temptation, I think, especially here in Washington, to downgrade Russia as a threat. But I would argue that that would be a significant mistake because what we see is that Russia is looking to adapt and it is evolving its tactics in response to the challenges that it faces in Ukraine. 
And just like you talked about, well, what is China preparing for? Well, what is Russia preparing for? And I think we have to be clear that even though the United States isn't fighting Russia in Ukraine, Russia very much perceives or understands itself to be at war with us. Uh, and it has framed this as an existential challenge and even as a civilizational challenge. And so uh, it will very much retain the intent uh, to challenge the United States for the foreseeable future and certainly past even Putin's time in office. So then what are they preparing to, you know, to do as a part of that civilizational challenge? Well, first and foremost, most immediately, they're looking to evolve. Uh, and they're looking to bypass and circumvent the unprecedented Western pressure that we've put on. Uh, they are looking and actively uh, circumventing sanctions and export controls that the United States and its allies have applied. There was a really great story just today in the New York Times that talked about how Russia is circumventing sanctions and export controls and that they've actually um, expanded its missile production to pre-war level, to pre-war levels. Uh, so this threat is not going away. Uh, they're also actively deepening partnerships with external partners. Obviously in the news today is North Korea and that meeting, that deepening of that bilateral relationship, but it's also Iran and China. So Russia is actively looking to build a coalition of countries that share its hostility to the United States and our influence and our power. And I think that the thing that I worry most about is the more desperate Russia becomes in the war, the more they're going to be willing to give away in, in those relationships. Um, so giving away technology to the North Koreans, to the Iranians. And so they are actually amplifying, making worse America's challenges in other parts of the globe. Um, in addition to the kind of circumventing uh, and mitigating Western pressure, they're also adapting tactics. And I think that's happening on the battlefield in Ukraine, but also in a very broad sense, we can see that the more degraded the Russian military is in terms of its, the conventional military, the more they're relying on its non-conventional tools and tactics. So at the low end in the hybrid realm, that means they're relying more heavily on things like cyber, uh, we'll, we should expect more attacks on things like critical infrastructure, it's sabotage, it's information operations. That will become much more important in Russia's arsenal the more degraded they are conventionally. But then it's also a risk at the high end in the nuclear domain. So we should expect that the nuclear weapons become a much more important part of Russia's uh, military strategy. It's going to be a low cost and very effective way to offset the vulnerabilities that it faces. And so what does that mean? Well, we should expect force posture changes and changes to the structure of its nuclear forces, uh, much more elaborate uh, uh, warning exercises. Uh, and I think, you know, thinking about the arms control realm, they're actively undermining the, you know, with, with, with uh, suspending its participation in New START. So this is also the way that they're preparing is they're intentionally introducing risk into the relationship they understand the United States and Europe to be more risk averse than Russia, and so they're introducing that risk as a way to get us to self-restrain. Um, so I think, and, and, and it'll be interesting to think about what, you know, the proliferation of semi-state organizations. All of these types of things I think Russia is working on to try to immediately uh, address vulnerabilities that it sees. And then in the longer term, we should all expect that Russia will certainly look to reconstitute its military and that includes in areas like AI, uh, where they're actively trying to integrate AI into the battlefield in Ukraine. So I think my kind of bumper sticker is that Russia is, is down, but it's not out, and it will remain a good enough power with both the capabilities and the intent to challenge the United States for the foreseeable future. All right, I'm going to ask a question. Probably everybody in the audience wants to know about how long uh, this war will go on, but I, I'll, I'll set it up a little bit. So I'll ask it, you know, former intel officer will never give you a straight answer, though. On, on November 11th, I think it was November 11th, 2001, I asked my intelligence analyst, how long is it, you know, will it take Kabul to fall to the Taliban? And he said, oh, it's going to probably take years. They lasted a long time against the Soviets, and, or the Russian yeah, Soviets at the time. And, and then the next day, they, they fell, and I said, well, that was, you're worthless to me as an intel analyst. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you the question is, right, if we assume Ukraine has, a, has the will, right, they've demonstrated that in 2014, 2015, and throughout this war, right, that, that's not going to waver. As long as they get supplied, right, get the capabilities necessary to fight a war, and if those go away, they'll probably just go to a counterinsurgency, how long can Russia maintain the will, or probably more will than capability, to, to, for the war to go on if it's, 
you know, from that perspective is one potential ending, recognizing, right, the war in Afghanistan lasted a decade, and, uh, but their interest in Ukraine are, right, exponentially more than anything else that they've been involved in. So how long can Russia... I mean, I think Putin, I think it's in, he sees it as in his interest to fight a long war. Um, and so, you know, first and foremost, he obviously believes that he can outlast the United States and Europe, and he'll look at political changes potentially here in Washington, but also other European capitals, and expect that they could bring changes in leadership and a resulting um, reduction in Western military support for Ukraine. But even more than that, I think, you know, it's in, you, I've done a lot of work on looking at kind of the duration of wars and tied to leaders' interests. And um, Putin, he faces more challenges at home as a result of the war in Ukraine. So the Prigozhin incident is a, certainly a very poignant reminder of that. But I actually think it's in his interest because being at war makes him more secure at home. There's very few authoritarian leaders who are unseated while a war that they are involved in is ongoing. And so for me, I think it helps insulate him in power. As soon as the war ends, there's going to be a political reckoning. There's going to be a lot of questions asked. And certainly if Russians perceive it as a military defeat, then the risk of him losing his job, which he would equate with probably his life, because we know that these personalist dictators, once they're ousted from office, are jailed, killed, and prison. So it's, he's talking about his own personal survival. And so I see, I believe that it, he perceives it in his interest to keep this going because it actually makes him more secure in office. And so he would like to see that this. And I, and I do think that they have the kind of capacity at home in order to sustain the fighting for quite a long time. Ask you one more question before transitioning to terrorism. So, I mean, why do we, why, how do we get their performance? How do we predict it so wrong? Is it, I mean, I knew Ukraine's capabilities, so I, they performed how I thought they would. Uh, but even I was surprised by Russia's underperformance. I mean, obviously, you know, somewhat like a meteorologist, we're incentivized to overestimate because the cost of underestimating can be severe. Um, but what explains kind of this, and it's repeated, but you know, this inability to kind of really anticipate their capabilities. Is it an intelligence failure? Is it a military industrial complex trying to justify an $800 billion budget? Is it something else? I mean, why do we consistently get this so wrong? Well, I come back to your Afghanistan, and part of me wonders quite a lot. I obviously wasn't in the intelligence community at the time, but they were obviously wrong on their Afghanistan call, thinking that Kabul could last a long time. And I sometimes wonder if they had then the knee-jerk reaction to try to warn um, about in, in the opposite direction. So I think that there was some linkage there. But I, I think generally speaking, we have um, institutionally a predisposition to overestimating Russia's capabilities. And during my time in the intelligence community, I feel like I saw this time and time again in Syria and other places where there's this expectation of what Russia wants, Russia gets without really having spent the time and in investing and in understanding the capabilities and the intent on the receiving end. And so uh, for that reason, I think you know, that was a large part of it. Um, a large part of it is just the way that the war played out, right? That this isn't the, with the training exercises and other things, um, this is not the war that Russia was planning to fight. Um, its plans, because of the personalization of the political system, were also close held. A lot of um, uh, military officers who should have been involved in planning were not. They were excluded from that. And so it was also a poorly planned. So part, it's hard to know if we grossly over, how, that, to what extent we grossly overestimated the Russian army and to what extent some of it was a bit contingent on the plan that was in place which of course was a, a result of the personalization and the rot within, within the Russian system. Thanks, Andrea. All right, Dr. Bacon, we'll, we'll turn now to a discussion of terrorist groups. I mean, over the past decades, right, we've seen consistently evolutions in terms of tactics, organizations, ideology, goals, capability, pretty much everything across the spectrum. So how are terrorist groups evolving and what might we expect to see in the future? Sure, it's probably fitting that I'm last in this discussion because if you open last it, but not least, <laughs> perhaps also least. But um, <laughs> when you go through the national security strategy, you just keep flipping and flipping and flipping before you get to counterterrorism, and there's clearly good reasons for it that we already heard about. So I, I don't necessarily disagree with the downgrading of terrorism, but it does come um, with its own problems because just because we're done with counterterrorism does not mean they are done with us, essentially. And I would say there's two things that have really characterized the jihadist movement over the last you know, 20 
probably, probably more accurately, 30 or so years, and that probably will going forward. And the first is their resilience. These are organizations that, despite the massive amount of counterterrorism pressure over the last 20 years, we have really struggled to actually defeat. There have been plenty of declarations of defeat, the Taliban in 2001, the Islamic State in Iraq in 2010, al-Shabaab in 2013, the Pakistani Taliban in 2014, and all of these organizations have been able to rebuild and resurge to be stronger than they were before. So I would expect that they will continue to be resilient. And I say that also as a caution because there was a lot of talk at this uh, most recent September 11th anniversary, which in my professional career was the one with sort of the least discussion or fanfare or events or uh, debates of, of any uh, since 2001. And there's a lot of discussion about Al-Qaeda being as its nadir and the Islamic State as being so. And what I would say is these organizations have consistently been declared as defeated, as dead, and they almost never have been. These are just incredibly resilient organizations. And I think the second thing that they're effective at, which it gets to the resilience, is they're very effective at exploiting fertile conditions. And so what we see today is not necessarily a jihadist movement that's weaker, it's one that has morphed. It has an epicenter, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa now, where a place where the United States has, has consistently struggled to recognize the national security importance of that region. And what we see there is jihadist expansion on ways that were unimaginable 20 years ago. The number of organizations, you have uh, both Islamic State and Al-Qaeda affiliates, the number of countries affected, the number of attacks, the number of fatalities, all of the indicators are very, very alarming in sub-Saharan Africa. And there's really no systems in place at this point to do anything to mitigate that downward slide. If anything, the great power, near-peer, strategic competition, whatever we're calling it, is exacerbating it. As we see Russia come into the Sahel, for example, and um, essentially make conditions worse and creating conditions that the jihadist groups are even more effective at exploiting. We even see in Afghanistan where, okay, we haven't seen a resurgence of Al-Qaeda yet, but we have seen the Taliban provide per, uh, permissive conditions for the Pakistani Taliban and a significant deterioration in Pakistan. So overall, these are groups that are going to exploit the space that they get from the lack of counterterrorism pressure. They're going to seek uh, ways to disrupt, and that's essentially what they are at this point. They're a disruptive threat to the United States. They have the ability to distract from the very important challenges we face from peers or near peers or however we'd like to characterize them, they're still very capable of those kinds of actions, even if they are not the primary threat anymore. And they're still very effective at exploiting conditions when they are available to expand in terms of their recruitment, their attacks, their safe havens, and even their ability to potentially take over entire states in some places in sub-Saharan Africa. So we're not necessarily in a less dangerous environment. I don't see another September 11th attack coming, but we do have a, a movement overall that has grown and expanded in really important ways and is still exploiting the conditions that exist today. Trisha, I've done a terrible job of managing the time. Uh, so I'll ask you one question and then turn it over to the right. audience. For probably maybe Last one or eight. two questions. So uh, what can we do better from a policy perspective in terms of counterterrorism policy? Yeah, no, that's a very reasonable question to ask at this point. And what I would say is much of the, whatever you want to call the years after September 11th, global war on terrorism, et cetera, we were incredibly good tactically. We're very good at tactical successes in terms of um, leadership decapitation or offensives that weaken these organizations. But these different tactics never really came together as effective strategies to execute the, cold, the full defeat of some of these organizations, some of whom really could have been defeated. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that going forward, we're going to have less of those tactics, less of those resources, and it's going to force us to come up with a more uh, comprehensive strategy that isn't so military centric. Thank you, Tricia. I, I, we probably have time for one or two questions, depending on uh, the length of our answers. Yep. Thank you. Un, thank you very much. Uh, we saw Kim Jong Un, um, you know, have a visit with uh, Vladimir Putin, first time in several years. 
uh, clearly a, a kind of role change almost, uh, where we have Putin as the supplicant and uh, Kim Jong Un as the as the superior in a very strange twist, uh, but has implications for uh, the PLA and for China as well. I wonder if you just comment a little bit about what you think about that role change, um, how it might evolve over the future, and where China sits in this relationship with Russia right now. Um, that's a great question. I think part of the relationship is just by nature of they both feel constrained by the United States, that U.S. policies are directed at, um, <clears throat> from a Chinese perspective, and I, I, I won't offer the Russian perspective, but from the Chinese perspective, uh, there's a feeling that the U.S. is in decline and that the U.S. is attempting to thwart China's rightful reemergence as a global power. <clears throat> and so Russia in some ways is a partner of convenience. I think part of that from the Chinese perspective is also, even though there's a lot of areas where China and Russia are not aligned, uh, there is a personal relationship between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin that is important that could be taking them a little further than if the mechanisms of the, the two states were left to determine that way ahead. What will happen after one or both of them eventually go away remains to be seen, um, but it certainly is a, a factor. Uh, and then at the end of the day is, um, you know, with China's growth and modernization and that shift of who's the big brother, who's the little brother in the relationship, uh, if China's economy does slow down um, where <clears throat> they're not modernizing at a rapid pace where they, the, the reliance or the, the appetite for some of the strategic resources that Russia is able to provide, such as minerals and oil, where that appetite decreases, how will that affect that relationship? I don't know the answer, but it'll be, you know, professionally looking at it, it will be fascinating to see how that plays out. The only thing I would add is, I mean, I just see it, there's like a dangerous synergy. And I think that when they're, even though they have disagreements and their interests diverge, Working together, it amplifies the, the net effect of all of them. So they, and they, they understand that, so that they're less isolated when they're cooperating. They're able to distract attention, so that's very useful from China's perspective. I'm sure uh, Putin didn't, doesn't mind if uh, North Korea acts a bit more belligerently on the international stage because that's a distraction. So I think of it as like an, a, syn a synergy and that together they're, they're more threatening than they would be individually. If it was anybody else, I'd say we're out of time, but I believe Peter, <laughs> Peter's got a question. One question for call me. Calling in a question. Um, bonus, so bonus. Uh, for Dr. Bacon, you know, you, you alluded to this. So on September 11th, the National Counterterrorism Center said essentially we, we've won against Al Qaeda. And, and in June, the UN released a report that basically said completely the opposite, you know, the Haqqani, who's the Minister of the Interior, is part of the Leadership Council of Al Qaeda. They have a very different narrative. So I just uh, I wonder how you adjudicate these seemingly two very different conclusions. And for General Davis, you know, uh, the Chinese face a demographic cliff that they're about to fall off. Their economy, you mentioned, I mean, their real estate is going to crash. Uh, they have a terrible command economy, which is the, the zero COVID policy obviously had a, a lot of impact. Uh, if you look at Pew, Pew polling, they're very unpopular. Uh, Belt and Road hasn't gone quite the way they wanted. And, um, and, you know, they have a sea of problems. Does that make them more inclined to invade Taiwan in 2027, as she has told PLA to be prepared for, or less? Um, on the question of adjudicating the different assessments of Al-Qaeda, they are very hard, it's very hard to reconcile those two reports, um, to be sure. I think one of the things that we're going to face, though, is an environment of decreasing amounts and quality of information. And it means that people will weigh certain pieces of information more heavily than others. And I think that and there will be sort of baseline assumptions about the organization that will take people in increasingly sort of um, divergent assessments. And um, so I think, I also think that there, there is a, a narrowing of how the U.S. views the threat. It's much more about, is this a threat to the homeland? Is this a threat to the U.S. interests? And the U.N. has sort of a broader aperture and that that explains part of it. But I, off, I think a lot of it is just the sort of dearth of really quality information to use as a basis for an assessment. And then on your China question, China's economic policy is, in the past has been focused on 
modernizing before your demographics cliff catches up with you. And with the slowdown, that does complicate uh, the party's domestic agenda. Um, I would say, just from watching them for 25 years now, never underestimate the ability of the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese state to muddle through a problem you know, when we think they can't. Uh, and so you know, stay tuned to see what happens. Uh, but it's clear the economy is slowing down. There are a lot of problems. Uh, and this predates the party, but you know, it, it has happened in the past where China's being able to use foreign, foreign actors or foreign problems to refocus domestic frustration. And that could play out in a Taiwan scenario. I think it comes down to, you know, to Xi Jinping. Uh, in the past, the pre previous leaders of the party were content to make progress in unification with Taiwan. Um, Xi's given himself more time with the removal of term limits for, for president. Now, the ter there was no term limit for general secretary of the party or chairman of the Central Military Commission, the other two positions he holds. Um, but does he feel it has to happen on his watch? And I, given his age, at what point does that perhaps become a tipping point in his mind. I don't know, obviously, and I don't think anybody knows, but that's a factor as well. I always say from the Russia case, don't underestimate a personalist dictator's ability to miscalculate. And well, Peter, you set this up like a good party, right? Always leave everybody wanting more instead of <laughs> realizing they stuck around too long. So uh, thank the panel, uh, panelists and participating. Um, the next panel is What Technologies Will Shape the Future of Warfare? Thanks so much. Certainly. Life lessons learned. Oh, hold it. Okay. One lesson you've learned in your career. Go through the group. I think the biggest lesson that I've learned um, through, my, through my career is to embrace flexibility. I, I'd say that um, starting um, my career, I was at the bench for uh, about 10 years. I did research in a range of things from... Um, detection of biological threat agents to nanomaterials uh, to the development of novel sensors and uh, high uh, performance data processing techniques. Um, and about halfway through my career, I made the transition uh, to go more into um, science and technology advisory roles where I at one point served as the acting basic research portfolio director for the entire army and uh, leading um, the direction of science and technology and also served in some roles in, in terms of uh, technology strategy development for uh, not only the army research laboratory but also uh, the whole department of the army. So uh, I, I think you have to really kind of embrace this ability to uh, reinvent yourself 
and some of my uh, scientific heroes, uh, I, I think think of um, folks like Linus Pauling or or, uh, um, or to uh, a, a le perhaps lesser known but equally uh, deep uh, folks like Twan Rodin um, had the ability to be able to reinvent themselves to um, pivot into a new technical area as it presented itself to master that technical area and push that technical area to the envelope and then do it two or three times throughout their career. Um, I, I used to have a sort of a saying when early in my career that if you're working on the same thing the day you retire that you worked on the day you started, then you probably haven't really move the technological stakes very far. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, I love you, one, uh, providing great advice to um, both the policy audience, but we've also got some students, because this mm -hmm. is a joint academic, and that is, um, that's pure gold uh, mm -hmm. in terms of life advice, but also for how you helped us fill a moment as we get our own <laughs> technology set. So I'm, um, uh, now I see our other guests joining. Uh, hopefully they're hearing us. We've got uh, Major General Mick Ryan, a close friend, uh, who is, um, uh, had a distinguished career um, in a variety of roles within the Australian military, including leading their defense college. Uh, he's now an adjunct fellow at Center for Strategic International Studies and um, also a author of a variety of nonfiction as well as a new fiction book uh, his, uh, the most recent, War Transformed and White Sun War. And then we've got Laura Grego, uh, who is Senior Scientist and Research Director of the Global Security Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists, as well as a distinguished researcher in her own career. So thank you both uh, for joining us. Um, so I'm going to uh, begin with um, a first question. And um, why don't we uh, start off uh, with um, Laura first, uh, which is, what technology do you see as the most important but simultaneously least understood in its significance for the future? Well, uh, thanks for the invitation, Peter. I think probably many of us are, are going to include artificial intelligence as uh, the most important and least understood. Um, I think, you know, what, what we see now are the fruits of the previous generation of AI, which can do, you know, really good pattern rec recognition, make inferences, absorb large amounts of data. Um, and, uh, and, but I think, uh, and that can really be a boon, of course, it can aid in um, verification, it can provide pathways for controlling technologies. Um, some of the concerns, though, I have about it, I think um, one of the, I worry that decision makers will use AI as a decision making tool, and this may not necessarily always be better. Um, would AI have been better at predicting whether Putin was actually going to invade Ukraine when it did? I'm not sure. Um, are there things, especially in the realm of human behavior, where AI might just reproduce our own biases and cause us not to question our information sources, not to have enough skepticism? I think the other place I'm concerned about with respect to decision making is that AI will enable and reinforce our desire to move quickly and respond rapidly. Um, I, I spend most of my time thinking about nuclear issues, and that is one place I worry. Um, you know, nuclear weapons are currently postured to be launched at a moment's notice, and many of the strategic technologies increase the tempo. Um, and I worry that AI will only further increase the tempo. Um, we're starting to include maneuvering glide missiles, anti-satellite weapons, and novel long-range nuclear delivery systems, and many of them are ready to be used at a moment's notice. So I do worry that AI can increase um, confidence and compress time scales. And then, of course, the part that we don't understand is that we're, we're kind of looking at the current version of AI, um, but what can it do in the future? And um, we already see how well it can do shaping and manipulating the information environment when coupled with social media, what what, it, what will that look like in the future? I mean, even currently, we, we ha it amplifies our uh, expressions of racism, sexism, other kinds of bigotry, and can e even, social media can do that even when it's not being manipulated by AI, but um, as that becomes more useful and powerful, I'm not sure we have a great way to deal with that. So, um, those are some of the concerns and the things I think we don't understand about AI. Wow. 
So um, what technology do you see as in that space of most important but simultaneously least understood? Sorry, you cut out there for a moment, Peter. Was that a question for me? That was a question for you. Uh, I'm going to ask yeah. it again um, uh, because we are having tech issues. Um, uh, very appropriate to the topic. <laughs> what, um, what technology do you see as most important but least understood? Um, for me, I, I would have to say it's democratized access to uh, battlefield command and control systems. I, I think there's been a lot of focus during the Ukraine war on things like autonomous systems and, and even the meshing of civil and military sensor frameworks and, and analytical capability. But I think one of the transformative elements of this war is that, at least on the Ukrainian side, they've democratized access to systems that were previously uh, secret, kept in unit uh, command posts. Uh, we now have individuals that now have access to input and receive uh, location data, targeting data, uh, in a way that we just haven't seen in, in previous conflicts before. Um, it kind of replicates what we've seen go on in society with the internet in the last 30 years. Now it's on the battlefield. And I think what that's doing is having a couple of impacts. Firstly, uh, it's kind of enhancing the survivability on, of people on, on one side of things, but it's also closing the detection to destruction gap that uh, is continuing to close on the battlefield. Um, but it also uh, closes the gap between when things happen and when people find out about them, not just on the battlefield, but in, in these things such as the strategic strike we saw in Sevastopol in the last 24 hours, we're already seeing battle damage assessment from multiple open sources. So, you know, I think that democratization of access to data uh, to people at the edge on the battlefield is, is something very new and we're really uh, at the very start of, I think. I'd really like to echo, you know, what Laura and Mick said. Uh, I think they covered those topic, the topic pretty well. But I'd like to add probably the one that uh, I think of most often is synthetic biology. Uh, it holds the greatest promise. It's a, a sort of emerging science, and but it holds significant promise to be able to do things like fuel the point of need manufacturing to address logistics challenges that go along with uh, uh, any sort of tactical operation. But it, it has the uh, ability to cover so many, go in so many different directions from materials to sensing modalities to uh, even into uh, computer processing realm. It, um, and I, I think it, we're just at the beginning of the area where we can, we're really just starting to understand this. How, how do we really manage and engineer the genome to really uh, realize downstream processes and downstream materials that are going to be, can be used for a myriad of things um, that really kind of, uh, I often think of it as sort of the third leg of the, the synthetic, uh, molecular synthetic uh, triad, you know, whether you do your classical stepwise synthetic approaches, or you do uh, things like uh, combinatorial chemistry to get to those new materials, and uh, thirdly, leveraging biological systems to be able to produce things for you. And again, those things could be electronic in nature, they can be optical in nature, they, they, they can be even energetic in, in nature. And I think it really starts to change the way we think about uh, national security and warfare in the sense that um, you can start to do some of those things where you need them, which is significantly different than the way that we've done them traditionally where you produce the materials in the rear and then have to move them forward. So that uh, really gets you into the, the point of need manufacturing and advanced manufacturing, um, which is really important. Mm -hmm. So wars are um, contests of uh, arms and political will, um, but they're also learning laboratories of a kind, both for the forces within as they move, as they back and forth, but also 
everyone else watching and thinking about the lessons and how they might apply to their own plans for the future. So I'd like to look at the Ukraine war and through that lens. What are the lessons that you have taken from Ukraine? And why don't we go in the same order again? So Laura, what are some of the lessons that you've taken from Ukraine? Um, it's an interesting question. Um, I, mean, I, I know we're talking about future technology, um, but I think two of the big ones that that to, came to mind are more human lessons. And, and one is just a reiteration that leadership is so important and that strong institutions matter. Um, I mean, arguably, uh, President Putin has ruined Russia's future. Um, with this decision. And, you know, I'm I'm very glad that in the United States, we have an experienced president with a good temperament and a really solid team behind him that's been able to navigate a lot of these dangers and a lot of the brinksmanship um, in this conflict. And, um, and I, yeah, I think the administration has done a pretty good job of, of managing that while help, continuing to help Ukraine. I mean, you can imagine though a different personality could have led us in really different and dangerous directions. So just I think a reiteration that strong democratic institutions are so important and strong civil society institutions are so important. Um, the ability of citizens to dissent pr productively when you have these, if you have a personalist or a narcissistic leader, you know, you end up with an information bubble. Yes, yes and no men, they personalize conflict. I think that increases the existential threat the other thing that I thought is, was interesting was, you know, in the news in the last few weeks about the role commercial interests have played, you know, specifically um, providing um, communications, broadband internet um, by, by the Starlink system. Um, I certainly hope that as we go forward, we make sure that our decisions are made by people who are accountable to populations and not um, accountable to their companies. Um, you know, not that elected officials always get things right, but that by, by design, they're accountable. So I do think that um, uh, strategically, we really need to think about making sure that, that those things are in place. Um, you know, it's it's not a good idea to have commercial entities have that much decision making power. So I think it's a good um, thing to keep an eye on in the future, especially as humans consider moving into space um, with more um, with more resources. We definitely need a strong governance a system that's accountable to people. Mick, uh, you've uh, actually traveled multiple times to Ukraine, and so your observations. Uh, or both as an analyst, but also bringing in some first person side. So what are some of the highlights of what you've learned uh, from Ukraine? Um, thanks, Peter. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of observations we can take. I'm not sure anything yet is a lesson learned. Uh, I think there's some way to go yet. And a lot of institutions are struggling with what they observe in Ukraine and whether it's relevant to them or not, not every lesson might be. But a couple of things I think are important. Firstly, is this notion of the adaptation battle. It's, as you noted, wars are also a learning opportunity. Um, and at every level, whether it's a tactical, operational, strategic or political, there's an adaptation battle going on as each side struggles to gain some kind of advantage, to learn what's going on, to, to learn how they're learning about the conflict and then constantly change, adapt and, and evolve. And we've seen both sides adapt and evolve their strategy, their tactics, their equipment, uh, their external um, relationships throughout this war. So I think that's a really important thing. And, and what that says to me is, what is the organizational learning culture of whatever institution you belong to? How do you nurture the foundations for adaptation before you go to war. So uh, if you do find yourself in one and you're not able to deter it, how do you best learn and adapt? I think a second observation would be that there are very few, few very few new things in this war. I mean, this, most wars are an aggregation of, of every idea, every technology and every organization that's gone before it uh, with a couple of new things added. So this, this war features, you know, mass uh, warfare. It features the mobilization of people and industry. It features alliances. It features things like trench warfare and airline combat. But the couple of new things, I think, are portending a change in the character of war, uh, be they the mass influence and mass autonomous systems that are being deployed, the ability to gain and sustain 
uh, awareness in the battlefield to a degree we haven't before. It's not transparency and it's not always wisdom, but it's certainly visibility. And what I think that drives, and I think the Ukrainian offensive in the South is a great case study of this, is that many of the ideas, the doctrines and the organisations that we think work in modern warfare are actually half a century old uh, and we need to evolve them, expecting the Ukrainians to breach through minefields with technology that's 50 years old, doctrine that's 70 years old and an environment where you know, you can be seen and brought under fire in minutes was an intellectual failure on the part of NATO and the West. And we can't afford to have those kind of intellectual failures in the future. So, so I mean, the lesson is new ideas and new organisations need to be layered over the top of many of the old aspects of what we're seeing in this war. And there's some pretty careful judgments that will need to be made about that. Troy. Uh, I think Laura and Mick, again, really hit this uh Pretty, pretty well. I would probably reshape the question slightly different and bring in a, a couple of other um, um, events that happened, Nagorno-Karabakh and, and also uh, dating back to uh, 2020, uh, Libya. Um, and, and what I take, a, take from those uh, classrooms, as it were, is this idea of attributable systems. I think we are now in a, a new... Uh, realm where attributable systems will become more and more important. Uh, historically, if you look uh, back, um, the way that we uh, typically have prosecuted war, we had exquisite systems that we protected at all costs, whether you think about this as an uh, uh, aircraft craft carrier or a, a tank or what have you, those are certain systems that we really tried to protect. I think we are in a different realm now where we have systems that are to some degree uh, have some disposability and are, are able to uh, work collaboratively with other systems and the, and the ensemble, the network continues to work even if you lose some. So this whole idea of attributable systems and graceful degradation, I think are a really big um, building blocks that we can leverage as we move forward. And I, I think as we, um, from the work that my office does, there are significant um, investments in science and technology, not only in the US, but around the globe that are starting to move in that direction to be able to realize attributable systems, whether they're uh, aerial systems or ground systems or uh, sea systems that um, you, you have uh, many of them. They're, none of them are as expensive as the, your exquisite system. And so you can lose some of them. And if they're designed in a proper way and integrated properly, then you can, can have the ability to still have collaboration at scale or swarming or things like that and still prosecute the mission while losing a few of the elements that you are, are would leverage to do that. So. These are all great points. And I think in many ways, um, it's important to think about the, the difference in the phrasing of, in the US context, we say lessons learned, but in, for example, the British military and others, and maybe Australia, there's the lessons observed, which yep. means, you know, I didn't actually, um, a lot of these, the question really is, will we implement them in our systems? And actually, we were having a conversation out in the hallway um, related to your last point, Troy, of, you know, you've got an example of the launch of uh, the replicator initiative, but what would it look like? Does it get funded? What's its scale? You yeah. know, so we've, uh, we've observed lessons, but will we actually implement is um, open-ended right now. Um, so with that, I... Uh, um, I'm someone, uh, I'm a worry wart. So uh, make my life worse. Um, what worries you the most when you peer into the future? Uh, so Laura, and you, you have a responsibility. I mean, look, you literally, it's the concerned scientist. So it's not just what concerns the scientist, but what worries you personally the most about the future of technology and conflict? Okay. Um, yeah, a professional concerned person. Um, well, I am definitely concerned about the future. Um, 
and it, sometimes it feels like the future is coming faster than you imagine. I mean, looking looking out at the storms that have just happened this past week, the, the climate emergency is upon us and um, we're seeing enormous disruption. Um, we're going to see misery for our most vulnerable and it's going to come for everyone if, if we don't really do a better job of grappling with this. And that is going to cre inc create incredible pressures with mass migrations. Economic systems are going to be more fragile. So just the, the context for conflict, I think, will be, um, you know, the pressure is ratcheted up as, you know, um, pandemics and wars. Um, uh, of course, um, I spend most of my time thinking about nuclear weapons issues, and, and that is a central concern for me, of course, because we have such a hard time grappling with low risk and high consequence events. Um, and at times in our history, we've our guiding principle has been trying to how do we decenter these weapons, which can not only kill hundreds of millions of people almost immediately, but could threaten billions with climate and economic disruption. Um, but they're again being centered. Um, we have uh, the fraying of arms control agreements and the destruction of that whole um, edifice that has been our been guide rails for decades. Um, we are uh, all almost all of the nuclear weapons powers are refurbishing and expanding their nuclear arsenals and creating new delivery systems, bespoke delivery systems, trying to finesse um, deterrence and increasing the different types of um, weapons that can be used. We're building um, more and more ships with missiles. Now we can do intermediate range missiles and anti-missile systems, and they're going to be uh, moving in the same spaces. Uh, increasing um, the 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 um, supporting technologies like um, using space more more in depth with all of these technologies proliferating um, them and in, you know uh, inviting anti satellite weapon um, development again providing another uh, short tempo use it or lose it type of pressure so I I. I, I think, I guess the question is, what, what are the things we should be doing right now that we wish we had the, in 10 years, we wish we had the guts to do? And some of those things, so I, I'd like that part to be part of the question, which, how should we be thinking about the future and what are we supposed to be doing right now to, to ensure that that looks as good as possible? Awesome. So, Mick, um, you've actually played in, in both these realms of... Um, thinking about the future, how do we adjust to it? But you've also, in a recent book, White Sun War, painted um, one of those scenarios that's quite scary. What would a war uh, in the Pacific look like? So for you personally, um, what do you worry the most? And then let's, let's take um, insight from Laura. What's something we can do to keep your worry from coming true? I think the main one is we don't take seriously the the idea that a the major war could could emerge in the 21st century. I think in the lead up to uh, the war in Ukraine, there were, were a lot of countries and a lot of politicians who didn't take seriously the fact that there are still people out there who think large wars are a, a valid option in the 21st century to achieve their national uh, priorities. And I think that if we just assume that Xi or people like him are rational actors and would never go to war, it makes our life more difficult in deterring them. So we need to take it seriously, which means you need to take seriously uh, your, your deterrence framework because no one wants this to happen. You know, the kind of catastrophe I painted in White Sub War is what I'm trying to prevent. Um, and it's what we should all be trying to prevent. So in some respects, it's an anti-war novel. And if it's read that way, that that's wonderful. So we need to take seriously the fact that large-scale war is still possible. Or theories just aren't true. Humans for 5,000 years have fought and are probably going to fought, fight again in the future. And therefore, we need to invest in deterrence. But we also need to uh, invest in the kind of uh, dialogues that uh, we're seeing the PLA issue at the moment to ensure that there are guide rails and uh, things don't escalate uh, unnecessarily between uh, potential belligerents. Troy. I'd say that perhaps, uh, I'd like to say my, my colleagues here have hit a lot of the points I, I would have hit, but there's uh, a weapon system that is emergent, um, specifically hypersonic weapons um, give me pause. Um, and I think of them, th th there are 
um, three levels of threat. First, speed. We're talking about systems that go at a minimum Mach 5. That's 3,800 miles an hour or faster, combined with the ability to uh, maneuver, which sets them apart from uh, intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles, which also pro go about that fast, but they really, ICBMs uh, travel in a, a, a parabolic uh, trajectory, whereas uh, hypersonic systems are maneuverable and can change direction. And thirdly, uh, one, when they get above about Mach 7 in an oxygen atmosphere, you have ionization of oxygen, um, which a concaminally goes along, um, uh, applies to them this cloak uh, that makes it difficult to be able to sense them. Um, so you can't get, uh, say, an active radar beam through because the, the plasma cloak that surrounds the, the system makes it invisible to radar. So you have a system that's f traveling nearly 4,000 miles, miles an hour, can maneuver, and is hard to detect. Uh, and if you could get that to operate in a collaborative way, that is a, a very um, uh, stark system to contend with. And, and to Laura's point, that um, been demonstrated these types of systems can not only uh, carry uh, conventional uh, warheads, but also nuclear warheads. So that is really a, um, a uh, significant challenge. I'd say that uh, the th after thinking about this a while, I, I think the thing that um, the biggest bang for the buck would probably be in sensing. Is there a way that we can be able to uh, be able to uh, efficiently sense these systems? Um, because that's really the first step in the, the kill chain to be able to know where the system is in order to be able to counter it. So uh, I think that's where the, initially where most of the, the investment and focus ought to be. Awesome. So I think we've got time for uh, a question from the audience. Uh, so if you've got a question, go ahead and um, raise your hand, actually right there in the back, and quickly introduce yourself as well. Hi, uh, I'm Bridget. I'm the program manager for our cybersecurity uh, fellowship here at New America. Um, this is not my area of expertise, but this is something that I've been curious about since my graduate studies. Um, so in the past few years, as kind of Laura touched on, um, we've seen private companies or the private sector kind of wade its way into military operations via technology. So I'd just be interested to hear from you about how that would impact military planning operations innovation. Thanks. Great. So um, let's see. Uh, actually, Laura, why don't you weigh in? I'm going to put you on point on that. But um, uh, also, uh, as well, then we'll go in the same order. So sure. you mentioned, one, the, the problem of having a, um, uh, uh, what adjective you use, mercurial, uh, would be a, a, a mercurial multi-billionaire um, have control over a communications network. Um, what, what else, when we think about the role of the private sector in conflict via technology, is a point of concern? Boy, that's a really good question, Bridget, and I'm interested to hear what my co-panelists say. Um, I think, of course, the other place where the center of gravity is in the commercial space is in AI, um, and they have enormous resources there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's challenging to self-regulate um, and especially for technologies that are, that are moving so quickly and are um, inherently sophisticated and difficult to understand. Um, I think commercial space is a little bit easier because it, it, it's sort of more obvious what it does and how it does it. And it's a matter of investing and innovating and engineering really. But I feel, feel like the AI is a is an edge um, and it could be used to produce as my, as um, Dr. Alexander said, you know, their new novel biological synthetics. It may be great at quickly um, creating new materials that, that could transform industry such as um, uh, room temperature superconductors. So we, we had a tantalizing view of that earlier this year that that could happen. So um, uh, I think, you know, when the center of gravity kind of moves in the commercial space, um, those partnerships with government really have to be in place. So Mick, 
what um, lessons have you taken in terms of the role of the private sector uh, related to conflict? Well, I think it works both ways. It can work for us, but potentially can, can work against us. I mean, we've seen this meshing of civil and military sensors and analytical capability uh, throughout the war in Ukraine. And whether it's uh, using NASA firms or microphones on, on smartphones to track missiles, you know, we've seen this in deeper integration of military and civilian and government uh, collection frameworks. Now, I think there might be some interesting uh, interpretations in law about the participations of civilians in conflict. At some point, we're probably not there yet. But just as we've used it to to find targets, to do analysis, uh, to do battle damage assessment, so might a future adversary use it better than what the Russians have had done. So we, we need to be prepared for that environment where all sources can be meshed and used by an adversary against us, not the traditional military and government sources of information and analysis. Troy. Um, I, I think there's an area that, that I always give me a little concern, and that's uh, electronic components. Um, so, you know, when, when you think about electronic components, uh, integrated circuits and, and things like that, we often uh, acquire them and we integrate them into systems, but understanding where they originated and who actually made it made them um, is, has been a challenge because there really are no secure foundries that I'm aware of that have the ability to have the throughput to really kind of fuel uh, the major uh, militaries in, uh, around the globe. And to, to, to pull that thread a little bit for you, Bridget, uh, is that when those components are made, they may be made by someone with nefarious intent that put components on board that can be engaged, turned off through uh, a backdoor through cyber connectivity uh, that really could co compromise the final systems that are based around them. Um, so really, I, I, I guess a mitigant would be, could we really kind of envision uh, the development of a secure foundry or an ecosystem of secure foundries that would allow us to make those components that we, could, we would then use to, to build the, the systems that we, we leverage? And, and so that's a, where I, I, I think there's this kind of interplay between the um, uh, industry and really kind of national security that you, we, we have to navigate there. Um, really, you know, industry has been the, the real player there because th we, we really just acquire those components and then integrate them. And then we, we trust that they are, are not, that they're sort of clean and pristine mm -hmm. and nothing hidden there. So like so many of the other discussions here, um, we could go on and on, but we actually have to uh, come to a closing point. So I want to thank um, all of you uh, for sharing your insights. And so please join me in a round of applause. To, uh, go to our next panel. Um, in, what new, in what new domains will con conflict occur, which I'm going to moderate? And we have uh, Scott Stapp, who's Vice President of Capabilities and All Domain Integration, which he'll explain what that means, uh, at Norfolk Grumman. And we also have uh, Lauren Zabirek, Senior Advisor at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Both of them are um, veterans of the US Air Force, and uh, we look forward to their comments. So let me start with uh, Lauren. So, the question here we're trying to answer is what, what new domains will conflict occur? Um, and obviously in cyber, um, I mean, in the sense that conflict has been going on for some period of time. There was a time, I think even Lee and Panetta used the phrase of a potential cyber 11. Is that plausible? Uh, thank you for the question and it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, Peter. So I think what we've seen over the last, we'll say decade, decade and a half at this point, we're, we're in this sort of environment of endemic cyber conflict. It's ambient. Um, we're lucky in that nothing, you know, totally destructive has happened at this point. Um, but 
I think most experts would probably say this concept of a cyber 9-11 is probably um, a little bit hyperbole and probably doesn't really fit the nature of cyber very much, right? Um, the way I like to think about cyber is, is not necessarily a place, but more like a tool, right? It's a tool in the toolkit for adversaries, as well as, as criminals and, and other um, uh, users as well, for their gain, rather, whether it is financial gain or whether it is um, adversarial gain. So adversaries or criminals will use it to, um, to like I said, to, to get what they are after, whether it's uh, diplomatic, military, financial, et cetera. So I think it's sort of the wrong analogy. Um, but that is not to say that you know, real harms are not being uh, caused by the use of cyber in, in a malicious way. Scott, um, so at Northrop, um, who, uh, talk us through what a plausible scenario would be for some kind of space-based conflict, uh, pre presumably with China. China is your, the, when you think about your job, is it mostly about China? Um, I, I think that's, uh, I wouldn't say Northrop, I'd say the department is very clearly focused uh, on China. Secretary Kendall today from the Air Force was down at AFA talking just about that and, and everybody's probably heard that where he goes, China, China, China. I mean, he just, that, that is definitely a focus for the Air Force. I think as a, as a defense contractor uh, for Northrop Grumman, I mean, our focus is what our customers' focuses are. Uh, I, think, I think the hope is currently that there, there will not be a conflict uh, in space, but you can't presume that won't happen. I mean, it is interesting that, that the 1967, you know, Outer Space Treaty, which was, hey, space is going to be a peaceful domain, it, it ain't that long. And that was when space was really not that accessible. And you look at it just over the last 15 years, how much more accessible space is, whether it's commercial, whether it's our adversaries, and we were talking earlier, just very, very much like the sea domain. If you go back 1,500 years, there wasn't conflict on the oceans, right? I mean, it wasn't until you had much more uh, proliferated access to the sea, lines of communications, commerce, everything else, that you started to see conflict in that domain. As you see space really start to become an economic lever, uh, you start to see it actually uh, be involved in other domains of fighting to actually supporting the terrestrial domain. You, you, you run the chance that you're going to see a conflict in space. So you have to look at how do you actually address that. And systems used to be, uh, it used to be very expensive to get to space, that the, the, the rocket itself cost as much or more than whatever you were putting up. That is no longer the case. Launch to space is actually very economical now. So you can start proliferating larger numbers of satellites rather than having them all clustered into a single capability. And you were, I think you're going to see this to go the same way as you have in other domains. Um, question for you, Lauren, which is, you know, CISA, your agency, <clears throat> is, um, I think there are 2,400 employees or something. I mean, it's, uh, you, you have, but obviously the problem is much bigger than anything you can do as a single agency. I mean, you, you're highly reliant on the private sector to do what they're supposed to do. So, um, and, you know, not a, if you try and protect everything, you're going to end up protecting nothing. So, so in the hierarchy of things that your agency considers critical infrastructure, what, it, what, what are they? And, and how do you protect them given the fact that you're, in a sense, exhorting people to do the right thing? You're not, you can't find them, I don't think, for doing the wrong thing, or you, the tools are more persuasion. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned critical infrastructure. I think a lot of people know that there are 16 sectors, and CIS is actually sort of overseeing a number of those. Um, I don't think a lot of people do know they're 16. Okay, I mean, yeah. you may know that, but I mean, so <laughs> for the audience, what are those, you know, what, what are the top things you're trying to protect? Well, some of the most vulnerable are looking at the water and wastewater sector, the healthcare sector, K through 12. Those are some of the, um, our, our director, Jen Easterly's priorities over the last year or so. But things like manufacturing, transportation, really the things that we rely on as people for our everyday lives. It runs our lives. And, and if those things um, suffer particular harms, you know, uh, I'll, I'll say for instance today, my flight was delayed three hours because of an alleged software upgrade, right? So, you know, obviously a huge sounds, it, but it's an upgrade. I love that. Not uh, a downgrade. Allegedly. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, obviously minor inconvenience to me, but what happens sort of in the aggregate? 
aggregate, right? That, that's a huge thing. Or let's look at colonial pipeline in our energy sector. I think the, the attack on, on that particular entity, um, I think showed a lot of people of, of the nature of the harm that could happen because it really impacted everyday people. They weren't able to get gas, right? So to your point, we do rely on the private sector to hopefully do the right thing. Now, I will say this, that I think we're, we're sort of, we, we try to give them the tools that they can, but at the end of the day, the, the organizations within the critical, critical infrastructure sectors simply don't have, I would say with the exception of maybe the financial sector, maybe some parts of the transportation sector, um, they don't have the resources to, to prepare themselves or, or, or defend themselves against very well-resourced, very sophisticated actors. And so what my team at CIS is trying to do, and this is also a, um, a high priority for the director, is really drive this initiative called Secure by Design. And that is in line with the cyber, National Cybersecurity Strategy from the Office of the National Cyber Director, Pillar 3, which states that we need to start moving the responsibility for security from all of us, right, the people who are, who are not as well equipped to, to deal with that to the manufacturers, right, the, the, the organizations that can, from the beginning, from the design stage, really try to um, make their products as secure and safe as possible. And just to clarify, so right now, when there's a so-called zero day or sort of a back door into, right now you have to patch it yourself. I mean, you get a message from Apple, uh, you know, so there's something out there. Yep. But so what you're trying to do is to put that responsibility back on the um, software developers, et cetera, yes. and make so that we're not always just repatching or missing the patches. Exactly. So think of patching is something that we are referring to as a, as a soft cost, right? Left of boom. You're investing money and time in patching these uh, pieces of software. And it's not just one, right? In organizations, they have an entire stack of software takes a lot of time and resources to go through that. And then inevitably, right, maybe you miss a patch like we were talking about, you know, before with uh, Experian. Um, that's a problem, right? And again, in the aggregate, that results in this residual business risk, which then, of course, really adds up to this, this huge national security delta. And so what we're saying is, hey, manufacturers, there are things that you can do, you know, if you think of a vulnerability as a defect, right? to test for defects in a way that other manufacturers that have embraced um, uh, quality by design, right? You so mentioned experience. So mm -hmm. look, I mean, for those who don't recall, um, the Chinese, uh, it's a public record, uh, took, uh, I think it was 175 million records, uh, basically half of the <laughs> records of half the population of the United States and, and, and stole them. I think one approach to this that I, as you were talking about, like can litigation by people who are affected might actually be better than just you saying you should do the right thing. Well, traditionally, uh, software and you know probably to an extent hardware uh, manufacturers have really um, shielded themselves from liability. Um, all the contracts that you get right when you download okay. software, right, that basically says we are not liable. You're licensing the software. So, so yeah, typically, um, or traditionally rather, that, that's been an issue. And so I think the courts may be starting to think a little bit differently. Um, but of course, you know, with the, with the National Cybersecurity Strategy, you know, the Office of the National Cyber Director, um, you know, talked about, you know, looking at the liability issue too. So, so that, is, that aspect, regulation, that falls outside of CIS's purview, but, um, you know, that might be coming. Scott, um how is AI um, changing the defense and space business in general? Uh, that, that's a great, how is it changing everything in general, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think one of the things you see, one of the things you're gonna see in the DOD is, is the DOD typically is looking for predictable results whenever they do anything. I mean, the, the, one, the one thing with the military is you train, 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 you want everything to be reflex in nature, you wanna understand what that outcome looks like, and, and they struggle with uh, again, I was a tester uh, at one point during my career, and you want to have very predictable results. When you start to look at AI, I think predictive AI, there is a ton of opportunity space uh, within the DoD. When you start looking at 
you know, cybersecurity, when you start putting AI into computer systems who can look at anomalous behavior and strange things that have not occurred, whether it's insider threat or intrusions, AI does an amazing job at that, right? When you start looking from a DoD perspective of uh, looking through whether it's imagery or signals and have an AI actually diligently go through that, it can, it can actually do that in a much uh, faster and cleaner way. When you start talking about generative AI and where systems are gonna start making decisions on their own, you, you, see, you already see it in the commercial side. You see people very uh, reluctant on how fast they wanna push that on, on the, on the, in the military and the DoD side. I think you're going to see that go even slower because what you're dealing with is it's, it's different if you're dealing with a business and it makes a bad decision and you lose money. In the DoD, it's about lives. And if, it, if, if AI makes a decision to do something that costs lives that is either civilian or unintended, uh, it, it will not go well. So I think the department is going to go very slow uh, in generative AI. Well, you know, I'm old enough to remember that when the U.S. Air Force, you know, always said that uh, there'd always be a human in the loop, uh, in it, you know, when it came to the kill chain, uh, when we said, you know, the drone program really took off in 2008, 2009, that was sort of a mantra. Now, the Chinese obviously have autonomous drones in swarms that are governed by AI. They don't seem to really care about that issue. Uh, and now we have public reports. I mean, there's been a lot of reports recently about AI-powered sort of wingmen or, right, I, right. you know, so what is that, how, how do you keep the human in the loop? I mean, I understand how you might, but if the Chinese are already past that, I mean, do you put yourself at a disadvantage by trying to maintain that human in the loop? Yes, so, I mean, you do. And, yeah. and, and the, I think the difference of with that is much more cultural than it is anything else. I think. I think when you look at some of our adversaries, their risk calculus is much higher. Uh, their, um, their value on human life is different than ours and how you look at that problem set. I think for us, when you look at autonomous systems, I think we're gonna have to get used to having what we call uh, man on the loop, not in the loop. Uh, things are gonna happen way too fast that you can do that. I think in critical decisions, and I think, I think we're gonna have to have fully autonomous systems in some cases. If, if you were to look at a, a very large incoming raid of missiles and you have a battle manager and operator, he can't make those decisions on how he parses weapons to what's coming in. He's gonna have to turn that over to a system that automatically makes those decisions. But those are, again, I, I would say that is more predictive AI that they're gonna use and it will just do the mathematical calculations very fast and what's happening and as things change, it, it will adapt. I think anytime it's gonna make a critical decision um, that, that that can have larger or what I call strategic consequences. You're gonna have a man on the loop, basically hitting a verify and making sure those decisions are, are made correctly. Yeah, you share that view? Um, I, I actually want to sort of take that and bridge it a little bit with the cyber aspect of it. Um, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the, the China's cyber capabilities and the, and the theft of you know a lot of data and you know especially what we were talking about earlier um, a couple of years ago and I think he probably still you know continues to talk about this but the FBI director Ray you know talked about how you know this intellectual property theft is really the represents some of if not the largest transfer of wealth in human history and if you're a an adult more likely than not your data has been stolen. Um, uh, by China, and so to bridge that with with this concept, right? What, you know, why is that data? Why is that wealth being stolen? You know, for to develop these particular capabilities, right? Um, and so, you know, not not only from a data aspect, but from you know the the systems themselves as well. So I think that's a, an important sort of bridging there. Well, and I'll add one thing. I mean, I, I think this does get into norms of behavior. I mean, what you'll see is, 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 is there's a whole bunch of things you could do with generative AI. We, we are just, we're, we're actually holding ourselves back from doing some of those things. But if you look at some of the things that have occurred recently, just making the news, right? Uh, Chinese cruisers cutting in front of US cruisers. That is not normal. That is not what we'd consider norms of operations of, of the sea. And what they're doing is they're changing the norms. 
when you see um, whether it's the Russians or the Chinese buzzing aircraft, cutting in front of them, doing that, we call that unsafe operations. But the question is, for us, are, are they changing the norm? Are, are, are we going to have to figure out how to adapt to a new norm? Because it's unlikely they're going to come backwards and adapt to our norm. And so that is going to cause a tension over time of how fast we are willing to change and look at the culture and norms we have in military operations to adapt to that. Because otherwise, what you've done is you've ceded the advantage. And that the odds of an accident seem to be going up pretty high, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's a pilot accident or a ship accident or a... Um, what, in, Lauren, in terms of um, it, when you look at the, we talked about the hierarchy of things you're trying to defend. Mm -hmm. what are, what's the hierarchy of the threats? Obviously, you have, um, uh, you know, you have these malicious groups who are doing ransomware that have names like <laughs> Our Evil, which is a great kind of name. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and then you have states. So when you, at, at your job, uh, how do, what's the hierarchy of states that are involved in this sort of attacking the United States? And what's the hierarchy of on states? I don't know if I can put them into a hierarchy. I think you have your, you know, the group of, of state actors that, you know, are typically implicated in cyber attacks, which are, you know, Russia, China, North Korea, and, and to an extent, Iran. Um, and then, of course, you have a number of non-state actors, uh, criminal groups. And, you know, I don't think you can say, you know, which one is worse or, or anything like that. There are different capabilities and there are different interests on them. But there's still harm to real people being caused. Um, I mentioned the Colonial Pipeline incident. Um, you know, we hear about ransomware attacks every day, right? Businesses, I think in, in 2022, the cost that was reported was in the tens of billions of dollars, right? But also, let's look at livelihoods as well. There was um, a... Uh, a ransomware attack on a hospital in 2019. And this is, of course, not the only ransomware attack on a hospital. There's been many. We might not have heard of all of them because they're, you know, they haven't been uh, required to report it. Um, and, and perhaps they were able to recover you know, within days, weeks, maybe months. Um, but there was a, an attack in 2019 that led to the death of a baby girl. Right. So real harms are being incurred through cyber attacks. Um, so it, you know, to me, I, I, I'm not necessarily saying, okay, state versus non-state. It's, again, a tool being used for whatever gain, but also there is collateral damage. Speaking of collateral damage, um, you know, there seem to be, a, there, there are a lot of satellites in the domain that you're mostly focused on, which is space. Elon Musk, I think, controls 4,000 of them. And then are, you, are you concerned that there is too, mi too many of these satellites sort of in low orbit that were kind of setting up a, a problem that goes beyond simply like some future conflict with China? Um, so, so I will tell you, I, 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 I personally am not. And, and the reason I will say that is because space is super big. And uh, we had kind of talked about this earlier, which was it, it, go look at any FAA map and look at how many airplanes are in the sky at any one time. And they're all operating between 20 and 40,000 feet. And all, I mean, sometimes you look at the map and it's just populated, right? It's just crazy. You look at the satellites and, and, and they're talking about operating between, you know, 200 nautical miles and 22,000 nautical miles. Um, multiple different orbitologies, all sorts of stuff. When you really look at, and, and there, were, there was an analysis we did in the department that I had done with CAPE, because we were looking at, at, at how close do you need to track uh, different objects to do conjunction analysis. And what you found out is, is we're constantly moving things around, because you, you don't have a huge, there's a lot of error cones around those. Well, what we found out is there, there's about a million uh, pieces of debris up there that are of a size that can destroy anything. Right? I mean, there's, there is a ton, and, and, and this is not from us. This is just natural debris, micrometeoroids, all these kind of things. There's about a million pieces plus up there, all that are operating around our satellites, yet we aren't seeing major impacts. The, 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 the number of satellites we have and the likelihood that you'll have a conjunction, and, and again, you, you, you may over time, but it's, it's lower than what we're seeing currently, I think, in the air systems. And again, open, it's, it's a big space. I want to open it up to questions, if anybody has a question from the audience. So we have a mic. 
except for rooster. <laughs> Could eventually be perceived to be by the adversary. And they're two different things. I'm just curious as to what your thoughts might be on that. All right. So is that Lauren or me? Because I, I will tell you, from, from my perspective, I think that's a major problem, right? The department, I mean, what, what, you're, you're right. What the, what the Chinese are looking to do in an adversary or military conflict is to change our perception of what occurs, right? And, and to me, this is where it gets into interesting in the AI world, right? Everybody's seen when you look at deep learning algorithms where you, you see a picture and, and, and an AI algorithm will tell you it's a giraffe. You change two, a couple, three pixels, you still see it as a giraffe and it calls it you know, a polar bear, right? It is, is the ability to go in, if they, if they have our data and are smart on how we are using algorithms to use our data and can, and it can actually modify it so that the algorithms read that data completely differently, we're not gonna have humans doing this, right? I mean, we're gonna have machines doing that. That, that is a real problem and a real threat for us. And, and, and figuring out, which goes, gets back to whether it's uh, secure by design or zero trust, understanding when people are intruding and what they're doing is probably the most critical piece because yeah, yeah I think from the department side, you're gonna have to assume people are in your networks. You're just gonna have to assume it. Okay. Yeah, and, and I'll just say, you know, from CISA's point, point of view where we are trying to buy down that risk, right, for the nation, part of that is making sure that our systems and our data and our, our um, you know, our devices are secure, you know, because it, as I was saying before, um, you know, it's, it's about real people, it's about harms to people, not, not just data, but, uh, you know, I think you just, you know, really explain the, the potential harms of not securing that data. Colonel Willie, do you have a question? I just wanted to add that question came from Lieutenant General Bob Schmidl, uh, who's also associated with ASU and was instrumental in setting up, in setting up Cyber Command. And this is Colonel Dennis Willie, who is our first Chief of Staff of the Army fellow uh, and now works for Space Command. Thank you, Peter. I know that you're running close on time. Uh, with respect to the space uh, conjunction problem, you're, you're right. There haven't been a lot of public discussions about breakups and things like that, or, uh, but the number of objects has gone up almost double that we do track. And, and but what I, you, you talked about the economic aspect of it earlier. And mm -hmm. so uh, what we're witnessing is de facto real estate by altitude being occupied by these different constellations, SpaceX and Starlink first, and all of the other ones that the FCC approves. Uh, so in the world of conflict at the economic level, uh, any thoughts about how creating this de facto real estate, uh, which no sovereign country is supposed to have real estate in space. Uh, so any interested in thoughts on that? Thanks, Peter, for the time. I, I, I think that's a great question. I think as we start to look at uh, whether it's uh, Starlink or Kuiper or any of these things that have just massively proliferated our track. I think that does start to create some issues, especially if, if they are not assigned uh, extremely different altitude regimes, right? Those kind of things. But, but when you start talking about, and again, we're, we're going to see this when you start talking about economics, who owns the moon, right? I just heard that, you know, somebody declared they own the moon, right? China, there's, I mean, it's, it, it's going to get very interesting over time of, a new domain, and it's like a law of the sea, right? I mean, at some point we decided that 12 nautical miles was international limits, the rest in, you know, or is, 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 is sovereignty, and then the rest is international. There has not been this huge view on how we're doing space. And, and, and the issue gets to what you were talking about is, is when we were talking about what we can do in cyber. Yeah, we could go in and hack all sorts of stuff in cyber, and you could you know, hack hospitals and other stuff, but we have this issue called law of armed conflict that, that we, we, we tell ourselves there are certain value systems we cannot do. When you talk about the Outer Space Treaty, we said it's for peaceful purposes and we're not gonna actually have conflict. Well, China's not a signatory on that. I mean, a lot of these, so, so, so who, do we handcuff ourselves and as norms start to change, how do you address 
what that new world looks like. So if you want to say, uh, no, we need to have some discussions internationally and in space on who owns what pieces, you're back to the UN. I mean, I mean, I, not a shout out to the UN, but it, 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 that, that, how fast that works and how effective that works is a big question mark, which gets back to the likelihood of conflict in space grows because you can't develop a common set of norms and you get into a conflict of, no, that's mine, no, that's mine, and the next thing you know, they're at it. I want to thank our panelists very much. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Peter. Appreciate it. Thanks, thank you. My name is Joanna Naples Mitchell. I'm a human rights lawyer in New York City. I work at an organization called the Zomia Center, where I run a program that advocates for civilians harmed in U.S. military operations in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. Zomia is a word for a non-state space, an ungoverned or semi-governed territory, like a region with active armed conflict. Our founders are a group of journalists, academics, and researchers who have spent years working in these kinds of spaces. In their work, they observe significant gaps in service delivery, aid, and in knowledge. They founded Zomia to help address this. Today, Zomia has a staff of more than 170 people, we run humanitarian, public health, research, and advocacy projects in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. We are closely affiliated with both ASU and New America. I direct Zomia's Redress Program, which we founded in June 2022. We founded this program to address the fact that the U.S. government has multiple funds to help civilians harmed in conflict that are not reaching intended beneficiaries. Tens of thousands of civilians have lost loved ones, limbs, and homes in U.S. and coalition airstrikes in recent years. Since 2020, Congress has appropriated $3 million a year for the Pentagon to make condolence payments after killing or injuring civilians in military operations. Condolence payments were common in the military's ground operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. They also may be known as salatia or ex gratia payments, there are various terms, um, but they petered off as the military shifted to air operations. They were token amounts of a few hundred to a few thousand dollars, but they were something. Congress passed this new $3 million funding authorization to encourage the Pentagon to start making these payments again. Yet the Pentagon made no payments in 2020, and only one, a $5,000 payment to one family in Afghanistan in 2021. Similarly, for the last several years, USAID has received $7.5 million a year through its Marla Ruzika Fund, to spend on projects to help civilians in Iraq. This fund was recently expanded to $10 million a year to be divided among projects in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and Yemen. This fund was named after Marla Ruzika, a young woman who founded the Center for Civilians in Conflict and was tragically killed by a car bomb in Iraq. Yet it has been unclear in recent years how civilians in Iraq have been helped by these funds or how outside organizations can even refer cases to USAID for consideration. We founded the Redress Program to address this gap. We've taken on the cases of families in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan who were harmed by U.S. military operations, advocating for acknowledgement and assistance for them and for accountability more broadly. The program started just as the Secretary of Defense announced the military's new Civilian Harm Mitigation and Response Action Plan, known as the CHIMRAP, in August 2022, which responds to two decades of civil society documentation and advocacy for greater protection of civilians and accountability for harm. So we've been able to bring the perspectives of the families we're representing into discussions with the Pentagon on how its processes can better address these families' needs and demands. Before I speak more about the program and what we've done, I wanna take a step back. I have mentioned we're building on two decades of civil society advocacy. We work closely with organizations like the Center for Civilians in Conflict and Air Wars. We also owe a great debt to some ASU affiliates, specifically the journalists Azmat Khan and Anand Gopal, both of whom have worked at ASU, co-authored a 2017 New York Times investigation into a U.S.-led coalition airstrike that killed the family of an Iraqi man named Basim Razo. They visited the sites of about 150 airstrikes in Iraq and found that one in five strikes had resulted in a civilian death. This was a rate 31 times the rate acknowledged by the coalition. It turns out coalition airstrikes were far less precise than the military claimed. 
This investigation catalyzed a series of changes from the Pentagon and Congress, including the $3 million annual fund for condolence payments I mentioned before. Since then, Anand co-founded the Zomia Center, the organization where I work. Osmat went on to do future New York Times reporting that helped catalyze the Pentagon's new civilian harm mitigation plan and won her the Pulitzer Prize. And Basim Razo, the man they profiled, has been an amazing advocate for other families harmed by coalition operations in Iraq, and we've been lucky to partner with him in the Redress program at the Zomia Center. Now, I've talked about how we got here, why this program exists, what it's intended to do, but where are we now? Over the last year, we've taken on the cases of more than 30 families in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. In cases the Pentagon has already deemed credible, meaning they acknowledge they killed or, or injured civilians, we've submitted requests for condolence payments. Those requests are all still pending, some since June 2022. We've also collected new evidence of civilian harm from families, journalists, and other civil society organizations, and we've submitted that evidence to Central Command, asking them to reinvestigate those strikes. Families have approached us asking to take on their cases for different reasons. Some want acknowledgement for the harm done to them. Some want answers. They want to know specifically which coalition government dropped the bomb on their home. Others are facing high medical bills after being injured in a strike, and the money would do a great deal. Still others have lost a breadwinner, and even a token payment of a few thousand dollars would help them get by. When we can at Zomia, we try to support these families as they wait patiently for a response from the military. We're working to stand up a program now to provide more medical and other forms of individualized support in the coming months to these families. We're hoping it can be a model that other entities, including the U.S. government, might be able to scale up in the future. Even as the U.S. media focuses on Russia's devastating invasion of Ukraine, the U.S. military has continued to come under fire for its targeting of civilians by mistake. Most recently, after a strike in northwest Syria in May, appeared to have mistaken a shepherd tending his sheep for a high-level al-Qaeda operative. The results of that investigation have not yet been released. Within the Redress Program, we try to situate our efforts within larger conversations around reparations and accountability, including Ukraine. The Pentagon is now considering how to improve its responses to civilian harm, both individual and community-based, and is looking to other countries for examples. The Pentagon's concern is forward-looking, which means thinking not only about current modes of warfare, but new ones, as we enter a new age of potential new great power conflict. At Zomia, we work to convene other NGOs and survivors working in these and other contexts to talk about what redress looks like, what works and what doesn't, what hasn't worked and what has. The unfortunate reality is that the U.S. military will continue harming civilians by mistake, even if the mode of warfare continues to change and we need to keep holding them accountable. The Redress Program was founded to help civilians access a $3 million Pentagon fund intended for them. We're still waiting to see how Central Command responds to our requests. But I will say this, we have developed over the last year and change a, develop a relationship of trust with the military. The evidence we've shared and the cases we've raised are being taken seriously. So I am optimistic about what we hear in the coming months. And I'm hopeful that we can continue to work with others to help develop better models that make these processes more accessible to civilians themselves. The military owes them that and so much more. Our next panel is a keynote conversation uh, led by or moderated by Candace Rondeau, who's been a part of the Future Security Initiative for many years. She's Senior Director of Future Frontlines and Planetary Politics here at New America. And she's a professor of practice in the Future Security Initiative at Arizona State University. She'll be speaking with Ambassador Oksana Markova of Ukraine. Thank you. Um, well, Ambassador, thank you. And, and, and welcome to, to New America. This is your first time. Yes, uh, first exciting. time here physically. That's right. Uh, virtually, we've had many moments, but also you and I have had a few moments here and there. So I'm excited for this conversation. Um, I wanted to introduce you, if you don't mind, to, uh, to our audience uh, here uh, at, at New America and online. Uh, for those of you who don't know her, um, I would say that over the last two years, uh, two and a half years really, since her appointment as Ukraine's uh, ambassador to the United States, uh, Oksana Makarova has been one of the most active and energetic diplomats on the circuit in Washington, D.C. And I really count myself as very lucky uh, to have been able to sat across the table from you. Uh, on many occasions to talk about 
um, the future of Ukraine, um, how to respond to this uh, war of aggression that Russia is, is waging against your country. Um, I've met a lot of diplomats uh, in, my, in, my, in my time. Um, and I have to say, very few have impressed me as much as you, uh, in large part because, you know, not only do you work tirelessly for Ukraine's interests, but you really are working in one of the toughest towns in the world to be a diplomat. Um, I don't envy anybody uh, coming into Washington uh, for the first time trying to figure out how it works, because uh, we all struggle. <laughs> Those of us who live here struggle with it. Um, but you, you have really mastered the arcane art of uh, navigating the State Department, the Pentagon, uh, the White House. I have seen you throw out a first pitch at the National <laughs> Stadium, and now you've got a pretty good arm, I'd say. Actually, <laughs> pretty impressive. Um, I was trying not to embarrass my son. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did well. You did well. <laughs> uh, but prior to your time here, uh, you were also uh, at the Ministry of Finance uh, from 2015 to 2020, uh, first Deputy Minister and Government uh, Commissioner on Investments, and then uh, since 2018 as Minister of Finance. Uh, you know about money, apparently. Uh, and you have degrees in environmental science from the uh, Kyiv Mohyla Academy in Ukraine, uh, an, MFA, uh, an MPA, sorry, in uh, public finance uh, from Indiana University, corn huskers, let's go. Um, and you also have a head for numbers. Uh, I have seen that also at work in some of our conversations uh, and science. And I think you know a lot about what it takes to run a business, uh, having spent 17 years uh, in the private equity field. Um, so you, I think you also have a sense of what's going to happen next in terms of reconstruction, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So um, again, thank you for coming. Uh, thanks for making the time. Uh, our time is unfortunately limited. I'd love to stay up here all day. Um, but I want to start out with, um, I think, one of the big challenges that's probably on everybody's mind here. Um, you know, Ukraine is fighting a war. The defense uh, alone must cost who knows how many billions, right? Um, but we also know that there is just a huge reconstruction need, uh, ongoing and in the future. Uh, and I think one of the biggest questions most recently has been around uh, the need for reconstruction in the area of, of grain exports uh, and production um, and, and where we're going to go next with that. So I'd, one, I'd like to just ask you sort of, what is your impression of you know, what happened with um, uh, the Black Sea, uh, Black sea uh, Grain Initiative in terms of its impact uh, on Ukraine's export capacity? Um, and so what's Ukraine's perspective on you know, how to kind of bring that to back together or um, you know, move forward? Thank you. Thank you, Candice, and thank you for having me. It's, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to have this discussion. And uh, uh, thank you for keeping on the agenda, something that is not only important for us in Ukraine, but actually has a global meaning. And the result of this war and, you know, hopefully, uh, the, the, the victory of Ukraine soon in this war is going to be a prerequisite of all of us, all countries that have the same values, but also countries that want to deliver better to their citizens uh, to restore as soon as possible the supply chains, to, to address the food security needs, energy security needs. And I think food security and in general the agricultural uh, issues that you just uh, mentioned are key issues. First, the key issues for Ukraine. Ukraine has been a very heavily uh, agricultural country. And when I say agricultural, it's not just growing, but it's food processing, it's, it's all the value chain. We own 30% of the global black uh, soil, you know, the best type of soil for the, for, for, for the growth. And actually the productivity gain that could happen in that field is huge. This is something that before the full-fledged war started, we wanted to develop as one of the key advantages of Ukraine. We are top five exporters of the majority of crops from uh, wheat to barley. We're number one, used to be number one in sunflower oil. We are very high on honey. Uh, so we can, we can feed the world. And once called the breadbasket of, of Europe, we can definitely be a global breadbasket. Now, Russia specifically, in addition to the aggressive war, in addition to their war crimes, uh, horrific war crimes against civilians, women, children, in addition to just, you know, having this unjust war, they specifically target the food. So they destroy the grain storages, they destroy the port facilities, they block the Black Sea. The only reason Ukraine 
is not able to deliver the food which we grow for so many regions, especially for Middle East and Asia, especially for African countries. Uh, we cannot do it simply because of the Russian actions. Now, with the help of UN and Turkey, for, uh, for some time, they were able to broker this uh, grain initiative, which uh, Russia agreed, but then sabotaged, of course, every month. You know, they were trying to delay the ship inspections. They were trying to, to scare the, sh the, the ship uh, companies, you know. So it wasn't going perfect even when it was there. But Ukraine always stick to what we wanted to do, you know, to get the grain, to get everything out so that we can, and in addition to just selling it, we even donated, you know, we have this program called Grain from Ukraine, where we donated grain, and other countries, U.S., through the USAID, actually helped to pay for the shipments so that we can donate it to countries in need. So right now, we are in a situation when Russia decided to stop it and block it, they're trying to create or put out all kinds of unreasonable additional demands. We are ready to continue, of course, but it looks like, uh, you know, Russians really would like to weaponize the food again. Now, we are trying to export as much as we can through the land borders using other ports. That's why you see during the past uh, weeks increased attacks on Odessa, Odessa region, closer to the Romanian border, that's they're trying to prevent any type of shipment of the food, which will affect not only the shipment of what we have in the storages, but also the harvesting, because we are in the process of harvesting, which is, I think, remarkable that Ukrainian farmers uh, have been able to plant, care, and harvest now uh, the, the products uh, in the situation when they are not only under constant attacks, but we are also one of the most mined countries now. The unexploded ordinance, not only in the residential areas or mines, but also in the, in the field. So, uh, look, you know, we will do whatever we can. Soon there will be again another General Assembly of the United Nations. This issue is going to be discussed, of course, and raised by Ukraine. We are trying to communicate with all of our friends and allies, especially in, you know, what people call the Global South you know, essentially saying we have to be very vocal, we have to press on Russia, we have to tell them that we know who is behind this, and uh, they have to stop not only this aggressive war against Ukraine, but they have to stop threatening half of the globe with, with the food crisis, because it's serious. Yeah, it is extremely serious. I mean, as you were talking, I was reflecting on um, a long ago visit to uh, the Museum of the History of the Holodomor, mm. uh, which is a remarkable um, place in, in Kiev. Uh, very striking if you've never been there. I will just tell you it, it lies uh, kind of on this open uh, sort of uh, square where there are tremendous monuments and, and historical uh, museums uh, of great value. But the Holodomor Museum to me is interesting just in the context of food security, the weaponization of food, uh, this constant refrain of, of Russia to return again and again uh, to the food as the weapon uh, mm -hmm. historically is, is um, well, it's, it's tragic, uh, but also uh, I think it should be a lesson to us all that actually uh, as the, you know, the conflict continues, uh, we should just expect that to continue on some level uh, from Russia. Um, so there are some, you know, there are some challenges ahead, as you say. Uh, I know that other people are going to also have questions about um, just kind of the humanitarian crisis, because of mm -hmm. course this relates uh, not just to food security, but human security. And um, I, again, just want to remark on how st struck I was. Many war zones, you name them, with the exception of Iraq, I think I've been to all of them. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I'm just curious to sort of, for me, it was interesting to see how well the civilian response um, was sort of coordinated. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the humanitarian situation now. Mm -hmm. Um, what you might predict for the future, the winter is coming up. Um, what's, what's needed? What's, uh, what are the challenges that you see? Well, yes, and the, you, you, you noted the Museum of Holodomor, which is you know, striking that this year is the 90 years mark of that tragedy when Russians denied food, took all the food, and people were dying from hunger. And this is, this is probably the most cruel uh, you know, this and children 
when you live in the country where literally food grows everywhere and, and, and to create artificial hunger in the place which was the source of food for so many neighbors, not only for, for itself, is a very cynical and very cruel uh, you know, war crime. But again, not surprising what we see now because unfortunately we have a history of war crimes of Russians, whether it's Russian Federation, Soviet Union, or Russian Empire against Ukrainians. But with regard to the humanitarian situation, on the one hand, it's a very unique, I would say, war because I don't think we will find many wars when the government continued to execute its functions and never stopped it, not even for a day. So yes, where it was under occupation, even there our mayors tried to execute their functions and be with people and try to deliver food and organize something. That's why so many of our mayors have been kidnapped by, by Russians, tortured or even killed. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially in the areas which they occupied and which they stay occupied. But in general, all the areas where we have the control, and as soon as we liberate, there is Ukrainian government there, both national and local. And all the society, and that's another key element, you know, this, the civil society that work together with the government. So we are trying to address all these challenges with the help that we are receiving from the U.S., but that's why, you know, for the first time, actually, in our 32 years history, U.S. is providing us with the budget, direct budget support, mm -hmm. the grand direct budget support. And this money are actually humanitarian money. They used to pay the salaries to, to uh, educators. They used to support the IDPs. They used to, to provide the basic needs for people. And it's done by the active government. Our banking system never stopped working during the war. During this war, Ukrainians, especially when there was, the Russians were advancing at the beginning and occupying, people were actually putting money on their accounts yeah. and throwing their cards and trying to move to the territory which Ukraine controls because they knew that that's how it, it will be kept safe. Our digital system, you know, DIA, uh, which we have on our phones, so we don't, you don't need to have passport or driver license with you. You have it all in your phone. And that also allows us to communicate directly and to send money directly to people through this app, essentially governmental app. And we have more than 20 million Ukrainians that are communicating with the government like that. So this is unique that we are trying to use the digitalization, the, the innovations, and the government is adapting to this situation. On the other hand, of course, it's a humanitarian crisis of massive proportions. So yes, we're able to do and to use the help that we are receiving from the U.S. and other partners to, to utilize it. But then anything you look, not all of our schools have bomb shelters. Not all of them had. And we need that in order for kids to continue their education. The majority of our kids are behind in their vaccination schedules, of course. Uh, the majority uh, of people with a very like rare or the diseases that require daily care, you know, the, the different type of cancers, the people who require, uh, who are on the uh, different type of daily supports like uh, dialysis or something like this. They cannot get it. And uh, not only under occupation, uh, under occupation it's, it's a total disaster. That's why people are killed and, and tortured and not have the access to basic needs. But even in the places where, uh, you know, either close to the front lines or everywhere, the need is pretty much in every sector, whether it's healthcare or education or transportation. And plus, not to mention, every day, Russia is trying to shell the infrastructure. Russia is trying to attack civilian objects, but also others. Uh, there are more people that are killed or wounded. We have uh, an extreme number of people who lost their limbs. And it's not only the, our brave warriors, but it's also civilians throughout. And of course, preparing now for the winter, we remember what happened last winter when Russians specifically targeted the energy system in order to create the blackouts and to create the situation when either there will be additional waves of uh, refugees because you cannot stay on them. I mean, unfortunately, Ukraine has cold winters. And uh, when you don't have the electricity or energy supply, it's not just about cold. You don't have the, the water supply, you don't have sewage, you don't have any other basic needs, and that's, that's a very, very uh, difficult situation.
However, and I just came back from Kyiv five days ago, I was there when Secretary Blinken visited, the resolve of Ukrainian people is still there. I've seen it when I came back after Bucha was just liberated. It was April 2022. I've seen it in September when I was there. I've seen it in December 22. It was cold and dark. And, and I've seen it now, and it's, it's been throughout the 17 months that people say it's difficult, uh, it's, it's horrible, it's uh, many losses, but nobody uh, would say, uh, you know, that we shall surrender. We all know that, you know, surrendering for us, it just means that we will all die, and fighting is at least we have a chance to survive. And, you know, this resolve to fight is still there. Resolve to do everything possible and sometimes impossible. Yeah. Yeah, that resolve certainly comes through. And I, I actually was going to ask you a little bit about, uh, just as a small follow-up, uh, on the work being done, I think, with the help of the U.S. and maybe some others on kind of building more resilient infrastructure mm -hmm. for uh, electricity in particular. If you could talk a little bit about yes. that. Um, yes. Uh, we actually are working very actively with the State Department and Department of Energy. And USAID is, the, of course, part of this group. So we have, like we have Rammstein meetings on weapons. We have literally weekly meetings on energy coordination. And what we're trying to do, and that comes a little bit related also to the reconstruction post-war, yeah. uh, is, uh, and to steal your president's uh, quote, build back better. So when we are looking at what Russians are destroying, we're trying not just to rebuild or repair what, what was there, but already think, where shall we be in 10 years? So during this 17 months of war, as surprising as it is, uh, our cabinet of ministers adopted the energy strategy for the next 10 years. We agreed how we will replace the coal mines and everything else which have been destroyed with the renewables and we will change our mix and we will continue developing our nuclear stations, which is the base for Ukraine. So we all, a little bit more than 50% of in our mix comes from the nuclear and Ukrainians are very, um, you know, uh, professional in, in, in the nuclear energy field. And when we are talking to all of our friends and trying to get this additional transformers and, and generators and everything else, of course, I mean, it's not something that is on the shelf and you can pick whatever you want. It's, it's something that you, it's, it's rare commodity even without the war. But when we're choosing between different options, we're already thinking, is it in line with this 10-year strategy? Mm -hmm. Is it in line with our post-war reconstruction visit, vision? Because we, can, we want, after we win, and there will be big need to rebuild, and the, the, the destruction is uh, really big, especially in the areas which has been occupied for a longer time. We want to do it in a way that we can leapfrog from where we have been in 2022 ahead already. So in all the sectors which are critical for Ukraine, like agriculture, energy, uh, IT and digital, to do something that is 22nd century, you know, you know, to do something that we can get more business to come to invest. Because, you know, let's, let's face it, uh, just the recent study of the World Bank, and they're doing this rapid uh, damage, uh, uh, rapid damage uh, report. So it's called our DNA. So the damage, just the physical damage, not, not the losses of the profits, not just the physical damage of what they have assessed was destroyed by Russians uh, during the first full calendar of the full-fledged war as of February 2023. Mm. Uh, amounted to 411 billion US dollars. It's, it's actually, it's not taken into account a big environmental damage. It's not taken into account into the mining that has to be demined. It's not taken, it's not yet, it, it doesn't include the destruction of the dam, mm. which actually is not just a simple environmental catastrophe and, and the losses that were right there for the water that was rushed uh, down south, but that reservoir was the source of the water for the agricultural district and for many uh, towns and cities. So the overall long-term effects are going to be also big. So, you know, the damage is huge. And in order to repair, we of course would welcome any help from our friends and allies. But the question whether we will be able to leapfrog and do it is going to depend on will we attract 
business, right. compliant, large business that will come and, and will do it together with us. Yeah. And, and that's why we have to open the door for all these innovations and do it in a very inspiring way so that we can become a hub for these innovations in our part of the world. So interesting. I mean, that's one of the paradoxes of war, isn't it? That, I mean, that um, it forces so much loss, but then after the fact, oftentimes there is a leapfrog uh, in all kinds of ways, sometimes social, sometimes uh, you know, technological, uh, industrial. Um, but you, you, you mentioned something, actually, that uh, you touched on Ramstein. Uh, mm -hmm. which maybe people in the room don't really know what that is. Uh, but if, you, uh, if you've spent any time in Germany, you will know that there is a base called Rammstein. Uh, it used to be an expo for, for a lot of folks coming out of Afghanistan. Uh, probably still is for most of the Middle East. And uh, a very important uh, tie-up, lash-up, for uh, the collaboration and coordination of weapons transfers to Ukraine's uh, frontline fighters. Um, we know that there's been a big decision uh, recently uh, on the sort of big list of items that you were looking for in Ukraine. Uh, we're getting close to two, in fact. One, we have the F-16s. Are you talking about this one? Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> when did you pin that on? Uh, before the decision. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a magic talisman. So, uh, Denmark. Uh, yes. I believe, uh, has come Netherlands. through. Netherlands has come through. Um, what do you think, I mean, what are you hearing from your colleagues uh, in, in the defense side about the impact of the F-16s? Uh, what will it take to kind of get everything up and running? Uh, what do you predict uh, will happen in the next year? What, we, what we sh should we look for? Well, first of all, you know, uh, as you know, we have been since February 24th working on the very long list of capabilities. Unfortunately, we are fighting with not only brutal and criminal enemy, but also enemy that is much larger than us. So with all the support that we are getting, Russia is still, you know, they, people-wise, and the methods they use to conscribe, you know, they can pretty much force uh, any amount of people, whoever they can catch and whoever uh, did not leave the country uh, to, to, to send them on the front line. But also they have a lot of weapons. <clears throat> yes, bad Soviet type, you know, sometimes not working, but the quantity sometimes is a quality in itself. Yes. So um, the, the list was large, and first we were using both our old Soviet type of equipment and some Ukrainian equipment, and then started Hi. getting the javelins and stingers and then everything else, and now we are almost 100% uh, using the NATO st standard equipment. And to get more capabilities, is very important because, you know, as military people say, you know, it's on the one hand, it's a very World War I type of war, you know, like it's, a, it's an artillery duels on a very long period, very mined, you know, Russians simply are destroying whole villages, you know, the city of Marienka, the city of Bakhmut. Unfortunately, when they were advancing, they did not think about even the civilians. I mean, they were just destroying inch by inch by inch moving forward. And... Um, you know, so we need to counter that, we need to fight with that, but we also need to do something with their uh, supremacy in the air, which is also very important. So uh, we were discussing a number of capabilities from the beginning, and we are very glad that now we have the political decision on the F-16, because it's a very important part of the air defense, it's a very important part of the, like, it's, 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 it's an additional capability that has so many uh, so, so much use, and as you know, our pilots are already uh, at the training, and we are working with our friends and partners, and big thanks to Netherlands and Denmark for agreeing to transfer the platforms, and we are working on that. So, again, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex capability, so it will take, you know, some effort to completely get it, but, you know, it's, it's you know, all capabilities that we were getting, where for the battlefield today, throughout the 17 months, but we always were thinking also about the building the army of the future, mm. how the Ukrainian military will look like after this. Because again, with our aspirations as the future member of the European Union and future member of NATO, we do have now the largest, the most capable, the battle-tested army, which will be an asset for the future transatlantic family. 
So for us, any capabilities that we add now, it's not just the equipment that our brave defenders can use now, but it's also, it's also shaping through the battle the future force of Ukraine, which again inevitably will be the eastern flank of, of NATO. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a very, we already have shown and our brave defenders have shown how quickly they can learn. Uh, the U.S. Patriots, I think, are showing remarkable performance, saving lives, saving children in Ukraine, but also showing how superior they are to any of the equipment that Russia has. So it's not only a great capability for us to have, and we're very grateful to the U.S. for that, but it's also a signal to so many other countries that whoever relied upon Russia to provide them uh, the military uh, support or the SAGs, you know, from the Wagner Group, uh, they can no longer do either of them. That's right. And it's, it's, it's a wake-up call that, you know, with the size of economy that they have, with the lack of values and aggressive nature and imperialistic thinking, which is totally outdated in the 21st century, but they cannot even do the evil things as they did. I mean, they're still doing them to us. But uh, so, so it's, a, it's a big, I think, geopolitical question for a number of our friends in, in, in the rest of the world. And UN is such a great place to, to talk about it and discuss it and see that we have to reform too. We have to move forward. We have to address the problem with the country that doesn't respect the UN Charter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, those conversations at the UNGA coming up, I think uh, to be a fly on the wall there would be quite something, I, I have to say. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned our friends, uh, the Wagner Group. Uh, as you know, I've spent a lot of time uh, thinking about those guys, way too much time, and so has my colleague Ben Dalton, uh, who is in the audience with us today, my partner in crime. A lot of folks in here actually have been very much uh, part of the conversation about the Wagner Group, uh, not only in New America, but uh, certainly I think in the United States uh, and other places where people are paying attention. So we've had some big action uh, pretty recently. I was planning to come to Kyiv, actually, uh, but a certain friend of ours got in the way. Um, Yevgeny Prigozhin uh, and Dmitry Utkin, the, the operational commander uh, of the Wagner Group, and of course, uh, Valery Chikalov, uh, who was kind of the money, money guy, um, all killed, uh, yes. along with four bodyguards uh, and apparently a, a set of innocent crew members as far as we know. We don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of questions about what happened there. Read my book. Whenever it comes out, you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I may have some thoughts on it, but I, I will say the question that I get asked now continually and I would like to ask you is, okay, they're dead, um, but the Wagner Group, we all know, has been linked to a number of war crimes, mm -hmm. uh, countless really, actually, in the Ukraine context, and we can't really even talk about Syria and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so what's next with kind of accountability for uh, Wagner operatives? Uh, what do you think is, uh, has changed, and then where are we going with accountability and justice where they're concerned? Uh, there is no last and lasting and just peace without justice. And as you know, President Zelensky, when he says, uh, talks about the peace formula, justice is such an important element of that. So uh, there we will, do, we will not leave any stone unturned. Uh, so I will come back to Wagner, but in general, uh, we are doing the criminal investigation in Ukraine. The prosecutor general is doing a remarkable job. We have more than 100,000 individual cases that already are opened at, by the Ukrainian legislation. U.S. is helping us a lot, and by the way, Netherlands, on uh, uh, data collection and evidence collection and also how to talk to victims because a number of these crimes are the sexual crimes or the brutal executions of civilians or tortures, and you have to do it also in a way not to re-traumatize the, the victims. So um, we are doing this, and we are not only investigating, we are also already in the courts, and some people are not only indicted, and some people are indicted in absentia, and some people who we caught, you know, the prisoners in Ukraine, but they are also sentenced. And believe it or not, and it's, it's a big challenge which our prosecutor's office is paying very big attention to, is that the due process of law is there, and that all Russian perpetrators actually get lawyers 
to represent them and to defend them. And this is the most difficult issue, to find enough uh, attorneys, Ukrainians, who would uh, defend, but we have to do it. You know, th this is what differentiates us from Russians as well. In addition to that, a dozen of countries already opened their own criminal investigations. We are fully cooperating, providing evidence to them. And uh, as many countries uh, that would do it, we are very grateful. There are three international courts, all of which have cases, whether on genocide or other. One of them already indicted, the ICC, both Putin and Lvova Bilova, and rightfully so, for the kidnapping of our uh, Ukrainian children, which is, you know, part of the genocide. We are working very heavy, actively on the crime of aggression, which is the mother of, the, of all the crimes, you know. And it's a very well-documented crime, because Putin did all of that online. Literally, he was publicly documenting every decision that he took, which led to announcement of this uh, special military operation, i.e. war. Uh, and then he acknowledged the same actions in 2014 and 15, uh, after he stopped pretending that it was some green man in Crimea, you know, and then he said, yeah, yeah, of course it was us. So, um, so this is very important. And... Frankly, I mean, of course, the prosecution in Ukraine goes faster. The international courts will take some time. The crime, the tribunal for aggression will take probably even more time. But it doesn't matter. People need to know that, you know, each of this crime will be in the court of law and that there will be accountability. Now, coming back to those who are dead. Yes, you know, the leadership of the Wagner Group is uh, brutally executed in a very public way on the two months anniversary of their uh, walk uh, to, to Moscow. Uh, but, you know, uh, they were not the only ones who were committing the crimes. Uh, the thousands of Wagner operatives, uh, which, uh, again, very documented, very well documented. Uh, in Ukraine, we have uh, a very big base of the evidence. Uh, but all Russian troops as well. So it's not just some rogue units. It's not just some this private type of military uh, units, which again, we know they're not really private. It's the Russian army and the Russian armed forces and the Russian president who created them and who were providing them with weapons and who were giving them instructions. And yes, there were some disagreements between Prigozhin and Shoigu, but it's more a quarrel between you know, the different lines of the same kind of organized crime organization, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, really state and the private um, doing it separately. So um, we'll continue investigating, we'll continue indicting them. There are other private groups not as successful, though I don't know whether successful is the word to use, of course, uh, but not as capable. But there was attempts by Russians to create these groups, and there are a number of them. That's right. We just didn't hear. They still are operating outside of uh, Russia. I mean, hopefully without a, a capable, although evil and criminal head like Prigozhin, we will see decline of the use of the thugs mm -hmm. in, in African countries and others. Uh, but if not, then justice for everything they've done in Ukraine will also help us to get them out from so many uh, criminal missions that they have throughout the, throughout the globe. So, you know, I, I think it's a very important issue, and to get justice, regardless of how much time it will take, is as important as winning this war. Because that justice, wherever it will be served fully, will be the final victory in this war, together with the reconstruction. No justice, no peace. Absolutely. Right? That's how it goes. Well, we're getting kind of close to time, and I know that there's probably a question or two um, in the audience, so I want to open up the floor uh, and, and maybe get back to the question on um, the ICC and uh, the question with the children mm -hmm. and what's going on there. But let me um, go to the audience first. We'll go with uh, my colleague, Peter Bergen. Thank you. Um, you know, Candice mentioned uh, you know, all the amazing work you were doing in Washington. Um, a, a potential problem, of course, is the presidential election of 2024. Quite a number of the Republican candidates are sort of saying that they, uh, implying that they would reduce or maybe even end aid to Ukraine. I think 71% of Republicans now say uh, aid to Ukraine should stop. So how do you deal with this sort of American political scene where the 
Putin is surely looking at these polls and making his own conclusions. Well, first, elections are very important for any, in any democracy. And this is something for what we are fighting in Ukraine, for democracy, for the ability to choose our government and to change it on a regular basis. And uh, I would never call a, an election a problem, to be honest. This is what uh, people should do, and this is the basis of all of us continue developing, whether we like the results or not, right? Uh, so, um, first of all, I, I have big trust in American people, uh, regardless of party affiliations. When we explain it to people, uh, I always feel the support. So when we tell people why, and we tell people the more information about what's going on, and we tell people that we are fighting for our homes, for our loved ones, that we were attacked by a brutal bully with no pretext, with no reason whatsoever, that it's very much our own war for independence and freedom, I think the majority of Americans understand and feel it. Because this is what Americans have in them. This is what this country is built on, these values. So when people uh, either do not support it or say, say that you know, it's not in the American interests, it just means that we didn't explain it well. We have to do more. We have to go and talk to people. We have to give them more information. We have to provide them with this, with this uh, knowledge. And that's why, and again, I always thank the journalists, because their work has been a game changer during this phase of the, of the war. In 2014, exactly this happened. Russia attacked us exactly the same way. The Shem referendum in Crimea was no different from the Shem referendums now, but our voice was not heard. This time, it wasn't just our voice. It's the cameras and the journalists who have been there, who have been showing the world what's going on. So it's very important to continue to inform people. By informing people, we also have to tell them more about how the American help to us work. That yes, there is 113 billion that Congress very uh, generously appropriated to provide for the Ukraine and related to Ukraine support. But not all of that money goes to Ukraine. Uh, so yes, we are getting the direct budget support, which is about slightly above 10, 20 billion, for which we are very grateful. Of course, again, I, I always say how grateful we are. Uh, so that is the money we are getting in order to be able to continue the fight and sustain, sustain the effort. All the defense uh, assistance, which is much larger than this, we're not getting the money, we're getting the goods. And a number of uh, resources that Congress provided goes to replenish the uh, stocks of the Pentagon. It goes to increase the production here. I just uh, recently, last month, visited the Lima, Ohio plant, which pro produces Abramses. And I have to tell you, you know, it's, it's additional jobs there. And uh, the majority of people in that plant, I mean, I felt like I'm visiting friends there because they are proud that they are producing this excellent American capability and that we will be able to do it, similar with the plants that produces Bradley's. And then you see the videos how when our brave defenders liberated Robotene in the south and there were still people there, civilians, you know, of the age of my mother, and they were put into this American Bradley to be evacuated to safety because everyone in Ukraine, all defenders know, if there is a shelling, you go inside the Bradley, not outside, because this is the place where you will be kept safe. So we just have to explain that it's, you know, we're very grateful again for the weapons, but they are produced here, and we're doing it together, and they are developing, providing jobs here in the United States, and, and, and it's also for, for, the, for the benefit of both of our countries. You know, we need the goods in order to defend our families, but you're producing them here, and third, which is also very important, you know, we are defending not only us. We are defending the whole European uh, part, which Putin has been very loud and clear that he wants to attack and he wants to, uh, he has problems not only with Ukraine. He has problems with everyone who was able to, to get out from this empire, uh, the Russian, the Soviet, or whatever you call it. So he threatens sometimes Poland, he threatens definitely all Baltic states, he was t t t talking how the Finland and Denmark are no friends, uh, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, right now we are defending other, including NATO countries, 
uh, at a very modest, I would say, military budget. Just and and we are doing it ourselves. We are not requesting any of our friends to fight for us. It's we don't need other boots on the ground. We just need the weapons. But if God forbid we fall, and uh, Putin occupies completely Ukraine and kills us all, he will not be stopped. He will be emboldened by this. And he will inevitably go further. And then, unfortunately, a number of NATO countries will have to help to defend other NATO countries. So the, the fastest and the most um, efficient from the financial standpoint, this is the Minister of Finance and me talking, <laughs> is actually to help Ukraine more to stop the war now while it's still in Ukraine. So whether it's the moral argument, whether it's the shared values, whether it's the effectiveness and efficiency argument, because it is in the US national security interests to defeat an aggressive uh, autocratic regime that not only attacked Ukraine, let's keep in mind that they have attacked Georgia in 2008, that they have co committed horrible crimes in uh, Syria, that they have poisoned people in the streets of the United Kingdom, that they have interfered and sent their Wagner sags into so many other places, uh, not to mention all the crimes that they have committed while they were in the form of the Soviet Union. So many wars and so many. So it's, it's in all of our civilized people interests to live in a safer world, which will return to the security architecture that we had after the World War II, because that peace, and again, I do not imply that the peace was everywhere, but at least the lack of a great war, which would involve European uh, continent, has been a basis for the prosperity that we all enjoyed in the collective Western countries and in some newly, newly developed uh, economies. And we have to get back there as soon as possible if we want to continue delivering to our people, to our citizens. So, I think, you know, when we explain it clearly to the American people, they understand and they support. So it's a task for all of us to explain it better. So I see, I keep getting these high signs over here. I wish we could just keep going on. I, I really, I hope you come back, first of all. Let me just say that, uh, because this has been a wonderful conversation. I was going to ask you how many states you've been to, but maybe that's, we'll have that bet later. How many states have you been to, actually? Well, not, not, not too many because I'm trying to stay here. This is, this is where uh, the war is. <laughs> and, and I'm trying to travel yeah. for sure. But I've, I've been to California. I've been to Ohio. I've been to, um, uh, where did I go? Did I go? Uh, Massachusetts. I've been to Pennsylvania. I've been to Florida. And uh, New York, of course. Okay. But that's not, we're, I still, we're going to Illinois. We're I still have to come back to Indiana. So. Okay. That's right. You've got to get back to Indiana. Uh, well, listen, I want to ask one tiny question, but it's going to have to be a short answer, I'm afraid. Um, I, I did want to come back to this question on the ICC decision uh, to charge Putin, uh, uh, to charge the, the High Commissioner on, uh, on Children's Affairs. Uh, big decision, and obviously seems to have constrained Putin's movements. Uh, what's your response, um, and, and how has that decision affected uh, the, the efforts to repatriate uh, Ukrainian children from Russia? Well, first of all, we are very grateful to ICC for taking that case, for moving ahead with that case. This is probably, maybe for me as mother, is the most horrendous crime of all. So, 19, more than 19,000 cases registered already in Ukraine. The children we know have been abducted to Russia. According to the estimates of our commissioner on, on these issues, it's actually 200 or 300,000. Uh, the Russians themselves themselves claim is even larger amount of children they rescued, as they say. But, you know, killing of Ukrainian children, abducting them to Russia, putting them into this one-day adoption, and they changed their own laws to be able to put them for the speedy adoptions, indoctrinating them, putting them through what they are telling us, the teenagers that we were able to get back through the re-education camps, which sounds like a, from the book about the... Uh, World War II and, and, and what Nazis did to, to children is horrible. Yeah. It's, and everyone has to be punished for that. And the fact that ICC ruled and indicted them is, is such a notion of justice and understanding of this problem. So we are grateful for the U.S. government that is working with us on this issue. 
We are trying to get back as, as, as many people, children as possible. Very difficult. Unfortunately, we were able to return a very small number of them. Uh, we are very grateful to everyone in Congress. You know, there is a number of resolutions that uh, submitted on this issue, not only condemning, but also calling for some actions with regard to how to do it. It's a very difficult issue. Of course, we need to win. When we win, we will know, first of all, for sure, what is the situation on the occupied territories. But also, this is when we will start, uh, you know, working more actively. I mean, we are, we are working as active as we can. But to have the win, this, of course, is going to be a big part of, uh, you know, our victory is to get all our children back. What our first lady, our president, and everyone in Ukraine says always, we will not uh, rest until every child is back. Mm. Well, let's hope that happens. Thank you again, Ambassador, for joining us. Uh, such a pleasure and an honor. Thank uh, you. And uh, I hope the audience will give you also a, a warm applause. Thank you. Our next panel, which is the future of security in Latin America, uh, my friend and colleague, Daniel Rothenberg of ASU and also New America is gonna moderate this discussion. Thanks, everybody. So we're honored to be joined by uh, Ambassador Juan Carlos Pinzon. So he was the former Colombian ambassador to the United States. Uh, he was also the Minister of Defense and also ran for president in the country. And he's currently the John Weinberg Visiting Professor at Princeton University. Um, so I'd like to start by just asking you to reflect a little bit on the context we're in now. So. In the post 9-11 era, there's been a lack of a coherent and consistent U.S. policy towards Latin America. I'm wondering if you think that such a policy should be enacted, developed, and if so, what would be like the core principles that would motivate a policy like that? Well, thank you, Dan. First of all, a pleasure to be here and always great to be in this space. It's the second time I get to <laughs> be part of this wonderful conference that happens every year, so good to be here. Well, that, that question that you just made is the, the, the eternal question in Washington and the eternal question in every capital of Latin America. Why is that? It's so obvious that if we work together, we will be very powerful and strong as a region. And why is not that somehow doesn't happen? Uh, in a way, probably the centers of power are very much related to geopolitics and geoeconomics. So Asia, Europe, you know, have been the center of focus for the U.S. for years. And it's kind of, everybody has taken for granted the South, you know, the Western Hemisphere as a whole. Probably the U.S. was very influential for years and, you know, in a way, never had the need to, you know, go beyond. But sometimes we forget about the potential of the region. You know, when we think about not North America, or Latin America, but we think about the Americas. This hemisphere has a billion people, more than that. So it's an incredible huge market. And this is the region of the world that probably is absolutely independent of any other if it will put all the resources to work. It has water, more fresh water than any other. It has more biodiversity than any other. It has more minerals than any other, lithium, copper, gold, you name it, oil, gas, etc. It has a region, especially in the tropical center, where we can have access to wind and solar power. The capacity to produce food in the Western Hemisphere is second to none in the whole planet. So what explains? You know, we cannot see it like that and make it operational like that. And that's the big thing I believe we need to, to, to think through. The other part we should not forget is that Latin America continues to be a very young uh, area of the world. The, the average age is uh, 29 still. So there's still some time to develop a lot of opportunities in human capital, education, technology, that if we were to combine, I'm sure will have a, an incredible impact, especially now. But as we say this, which is probably true 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, even before, 
we get to the present and we see new players. Global power competition is happening. And players are seeing what I describe, but not having America as this great partner with technology and education to contribute to the region and help us to increase our productivity via infrastructure, but other players, China, Russia, Iran, Turkey, or even you know, regional powers like Brazil that are looking to partner through the BRICS to other players. So a big question is, aren't we getting a little bit late for trying to do that? Well, my answer to that question is, I think we're on time. I think there are many cultural reasons and historic reasons, including the fact that we have democracy, including the fact that here in the United States, we have probably the fourth or fifth largest Latin American country of the world. It happens to be here in the US. So the bridges are already on. How do we make those bridges operate will be a big question. But that's uh, very important. Now, my concern as we speak that I perceive the region going in a different way. This narrative that I just provide is probably the one we would love to see. But the region is shifting, is going away from this story. So how do we correct that? So, so it's interesting, we, when Latin America was at the forefront of US policy making, you know, uh, on, on the news all the time, et cetera, usually was because of various references to security viewed as a security threat or viewed as security partners. So in the, in the last several decades, we've seen other regions, whether the Middle East or now China above all, uh, the security threat sensibility is what's driven a lot of the policy interest. So do you think that what it will take for the US to develop some sort of more coherent engagement with the region is some sort of pressing security threat. And if so, what, what might that be? Or do you not agree with that? No, I fully agree. And this is a big point. And, and we got to go back and look to history. There are three waves of US interest in the region. And probably we're getting into the fourth one. Let's make sure that this fourth one is really effective for the long term. Let me remind you. The first time the US really realized about the Western Hemisphere and the hemisphere look at, at you know, as, as a whole, as an important place to try to do things, was uh, prior to the Monroe Doctrine. And why did that happen? Because all of us agree at that time that we didn't want the European powers to come back. So somehow, we found this idea of the Americas for the Americans, meaning the Americas, not the United States of America, but the whole Americans, and Americans not only those that were born in the US, but all of us who were born in the Americas. You know, so that was the first time. But then, you know, kind of we forgot the Europeans got into their own wars. They fought for a hundred years, you know, in the end of 19th century and 20th century. But suddenly, by, you know, the start of World War II, there were two powers that were trying to project global power. Germany and Japan, especially Germany. The Nazis did have ties in the South. So that became a real threat to the United States. That became a real challenge. And certainly there was a major effort to deny that power through military collaboration. Actually, in the year 1941, the big response was this uh, security agreement. And that was the way in which that was prevented. Later on, Cold War happened. And during the 50s and 60s, when we saw those uh, guerrilla warfare movements coming to the region, being successful in Cuba, and suddenly having a guerrilla in every country of Latin America. Then came a new idea from the United States, and it had two parts. One was you know, using the US agencies to confront you know, these kind of threats, militarily and with other tools, but also there was a social economic tool that worked very well. Uh, and was you know, somehow the Alliance for Progress from President Kennedy that somehow had an impact and create this balance that yes, the US can create progress and prosperity. As time passes, that was abandoned in a way and we forgot that in time. By the end of Cold War, I have to think that there was a good intention but never came to a real end, which was trying to create this major Western Hemisphere market. 
And that was this idea of creating the free trade market for, of the Americas. But it never really ended as, a, as an opportunity. So where are we today? Latin America was taken for granted. The US got very much engaged into the Middle East, you know, into uh, Central Asia. Uh, more recently, is looking a lot to the Pacific. And Latin America was taken for granted. But now, is being contested. And somehow these powers are here again. Here's where we have an opportunity. I see out of the geopolitical competition an incredible opportunity for the US to go for this fourth wave of interest in the hemisphere and work hard. But where do I see a big challenge? The challenges of security in the region. Organized crime. Organized crime is taking over um, almost every country of Latin America. From Mexico to Argentina, including definitely my country, Colombia, you will see the presence of organized crime in politics, in power, in territorial control, and creating a, an effect in, in, in society. Of course, that is very much connected to political realities. Inequality continues to be there Corruption continues to be a terrible disease. But unfortunately, a response that Latin Americans have looked for of the need of change and the need of you know, solving these major issues is not coming as a real solution. It's coming from people that used to be, during the Cold War era, very much against democracy, very much against the values that we share uh, a free market and freedom, they kind of have new clothes but are the same people, but in essence, they are trying to promote change. They're not being effective socially and policy-wise. And on the contrary, chaos is happening more often in countries like Mexico, like uh, Guatemala, like Honduras, like Colombia, even countries like Brazil, Argentina, and Chile, not to forget about Peru, and not to forget about recent events in Ecuador, are really showing that this model of organized crime, politicians, and all ideologies combined are not being positive for the region. So, yes, we have this opportunity of the fourth wave, but I think Washington, and definitely us Latin Americans, need to be aware of the challenges that we're confronting uh, combined. So it's interesting, you, you've given us a, a good context for US-Latin American relations. One of the defining features of woven into that, that timeline is Latin America being the premier region or one of the premier regions for what's known as the third wave of democratization, right? The shift from authoritarian regimes to democratic regimes, which came in you know, with, with a great deal of excitement among, among many, both in the academy and also on the ground. And yet, if you look at polling now, uh, a lot of the populations in countries, those more democratic and those less democratic in the region, have quite negative feelings about the democratic process and often about democracy. I'm wondering what you think helps explain that and whether democracy in Latin America has a rich, vibrant future, and if so, what would guide it that way? So the Gallup World Poll, just to prove your point, shows that when you think about institutions worldwide, as they are supported around 70% average worldwide, in Latin America is below 50%. So there's a, you know, a real challenge about the credibility of institutions to solve problems. Second, when you think about democracy, and the credibility of elections. You have these Vanderbilt University studies, the Latin barometer, yes. that is showing that Latin Americans are starting to distance from the confidence in democracy and starting or not to care about what system they have, or even in some countries starting to support the idea that if it is to fight corruption, you're ready to support any kind of autocratic system which is very worrisome. And that somehow explains the reality of what we're getting. We're getting more radical governments in power. We're getting people that once they get to power, they use democracy just uh, basically to seal 
you know, or to, uh, you know, guarantee that they can do whatever changes. So they move into more uh, private side concept of democracy. So they use the votes to change institutions, and that is happening more often. So is uh, problematic, and, and I think that's something that we need to watch. So, you know, this uh, very victorious language uh, of post-Cold War, which meant we have the most democratic hemisphere after uh, <coughs> Europe, well, is something that today is in question. Democracy is weakening. Institutions are having problems. And with that, you combine security. Another element of the, of the Gal uh, world poll, when you ask the question, do you feel safe when you walk alone at night? The area of the world that has the worst number compared to any other in the world is Latin America. But another number, out of the 50 cities that are most violent in the world, 41 of those are in Latin America. So people don't trust justice, don't trust institutions, and suddenly they start to trust either politicians that are promising crazy things or governments that suddenly provide some sense of security and uh, some sense of solution. So it's problematic, and, and, and we see that. We see the case of Venezuela, the case of, well, Cuba is an old case, but always problematic. The case of Nicaragua and other cases in which democracy is not looking as we thought should be democracy. Can you think of a set of core principles or ideas that would motivate U.S. policy towards Latin America? There was a focus on democratization, quite a strong push for all that and support in a variety of ways during that transition. There have been other pushes at different times. But what would pull the, the interests of the country together to have some coherent vision on, uh, on the region. And, and this, we just have two minutes, so just a short and focused response if possible. Well, first thing I'm gonna say is I'm nobody to recommend uh, the policymakers in Washington. You know, the US is strong enough and they have to, you know, find their responses. But from my perspective, you know, being from the region and being a Colombian, I perceive three things. First, I wish the US to keep being friend of their friends and not try to be so much friend of their enemies. Because that could solve problems in the short term, could keep fires low, but long term is a bad solution. Because suddenly you are allowing, you know, uh, cases of dictators or total misbehaviors, or in the case of Venezuela, you know, a, a government that is uh, uh, with a terrible record of human rights, suddenly validated. So be aware of that, you know, the solutions of today can be very harmful long term and can give, can give a very, uh, set a very bad example. That's one. But second, let's speak on the positive. What we're missing in Latin America is human capital and infrastructure. The, combi the combination of those two things create the concept of productivity. Productivity is stagnant in Latin America for the past 50 years. When you think about East Asia, that's the East Asian miracle. South Korea, Malaysia, even China, that's the miracle. They were able to educate people and combine that with the right quality of infrastructure and suddenly they were able to become more productive and innovative. That's what we're not doing. So if you are in the part of the world in which you have these young people with access to all these natural resources that we have, but we live closer to the place of the world that has more technology and more uh, universities of quality than any other in the world. That's North America, that's the United States of America. Why is that we're not getting that spillover? Why is that we're not raising that level of education and somehow uh, uh, access to technology and infrastructure? That's very important. And that's denying, as we speak, an incredible opportunity that geopolitics are giving to the region. The events of COVID and the events of the war in Ukraine have wake up this geopolitical old sense that you better have your centers of production, at least, you know, in different parts and hopefully in parts that you can control. 
So the perfect spot to bring all this production is Latin America. Why are we not getting all that massively? Because we don't have the skilled labor or the logistics or even the political stability due to organized crime that I described before that guarantees the environment for companies to come and sit. That's a big thing. And that's uh, something that we should be working on. That would be ideal. We can really focus on, on both US policy and, of course, Latin American institutions, private sector, uh, different kinds of leaders, and hopefully governments. But I see many of the governments in Latin America distracted with, as I said, all narratives, and some of them very compromised with organized crime, which is very concerning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the future. The moderator is going to be Alexandra Stark, who's an associate policy researcher at RAND. She's also a fellow at, in, at, uh, at New America, and she has a forthcoming book about Yemen uh, coming out relatively soon. Alex, uh, I worked at New American until recently, and so I'm, I'm thrilled to be uh, kind of joining my, my former colleagues again today. So thanks so much for having us. I'm also thrilled to be exciting uh, to be speaking with these two uh, really interesting and exciting folks uh, on the panel today. Um, we don't have too much time, so I'm, I'm not going to give them the full introduction that they, they probably deserve and, and share all of their accolades. But just to let you know um, who we're speaking to uh, in brief, um, this is Dr. Ruth ben Giat. She's a professor of history and Italian studies at New York University and the author of Strong Men, Mussolini to the Present, uh, and Lieutenant General Retired Michael K. Nagata. He's former director of strategic operational planning at NCTC uh, and strategic advisor and senior vice president at CACI International. So uh, welcome and, and thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, so uh, talking about future uh, international se security threats and, and what kinds of threats the United States faces in terms of security, um, it is a hugely uh, broad topic, and I wanted to talk about what um, you see as the most pressing future challenges, not necessarily the challenges of, of right now, although we could, of course, be seeing the seeds of them developing, but really the challenges that we're, we're likely to face down the road. Um, and I know there are a plethora of challenges ranging from, you know, technology like AI and cyber to near peer adversaries um, to, to nuclear proliferation to everything in between. Um, and we could spend a long time listing all of those challenges. So instead, I'm going to give you a kind of harder version of the question and ask, um, what do you see as maybe the one most uh, pressing threat that the United States faces in terms of security in, in the near future, um, whether it's, you know, the most challenging or maybe the most intractable or most interesting problem. Um, and then I'd love to hear your thoughts about whether um, and, and what are the ways that we can kind of approach these, these really intractable and, and uh, important problems. So I'm going to start with Ruth, if that's okay. Um, what, what's the challenge you would identify? Uh, hi, everyone. So it's hard to have one uh, challenge because they're all interrelated. I think that um, demonstrating that democracy works and also making democracy appealing, uh, which it currently is, uh, is, is decreasing in that uh, category. There are um, new polls, uh, both Afrobarometer, Latino barometer polls of young people who uh, in high numbers say that a democracy is would not be their preferred um, form of government. And this matters because um, when we do not have democracy and we have uh, authoritarian regimes that or electoral autocracies that um, depend on disinformation and repression, we um, in often have are ruled by disinformation on public health, on climate change, on the big things that actually affect people's lives and will lead to a ton of instability in the future. So it's not that democracies are always stable and it certainly have democracies have uh, created their share of, um, of, of coups and instabilities in the past, but um, I'm, I'm quite focused on this. 
So the U.S. in particular, it's no secret, you know, faces a kind of assault uh, on its democracy from uh, within now, as well as from without. And <clears throat> it was interesting to preparing these remarks to think back uh, that the day that uh, Joe Biden started his presidency on a very strong pro-democracy platform, where he said explicitly over and over again, we've got to prove democracy works. That day of his inauguration, China, Russia, and Iran held their third joint naval drill in the Indian Ocean. Um, and I'm also thinking, you know, about uh, the, the concatenation of events uh, where in the fall of 2021, if we think back to, you know, the, the climate that allowed uh, you, the invasion of Ukraine to happen, uh, the Russian and Chinese ambassadors penned a joint essay that absolutely dripped with scorn. It makes me very angry as a first-generation American to read it. Uh, dripped with scorn for American democracy, which was followed by a joint statement by Putin and Xi, uh, you know, then and the the occasion was Biden's summit of democracy, to which they were not invited, um, and saying that, you know, the U.S. does not have a monopoly on uh, democratic rights and the U.S. is uh, creating global conflict and anti-NATO stuff. So, so this is, um, this was an invitation to the kind of instability that then, you know, uh, came, we saw with the invasion of Ukraine. And I think that um, it was very striking to me as somebody who studies uh, people who have often been underestimated uh, in, in terms of their chaos potential, uh, the strongmen, um, that uh, when, when the war first happened, uh, the Washington Post reported that, you know, some people in the White House, this is a quote, found it hard to wrap their minds around the scale of the Russian leader's ambitions. It did not seem like the kind of thing that a rational country would undertake. And this was a quote from a, a security leader. And there were similar things that were said by, um, by European officials. So, you know, being prepared uh, for all kinds of instability. We have an uptick of coups. Uh, we're going to have more, you know, again, climate change and also autocracy fueled instabilities, China with Taiwan. So expect the worst. <laughs> Uh, and understand the logic. Um, and that applies uh, also to the GOP, just real quick. I think, uh, I do not think that you can understand the GOP at this point through uh, explanatory frameworks that are created for democracy. I see the GOP as an autocratic party that's now dependent on the kind of autocratic tools of rule from propaganda, corruption, and election denial as a form of corruption and the threat and reality of violence. Um, so this too, expect the worst and, um, and do everything we can to bolster democracy. And that includes messaging that, that creates a kind of horizon of possibility that it can work because we are assaulted by psychological warfare for many years now, uh, since Trump came on the scene, and perhaps before that's telling us uh, that democracy can't work. Thanks. And Mike, what's the, the most pressing or, or kind of challenging threat that you'd identify? First of all, thank you for to you and uh, New America for inviting me to be here. It's an honor to be on this panel with uh, Ruth. Um, you know, when I first learned that this was this question you were going to start with, I started writing a list of things that I wanted to talk about, but you, I don't want to inflict the list on anybody. So I'm just going to focus on what I would put at the top of that list. Um, and that I, I'll give you the short version first, and then I'll, I'll explain a little bit more. Um, what worries me most is not one of our dangerous or highly competitive adversaries somewhere around the world, although they are a significant problem. You've already mentioned Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. These are all significant uh, threats and potential adversaries to the United States. Um, but they're not at the top of my list either. My, the top of my list is our own failure to adapt. Uh, I, as a retired military officer, I think I've been watching a steadily growing failure to adapt, and in some cases, an unwillingness to adapt, uh, grow 
gradually over at least the last couple of decades. Where the, I think this comes to a head perhaps most strongly is a failure to adapt to something that is literally changing the face of mankind. It began in the arguably in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and that's the emergence of what we today call digital technologies. Um, I think you, one has to go all the way back to the period between the 10th to the 12th century with the emergence of what we today call gunpowder. Back then it was just explosive powder that the Chinese originally used for fireworks, but rapidly became a weapon of war. The emergence of gunpowder, in my opinion, literally changed the face and the trajectory of mankind for better and for worse. Um, I think digital technologies, their emergence, are doing the same thing and maybe even more disruptive than the emergence of explosives many centuries ago. And what I see in many places, not just the United States, but what worries me the most when I consider the national security challenges of the United States is our own ongoing failures, our own ongoing reluctance, our own ongoing risk aversion to embracing the fact that these technologies are here to stay. They're gonna become more proliferated, less expensive and more powerful as every year goes by. And we can either be at the head of that race by working much harder than we are right now, or we can be a victim of that trajectory. I know that's very uplifting, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, so Ruth, you, you talked about the challenge of um, autocracies and, and kind of democratic backsliding. I'm wondering what you see as the future of, of autocracies, both uh, kind of globally and, and maybe um, how, you know, the erosion of democratic institutions might affect the United States as well. Um, what does that future trajectory look like and, and what will that mean in terms of the challenges that we face? Yeah, we're at a very interesting moment. Um, on the one hand, there has been a, a, a very, um, it's not unusual in history, but we're at a moment where um, the weakness, the structural weaknesses, the ravages from corruption, um, the toll of personalist leadership models is being um, exposed. And we see this, and sometimes it's, it's an event like Russia invading Ukraine, which opens the curtains. Uh, but, but there are patterns to these things. And if you study them, like I wrote an op-ed for MSNBC two days after Putin invaded Ukraine that said this wasn't going to go well. It was going to show up the, the total corruption of the military, you know, and, and there are parallels actually with fascist Italy that they're fighting with terrible, you know, outdated equipment, bad rations, because authoritarians don't care about their people. They don't care. Uh, they'll use them for cannon fodder and, and the resources get siphoned off to corruption, especially if you have a kleptocracy. I also found it very interesting in China, um, the, the protests against the lockdowns, uh, which were protests against being dehumanized, really. And all these young people, you know, 79 universities had protests, even Xi Jinping's alma mater had a protest. So that's, these are significant things. And we're in the midst of a global renaissance of protest. Look at in Iran, uh, places that never have protests of the scale or haven't had them for a long time. So uh, there is this kind of anti-authoritarian resistance, and there also is a weakness uh, of these regimes that I think will be more revealed. Um, but these are also adaptable regimes. Authoritarian leaders are transactional. They're, they do what they need to do to survive. And so the Chinese are, it's very interesting what's happening. Um, I don't actually like the term global South, but uh, it's very interesting to me that Lula, who's a bit of a democracy warrior, is partnering with the Chinese, allowing them to have uh, drones and surveillance things over the Amazon. And so it's a very dynamic and changing situation. And uh, so, so autocracies also will adapt. And so democracies have not, uh, this goes with what Mike was saying, democracies have, have perhaps not been as um, able to adapt to certain circumstances, um, and that is now showing up as well. 
Um, Mike, you, you talked about um, the proliferation of digital technology and, and our failures to adapt. Uh, I'm wondering, um, again, you, we could probably write a long list of, of the obstacles to, to adapting, but what are some of maybe the primary obstacles that you see um, to adapting to really face this, this challenge head on? And um, how can we think about, you know, removing those obstacles or getting around them? Great question. Uh, the list is long, as you suggested, um, including our own tendency to be highly bureaucratic inside the United States government. That, that alone is an enormous hindrance to rapid adoption, literally of anything, not just modern technology. Um, but that's not the, our biggest problem. Um, and I, this is going to probably sound both facile and too obvious, but I'm going to say it anyways because I think it's true. Weak leadership. Weak leadership is our biggest problem. And what I mean specifically, more specifically than just weak leadership is risk averse leadership, which is inherently weak leadership. The, you know, someone of my age, for example, I, I, can, I cannot be a digital native, I'm too old. So, so my ability to learn rapidly how to employ these rapidly, uh, these rapidly emerging technologies is always going to be less strong, less reliable, less agile than someone who's half my age. But I should still try. I should still try because this is the way the world is going. And you, you can either swim with the tide or you can drown in it. Um, unfortunately, because at the leadership level of most governments, not just the United States government, let's face it, a policymaker in Washington, D.C., generally in their 60s, maybe in their 70s, they're not digital natives either. So they are they are automatically handicapped by the fact they're not digital natives in a, in rapidly adopting technologies. They're not well positioned to understand. But all it takes is courage. All it takes is a willingness to try and a willingness to fail because a lot of things will go wrong. Um, but the alternative is to not to adapt. And if anybody thinks that our adversaries and competitors around the world are going to be as either as bureaucratic, which as I mentioned at the beginning, or as risk averse as we are, we're nuts. They're visibly not. They're willing to accept the failures inherent to achieve progress in ways that, unfortunately, American leaders often are not. Now, there are many reasons for that. I won't go. I won't go on about that. But the bottom line: if we don't find a way to become more risk tolerant, embrace the fact, and it is a fact, that the only way to get better at something is to periodically fail at it, so that you learn what your mistakes are and you get better the next time. If we don't adopt that in our adoption of and adaptation to rapidly changing modern technologies, we're just going to be left behind. Thanks. So um, unfortunately, we only have a few more minutes. I know we could talk about this probably for a much longer, but um, I'm, I'm struck that both of you have identified challenges that aren't necessarily um, traditional security challenges. Um, and that have to do both with domestic and, and the international, and they kind of blend those two realms together in, in a way that's really interesting. Um, so, Ruth, I'm, I'm wondering, do you think that it's necessary um, for us to reform our own democratic institutions or to show, shore up our institutions at home um, in order to be able to take on this global uh, challenge of autocracy? Yeah, absolutely. and. Um... I mean, let, let me say that um, one of the things that makes me most angry is, um, excuse me, I'll be mispronouncing his name, Tuberville, Tuberville. Uh, there is, you know, active, <clears throat> the GOP has become, as I said, an autocratic party, a party that wants democracy to fail and is a party, of, excuse me, <clears throat> a party that is sabotaging in a way that's a strong word um, U.S. Uh, military and, and security power, not knowing that you do it at home and it, and it resonates in the world. So it's not just uh, Tuberville holding up all the military promotions, which is just terrible. It's Rand Paul holding up diplomatic appointments so that the U.S. remains without important diplomatic uh, posts filled. And so this is a kind of... Um, you have to put all these things together and it's an attempt to kind of rein in and have American power be absent, be 
uh, distracted by, you know, I call it garbage politics, the things that, that, that Republicans are doing, uh, um, threatening to, you know, crash the economy, the impeachments. And this is, this is kind of a, a resolute um, attempt on their part to um, obstruct American power in the world to the benefit of our ad adversaries. Thank you. And Mike, I have the same question for you. Actually, you've, you've already mentioned the challenges of um, kind of bureaucracy and, and of leadership at home, but I'm wondering, um, are, are there other areas that you think of that we would need to reform or to, to shore up at home in order to confront these global challenges? Yes, one automatically comes to mind. It, it, I think I could argue it's not just connected to my previous remarks, but I think it connects in some ways to what Ruth was talking about in terms of the difficulties we're having around the world. Um, as I think everybody will recall, you either learned it in school or you saw evidence of it over your lives that, um, you know, America, at least as far back as World War II, has styled itself as the leader of the free world. Now, everybody knows there was no plebiscite electing us to be the leader of the free world. We claimed that mantle at the end of World War II. But we had enough credibility with much of the world by the end of that horrible conflict that the term stuck. Other people, other countries, not everywhere, not universally, but many countries were willing to go along with the idea that America was the free world. Now, why? Why was much of the free world willing to say, okay, you're the leader. I, I will accept that. Um, in my view, it's because the United States had established a tradition, however imperfectly, of being the most generous nation on earth. We have abandoned that notion that, that we should be, because we're more powerful than anybody else, we ought to be more generous than anybody else. Um, and by abandoning that tradition, which we did hold on to for much of the Cold War, but it's long gone now, um, or at least it's a pale shadow of what it once was, unsurprisingly, the willingness and readiness of populations around the world to acknowledge us as a leader has been has been steadily dwindling. Now, uh, there are other reasons why this has happened, but if someone were to ask me what's the single most important reason, we keep calling ourselves the leader of the free world, but we've abandoned the generosity that made it an attractive idea. Well, thank you so much to you both. I wish we had um, lots more time to discuss the, these really interesting uh, and tractable problems. But um, thank you so much for for uh, this conversation today. Uh, thanks, thanks to the audience and thanks to New America for hosting us. My name is Colonel Carmela Scott Skillern. I am a senior fellow assigned to New America. This past year, my research topic was Army logistics in the Pacific. I looked at logistics in the Pacific through three lens. That's contested logistics, tyranny of distance, and modernization on equipment in the Pacific. Just looking at these three aspects on, on logistics in the Pacific, I just believe that the Army as well as the other services can get a lot of things accomplished as we look at the challenges in the Pacific. Um, so first, if we think about contested logistics, just understanding, especially looking at some of the issues that uh, we're currently facing and that the Ukraine, looking at the importance of what's happening and lessons learned during the Ukraine's operation, there are things that we can take away from. Uh, so I think that the Ukraine is is very, have been successful overall because of some of the things that they've done initially uh, with the logistics operations. And so logistics has been around a long time and army wars can never be won because of logistics, but they definitely can be lost because of logistics. So when we start talking about contested logistics, today's environment, especially in the specific, logistics will be contested um, across all domains. So what can we do today to get prepared for that operation? So when we start thinking about contested logistics in the army lens, um, we start to think, how can we position ourselves? What, what do we have now that we can position in the Pacific 
or globally across the world to ensure that we're positioned correctly to support that um, the particular theater of operations. So when we start thinking of, of those things, we what comes to mind is Army preposition equipment. So we start thinking about Army preposition equipment. What are those equipments that we have that we can use that can bring to bear in, in the Pacific theater operation? That's important. Do we have the right equipment in the Pacific at the right time? And can we get it to the right point of need when needed? We have, to have our seven sustainment support brigade that has those functions, um, the Army watercraft associated with them. So there have been studies on the Army watercraft. So what we need to do, when I say we, meaning the Army, how, how many watercraft do we really need? to sustain in Pacific theater? How are we maintaining those watercraft? Do we have enough? So I think it's worth um, senior leaders kind of pulling that thread a little bit and doing it, conducting a study to ensuring that we have enough watercraft and that those watercraft are actually being maintained, maintained to a level that they need to be maintained and not just hovering around 37% because at one particular time, the, the Army watercraft fleets were, the readiness rates were dipped as, as low as that 37%. So we have to ensure that we are maintaining the level of our readiness for Army watercraft at a high level because we don't know when we may need those Army watercraft. Because when you look at modernization on the logistics side, we, ha we still have enduring equipment. So as we're modernizing and bringing new equipment online, we're still trying to maintain um, our enduring equipment set. So that's a challenge for some of our logisticians out there. And as we're bringing new equipment abroad, ensuring that we have our maintainers that's trained and that they have the right tools to maintain this new equipment. Those are the key things that we have the right equipment prepositioned globally, and this equipment is maintained, and that is also exercised, meaning that this equipment is being downloaded and that it is supporting joint exercises. Joint meaning all services, allies, and partners are utilizing this equipment. You know, the more we can touch the equipment, it is being utilized. This it's that muscle memory. It's the people knowing and understanding what capabilities they have to bring to bear. That come back to command the understanding that we have this resource that's associated with this theater that I can use. So all of that is important when I start thinking about how we sustain operations in the Pacific. When we start talking about new equipment being fielded in that theater, just ensuring that our maintainers are being trained to maintain this new equipment while at the same time maintaining the enduring fleets uh, that we have. So that's gonna be equally as important. And so as we move to sustainment 2030 and beyond, we have this whole predicted log logistics that's on the table now. So I know our AMC commander, he's doing a great job with that, CASCOM commander, they're doing great thing, predicted logistics. So that's the wave of the future. I'm excited about that. I'm telling you, logistics can't win a war. We all know that. But I'm here to tell you that logistics, if not done correctly, can cause a defeat. So we have to pay attention to all logisticians and some of the challenges with logistics. And we have to do the things now to get ahead of these challenges and confront, confront logistics head on and attack those things. And I know that our senior leaders are doing that. And again, I'm just proud to be a part of that. And I hope that my research and that when people kind of read the research and the paper to that, they, they can walk away with, you know, some little antidote to say, hey, you know, just, you know, this, this paper kind of highlights certain things. And that that's the hope of this. Um, like I say, some of the things in in my research, some senior leaders, some of the senior leaders are already working towards that. But I just kind of wanted to highlight my 30-something years of logistics in the army, things that I've seen on the ground that I felt like just putting it out in the paper, hoping that senior leaders would read the paper, that they can understand from my level. I kind of went through the ranks from an enlisted officer to a colonel in the army. So I've seen a lot of logistics and again, um, hopefully this paper will 
kind of nights people to to focus a little more on logistics and not let it be the last conversation or a conversation after after we've gone through everything, just understanding that logistics is very important. And as we start talking about any type of exercise, we should always ask ourselves, hey, where is my logistics counterpart? If they're not in the room, let's pause and let's find that G4 because this is important. Our next speaker will be David Sturman, who is a senior policy analyst here at uh, Future Security in New America, also a research fellow at ASU's Future Security Initiative, and you know one of the, the key forces behind the book mentioned earlier called Understanding the New Proxy Wars. And he's going to be talking about the state of America's counterinsurgency wars. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so as mentioned, I'm a senior policy analyst here and affiliated with the ASU's Future Security Initiative. And I'm going to be talking about America's various counterterrorism, drone, and counterinsurgency wars, which are in a moment of substantial change right now. As we all know, the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan in 2021. And as far as we know, at least publicly, the United States has only conducted a single drone strike in Afghanistan since then. That drone strike killed <clears throat> the leader of al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahiri. Beyond Afghanistan, the number of U.S. strikes, whether you count it as a global total or whether you want to zero in on particular theaters, is also at an unprecedented low. However, um, and in addition, in October, um, in October 2022, the Biden administration released new rules with more restrictive guidelines on the use of direct action outside of areas of active hostilities, which was publicly released in redacted forms this summer. But there are three important cautions that I want to emphasize and I think are important to understanding the state of America's wars today. First, while most strikes are at unprecedented lows, the trajectory is not downward in every war. U.S. strikes are actually escalating in Somalia. Where the <clears throat> Biden when the Biden administration took office, it paused U.S. strikes in Somalia and many other locations. Indeed, our count at New America, where we track these strikes, has the Biden administration conducting only four airstrikes in its first year in office in Somalia. And there were seven more in the first month um, or partial month under the Trump administration. However, this year, which is still not over, we have tracked 17 U.S. airstrikes in Somalia and a ground operation. Importantly, most of these strikes are occurring under an exception to the new rules regarding U.S. strikes, the allowance for collective self-defense of partner organizations. This goes to show the importance of looking at the trajectories in their particular conflict context, that not only are there cases, or at least one case, where it is escalating, but it is escalating and increasing and decreasing at various points in relationship to a specific ongoing conflict, which is not purely decided by the United States. Second, the decline in strikes um, that we've seen produces unprecedented reduction in strikes is a much longer trend than it is often given credit for. Um, there have been no strikes, for example, reported in Pakistan since 2018, so we're now at half a decade. In Yemen, there was an unprecedented spike in strikes to more than 130 under the Trump administration in 2017. But what is often not told in discussions of the number of strikes is that the strikes then fell to be in line with what was occurring under the Obama administration in the late years, and then actually fell to almost zero with a couple um, strikes against significant leaders, at least according to our tracking, by the end of the Trump administration. In Libya, U.S. strikes actually spiked under the Obama administration. Why? Because there was an operation to retake a specific city in Libya, CERT, and that actually wrapped up um, before the end of the Obama administration. Hence, that involved hundreds of strikes and was led into a Trump administration 
ongoing with a couple occasional strikes that eventually uh, petered out. In Iraq and Syria, there's often a lot of discussion of a major spike in strikes and casualties under the Trump administration. And indeed, there was an increase in the early Trump administration. However, it is also important to note that that aligned with the efforts to retake major cities in Iraq and Syria that were held by ISIS. And were, while there may be an effect of administration decisions and different roles regarding strikes, was also in large part a product of a preset campaign that was already going on to um, crush the Islamic State's territorial caliphate. Finally, um, and then what we see now, this current reduction was actually prefigured again at the very end of the Trump administration, with very few strikes once territory, ISIS's territorial hold was smashed. Uh, Again, these examples caution against focusing on the particular legacy of administrations rather than the longer term campaigns which often cross administrations. Finally, we need to be cautious about what we know. Take for example, Yemen, where this year there were reports of a mystery drone strike in the government of Marib, actually two that killed senior Al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula leaders. Do we know whether it was the United States? We actually do not. CENTCOM denies conducting the strikes. However, it could be a covert US strike. It could also be by a US partner. Unfortunately, the current setup of the way that strikes are confirmed or denied leaves a lot of room open for this kind of confusion. <clears throat> and it's particularly important when we seem to see strikes that bear sort of markers of what could well be a U.S. strike in these two cases in January and February of this year, specifically use of a technology, um, the R9X or Ninja missile that is believed to be potentially a U.S. signature, targeting high-level Al-Qaeda figures that could conceivably fit under the new roles, um, even without a declaration that Yemen is an area of active hostilities. And just generalized reporting from the region, even as we have no acknowledgement from the US side, even anonymous claims regarding whether this was a US strike. Similar issues regarding challenges of whether a strike is the United States or not have popped up in Somalia recently, as well as in Afghanistan. So in conclusion, I want to leave you with three core points about this moment of significant change when the number of US strikes and other operations has radically declined. First, um, just the intensity is declining, and that's an important thing to know. But the trajectory, again, is not consistent across every location and could well re-escalate in some conflict areas. Second, the trend began well before the Biden administration and is in large part connected to the ups and downs of specific campaigns and should be analyzed thusly. And third, we just need far greater transparency to be able to know when strikes are occurring, when strikes occur and they're not the United States, and when they are US strikes. That undergirds the entire understanding of when the United States does or does not kill civilians, but also major strategic questions. And with that, thank you. Our next panel is What is the Future of Afghanistan? Um, with Peter Bergen and um, Martin Beck, who you will introduce. So, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, sorry about our technical problems here. Our whole college um, will either fix it or broadcast that particular part of the program at some later date. So, we're very lucky to have Martin Beck here, who was a former chief of staff for uh, President Ghani. Uh, he was in Kabul on August the 15th, 2021, when the Taliban took over. He was in the presidential palace, um, and he was quite surprised when President Ghani suddenly disappeared. Uh, he's also a fellow at New America. Um, and so there are basically three or four questions that we, we wanted to discuss. Let's begin perhaps with something that uh, Mateen mentioned to me this morning, which is the National Counterterrorism Center put out a, on September 11th, 
put out a assessment that Al Qaeda was basically more or less over in Afghanistan, which is uh, very different from an assessment in June. The United Nations said that there were 400 members of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. Some of them had positions in the Taliban administration. Some of them were collecting welfare payments from the Taliban. Um, so, Mateen, so first of all, uh, what do you think about the claim two, two days ago that Al Qaeda was more or less out of business that was put forward by the US government? Uh, first, thank you, Peter, for having me. Uh, I was surprised when I read about the report. Uh, let me elaborate a little bit further. Uh, the report looks, sounds to me more politically uh, tailored, in a way politically motivated, to do with the US cycle of election. So I have worked in the Afghan intelligence service back in 2015, from 2015 until 2017. I was number two in the Afghan intel service in charge of the domestic intel intelligence. So I've worked closely with the um, CIA, MI6, with other agencies, with our partners in Afghanistan, actively against the Al-Qaeda and other terror outfits. My perception of, or my impression of the report is that the report is based, uh, first, main factor determining this report is uh, the U.S. intelligence community's interaction with the Taliban, with DGI, Director of Intelligence, the Director of Intelligence. Mainly in Doha it happens. Uh, as far as I know, there has, there's a channel to do with the, when the Doha talk started, this channel was established. So they actively pass uh, mainly exchange information and also time to time, I assume, uh, there's some intel passes to the Taliban regarding the ISIS-K, like Daesh, Khorasan branch. So the Taliban's claim to the American is that there's a significant reduction in the activity of uh, Daesh in Afghanistan. So the verification mechanism, I believe, is the signal intelligence. And uh, so the signal intelligence, of course, shows a reduction. Why? Um, as anyone who is uh, have a deeper understanding of the Saudi Asia, uh, the terror landscape, knows that the terror outfits there, especially in past two decades, of American massive reliance on the technology, they know how to avoid signal intelligence or other technical means. Uh, so my understanding and also reports from the ground is that Daesh or ISIS-K for time being, uh, they are not launching any attack against the Taliban. That's what I've heard from many sources so there is a reduction. So the talk about it, or the reports we get from the ground, is they are, because recently, after some of high-profile Daesh attack against Taliban, the, Tal the Daesh was under tremendous pressure. And I think it's more to do with the signal intel the American passed to the Taliban. So now Daesh is kind of reconsidering their modus operandi, and they're going silent for a time being. So that, in a way, that's silent or being a, even some people talk of tactical ceasefire, that shows a reduction of violence. That's second. Uh, so these two factors, maybe if, if someone doesn't have a better understanding of the South Asia, may believe this is real. So that Daesh is not a threat, trust, or it's kind of reduced. Second, on the question of Al-Qaeda, uh, I think it's very naive to assume that Al-Qaeda doesn't have a presence in Afghanistan or doesn't threat, pose a threat uh, to the global security. So just 
looking, I mean, it doesn't take much time, just looking at the local media or follow reading news on Pakistan, you will figure out what's going on inside Pakistan right now, how TTP have increased its operation, cross-border operation inside the Pakistan, and that speaks for itself. TTP being the Pakistani Taliban. Exactly, yeah. So, uh, again, my conclusion is, uh, unfortunately, this report or this assessment is more politically motivated. And it doesn't match uh, to the ground reality, first, and second, to the two reports with the UN, one in May, as you mentioned, the other one in July, uh, of the anal analytical support and the uh, sanction monitoring team of the Security Council came out and talked the details about it. Yeah, these UN reports are very thorough and they're based on member states reporting. It's not just the United States assessment, it's many states. And uh, I found them, to, generally speaking, to be the most accurate um, assessment of what's going on, certainly that's available publicly. Okay. And um, in one of the previous reports, the UN said that Siraj Akhani, who's the Minister of the Interior, which is like running DHS, FBI, CIA, is uh, on the leadership council of Al-Qaeda. Of course, the Akhanis have been sort of co-located with Al-Qaeda for decades. So anyway, I'm skeptical of the idea that Al-Qaeda is sort of out of business. Now, on the other hand, um, you know, they haven't announced a new leader. Ayman al-Zawari was killed in July of 2022 in downtown Kabul. Uh, he was living there with the knowledge of Taliban officials, according to the Biden administration, um, which kind of speaks for itself. But the fact that they haven't appointed a new leader, uh, so what, what does that suggest to you? Well, they may have appointed a new leader. They haven't published his name. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think <laughs> for Al-Qaeda, I mean, Afghanistan is now a safe haven. And if anyone is, like, let's put us ourselves in their shoes, it would be very stupid to do anything at this moment. It's the best time. I think they're learning from the three decades of presence in the region. They're reorganizing, building their bases, and even reports of new other members relocating inside Afghanistan. And at the same time, uh, they are trying to help this narrative of Talibans are sticking with the Duhadi. So I think it's a time of consolidation for the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Um, Al-Qaeda members are in Taliban's uh, intel service, the director of you call GDI, General Director of Intelligence, and a few Afghan members of that Al Qaeda is actively there working, and also some governors, which was in the report highlighted. Uh, my understanding is uh, Afghanistan right now, unfortunately, have turned to a headquarter of terrorism. Yeah. In the short term it would not pose an immediate threat to the United States. It's already posing threat more to the region. Look to Pakistan, already two cross-border attacks in Tajikistan, two ISIS-K attacks inside Iran originated from Afghanistan. So uh, the ground realities or the reports we get from the ground speaks differently. Yeah. The UN report also said there are 20 terrorist groups operating in Afghanistan, which um, I think speaks for itself. Um, and the other thing which is interesting about the UN report is the United States, when it left, uh, the Taliban um, now have 70,000 armored vehicles, more than 100 helicopters. Uh, the UN report suggests there's $8.5 billion of military equipment that was left behind, the Taliban now has. $8.5 billion is more than the defense budget of a lot of European countries. So the Taliban's very well armed. Uh, there is no meaningful armed resistance, I don't think. I mean, obviously you have Ahmed Shah Massoud's son leading the resistance, but he's in Tajikistan. And it seems to me, just as, as an outsider, that the attacks that the, the, what the armed resistance is doing is pretty limited to Panjir and isn't really that significant. Uh, am I, what do you think about 
the armed resistance. They seem to be getting almost no resources from any country. They have some kind of presence in Tajikistan, but this is not like Ahmed Shah Massoud's resistance to the Taliban before 9-11, where he had access to Tajikistan. It, he was also pretty weak by the time 9-11 happened, but he was in the country, and he was obviously then, you know, helped. We were able to ally with the Northern Alliance and overthrow the Taliban. So, so what's your assessment of the of the of the internal armed resistance to the extent it exists? If we would go a little further before answering this question, I would like to address the Doha deal, which kind of killed any potential armed resistance. So if you see the history of Afghanistan or the region, mainly Afghanistan, most of the, you know, say, regime change or any things in Afghanistan is kind of foreign-driven in a way. Uh, unfortunately, the Doha deal undermined the Afghan state, which was built by American blood and region and Afghan together. There was a counter-terrorism capability in place. Uh, with the Trump administration and with the Biden's, uh, President Biden's announcement of complete withdrawal, kind of give a sense to the Afghan that uh, Taliban is the future. So, in a way, we lost Afghanistan not through a military defeat, mainly through policy defeat or, or political defeat. So this itself killed an arm, future armed resistance mm. because Afghans are survivalists, you know, much better than anyone else. They always look. The other day when I was talking with a, one of the, uh, the freedom fighters, this Mujahideen against the, the Soviet, he, he said something very interesting to me. He uh, said, during those days, uh, when you would ask uh, an elders in a village, like this, who's in charge of this place? Are you with the Mujahideen or the, the communist regime? The elder would say, whoever controls this area, this hell top, I'm his subject in a way. So people are seeing the wind, what the wind of change. Now, the way things have been with the Doha deal and with the continuous talk with the Taliban, so Afghans are kind of suspicious what's happening. So they, of course, fed off with the Taliban, but they're still seeing what direction United States will take. It doesn't mean United States have to go back in a military way. No. In a political way, what is the big game? What is the bigger decisions? So that's one of the major factor for the armed resistance, any resistance inside the country to pick up first. Second, after August 2021, some of former ANSF members and also some of former Northern Alliance launched some sort of uh, resistance. But uh, of course, it was difficult, as you mentioned earlier. Um, uh, logistical support, the weapons, and the way the Taliban came to the power. Uh, it still is very small, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it has not been able to politically expand itself. It's become very narrow in a way, uh, but uh, the armed resistance is there. It's not completely died, but as a forces there, beside that, the women of Afghanistan are protesting. There are a lot of other forms of resistance. But mainly, uh, I would say, because I'm in touch with a lot of former ANSF members, tribal elders and others, they're looking for the, how the wind of politics change in Washington. The reason why I mentioned Washington, Washington is very important because from since 1979, uh, our destiny has been tied with Washington. So uh, uh, I think it's a lot to do with here. And, and the, it, 
if things are not, if people are not coming up in a massive protest, doesn't work against Taliban. We all know they have like what sort of regime they are. But people are waiting that what the bigger politics become, then they will decide. So the Taliban right now, are, you know, they're well entrenched. They don't face any real in internal opposition. They're well armed. But things can change. And so if you go back to December 2011, then Vice President Biden and uh, Tony Blinken negotiated the US withdrawal from Iraq. Three years later, um, Obama sent American troops back into Iraq because, first of all, ISIS was threatening genocide against the Yazidis. And then, as we heard earlier today, they, kid they kidnapped and murdered Jim Foley and, and other American journalists and aid workers. And there are still 2,500 American troops in Iraq today, which interestingly is exactly the same number of troops that was kind of keeping a lid on things in Afghanistan in uh, the beginning of 2021. So what do you think, you say that Washington is obviously so important to kind of the way Afghanistan uh, and Afghans see the world. What do you think could change realistically? You know, are they just going to be there forever, uh, the Taliban, or are there particular things that could change the politics either in Washington or in the region or in Europe or elsewhere where suddenly uh, this kind of de facto acceptance of the Taliban as the, as the government, even though no government, they're not recognized by any country, but they are in charge. What could change that situation? Well, I, the people talk about many scenarios and uh, the way I see the activities on the ground and the way the Taliban came to the power, uh, Talib itself as an umbrella is a threat to the region and global security. And probably I, what I would suggest be kind of Odd, not fashionable in today's global politics because now it's more about revival of a great power competition. But what I see is uh, for the United States and also regional countries um, to work together. So from like the beginning, if I, we go a little bit in the history, of course Pakistan initially undermined the U.S. presence in Afghanistan for various reasons. After 2010, it was Iran, Russia, China. They start heavily supporting the Taliban. But today, they already see it's becoming a threat. Look, the incident in Pakistan, the activities in the border of Tajikistan, and the attacks inside Iran. And also, which one thing we don't talk is about ETI, Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement which is the Uyghurs, and there's a bigger number in the northeast of Afghanistan, where I came from. And from 2014, after the security transition, they were the one who changed the security in favor of Taliban in the northeast. So they're a threat to China as well. So right now, Taliban's are playing very smartly. He's smartly in a way flirting with the China and Russia, at the same time flirting with the United States. So using Today I was seeing the news, they're giving a very red carpet welcome to the new Chinese ambassador. Definitely, it's, it's very, the message is very clear. They're trying to give a message to the United States. I think we shouldn't be a victim of this sort of uh, play. Now, the United States has a lot of expertise on the region. But the good thing is also, the region is also realizing it's a threat to them as well. So the best way is back. We come go. We go back to the history after post 9/11. There was a consensus. So on Afghanistan, at least there's a consensus, kind of forming again. So the best way is, I think, United States as a state as a leader of free world, also is still as someone uh, shaping the global politics and in the past two decades have invested a lot in Afghanistan. More than one million American 
military and civilian served in Afghanistan. The veterans are very active. I see, I talk with them on Afghanistan issues. So uh, probably it's ended for certain politicians, but it's not ended for the people. So my suggestion would be uh, before it's becoming too all, I mean, late, it would be good for the United States to lead this and to form a consensus with the region and on a, before Afghanistan become more descent into chaos in a civil war or this total groups becoming more consolidated, I think United States has to use its leverage. Even Taliban's are desperate for recognition. But, but all this has to put a price. Maybe we need a constitutional order in Afghanistan where all the Afghans come together. That could be bring peace and stability in the region, also counter other terror organizations. So probably look idealistic, but it's one of the way forward. Already everyone is talking, United States talking separately. Iran talking separately with the Taliban. Chinese, everyone is doing their own bilateral security things with the Taliban. So what I'm suggesting is maybe something bigger, a consensus, something we have to learn from the fourth decade, if we say the, from 1979 or the past two decades, listen, learn from Afghanistan. Because that region, the terror landscape in Saudi Asia is very fluid. You know it very well than anyone else in this room. How Taliban, Al-Qaeda, even the current leadership of ISIS-K, they were former Taliban or former Al-Qaeda. They knew each other very well. So we shouldn't say that threat is not gone. So, yeah. But so it's the problem, you know, the Taliban is not recognized by any country. And the last time they controlled Afghanistan, they were recognized by three countries, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and um, Pakistan. But it's a, I mean, there's a policy dilemma, which is uh, 40 million Afghans, uh, who are, many of whom are close to starvation. There's no jobs. The economy is completely collapsed. Um, and the Taliban are the de facto government. So how do you deal with a government you, you, uh, you know, if, whatever you do to help Afghans ultimately is going to help the Taliban, right? So, how if you're, you know, if you're a U.S. policymaker, it's tough because there are certain things you do want from the Taliban. If you have dual nationals who are in ta Taliban custody, of which I think there are several, uh, you're trying to negotiate their release. You're also trying to, you know, make sure that. Um, Afghans don't starve. How do you deal with the, with the Taliban in such a way that you're not propping up the regime? It's an interesting question because, um, and also the dilemma exists, we won't talk. Yeah. And any, I mean, already the reports are out around 28 million Afghans need human, humanitarian assistance. And like life saving. It's, uh, it's, it's, this is one of the biggest humanitarian crises at the moment. Um, the fear, the reason why Afghans are wising of the engagement with the Taliban, like wising their, their voices against engaging against the Taliban, uh, for reason, because when we look back the history, like Doha deal, what happened? And the kind of over of Afghan government to the Taliban. Same with Afghans of fear, kind of an engagement or talk with the Taliban might lead in a way to rec their recognition or normalizing their gender apartheid regime, yeah. right? So the, the way forward is very difficult. It's not easy, but, uh, even the Doha deal being so flawed, there are, was things inside that could be used for a, for a joint or peace in Afghanistan, something a joint government will emerge from the Republic or the Taliban. So it's still the Taliban is sticking to that deal. They're saying we're committed to that. So what happens to the inter-Afghan side of it? That could be revived. Second. By uh, whom? Uh, by whom? But by, by 
if international community, because they're asking yeah. all the time financial support or recognition. Yeah. So any legitimate government in Afghanistan should have come out of the process. So one of the processes is this. Yeah. Th that's what I'm saying is the United States has to put this condition because the United States is the signatory of that deal. That's not a popular deal in Afghanistan. But it's better than nothing. There's a framework in place. So that could be used one way. And uh, second, uh, there has been call, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a need for a principle, like principle engage. Why, why the world need to engage with the Taliban? For what? That has to be clear. That engagement only for humanitarian assistance or other things might lead, in a way, normalizing their behavior which is happening right now. Yeah. So it's better to have a better policy, I think, we have. I, I don't agree with the other, like saying, we don't have many options. There are options still. There are many options on the, on the table. And the other thing, the Taliban, the way I know them, I have been talking with them, and we have fought and talked. Uh, they always think the world especially the United States, doesn't have a consistent policy. So it will, it will keep changing and keep changing. So they're saying, why we have to change? They will change. And they're right in a way because the United States, have, since 2001, has kept changing its policy in a way which has benefited the Taliban. I think it's time for us to learn from all those past mistakes. And there is, there is still a way forward to correct the course of action. We, the United States closed its embassy in Afghanistan in 1989 uh, after the Soviets withdrew. That turned out to be a, a mistake. Um, we don't have, the United States doesn't have any kind of diplomatic presence in Afghanistan. I guess it has a, a de facto embassy in Doha and maybe in Uzbekistan. But should the United States re seriously consider reopening its embassy or should other Western countries, I mean, obviously, China, Iran, they all have their embassies, Pakistan. Should Western countries open consulates or some, or if not an embassy, at least have a diplomatic presence? I'm mean, understanding that that has the danger of normalizing, etc. I mean, as the previous speaker, Ambassador, mentioned, like validating the authoritarian regime, Sometimes it's, uh, I say jokingly, it's, uh, it's not to be good for, to be too close to America, and also uh, as a big enemy, you know, it's dangerous for you. I think that it's kind of the way you see America has always have a tendency to, you know, punish its own allies mm. uh, and, <laughs> and rewards the enemy. So on that point, that that's, following his argument, I would say uh, this is the least Afghan expect from, I mean, Afghans already angry with the decision of President Trump and by President Biden. Yeah. And the and, uh, United States invested so much in that country. A generation was coming up, you know, Democracy was flourishing. Women you were, were one of those generations. Yeah, you were yeah, one part. Th yeah, thousands of us. Like, but I mean, you're you were. How old were you on 9/11? I was in ninth grade. Right. So you saw this whole, whole generation come up. It was connected to the outside exactly. world. Exactly, and 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 the Afghan was connected, and and I think it was becoming a source of hope. A lot of regional countries was jealous of that. Uh, I think this whole thing shouldn't have ended the way it ended. And uh, we could have still, with a little bit of maturity and patience, uh, a country, two decades of war, like active American presence, you cannot end that in one night, in one year. So negotiation needs patience. 
and also easily, because I was a member of negotiating team. And before that negotiation, before the, uh, the U.S. signing the Doha deal, we warned the Americans in Doha, in Kabul, in Washington, because I was part of a dialogue with the Taliban, and the only leverage was the withdrawal. We just, United States, just give it easily to the Taliban. So, on the opening, I think, no, as I mentioned earlier, the opening of embassies has to be connected to a condition, to a thing. Yeah. Otherwise, you just validate their point. You mentioned the, you know, the, Trump, the, the point. Trump and Biden administration, you know, they, the Trump administration did the withdrawal deal with the Taliban, which kind of gave the Taliban everything they wanted, and the Biden administration went through with it. But obviously, they're not the only pl pe political actors that made mistakes. And so how do you grade the, the Ghani administration? I mean, you were President Ghani's chief of staff. You were in the palace the day the Taliban took Kabul. What mistakes did the Afghan, did Afghan politicians make? Well, I mean, uh, that is uh, one of the main internal factor for the collapse. Um, if I would highlight the mistakes we made, uh, um, President Ghani, the style of governance and politics, because he took or he understood or perceived the negotiation more personal. He thought the whole negotiation is to remove him from power. And took it more personal. The rivalry of uh, Ambassador Khalilzad and President Ghani in a way undermined the US and Kabul relationship. That's one factor. And second, uh, President Ghani because in 2020, I left the government. I was a member of negotiating team. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, he taught the whole this process is to oust them from power. Instead of he preparing for a, a war without American support, he prepared for a scenario where there will be a deal. He's not there. He has to object it. So there, he brought a massive change in armed forces. Didn't allow the armed forces to have nurture its own leadership. So saying, because army was already, f I mean, Taliban and also, because we had a stalemate. Both sides was tired of fighting. So saying a deal comes like that. If his interest is not included, the army might impose that on him. So he actively removed all the, uh, our best commanders, best generals from the, from the army corps, from brigade. From, so a massive engineering happened in the army, in our intel service, in our police service, in our local governance. When after, in April 2021, when President Biden announced a complete withdrawal, didn't stick. He was expecting Biden might change the policy of Trump, but no, he didn't. He went with the withdrawal, so everything crashed. So we had warned them in 2019, in July 2019, after a dialogue with the Taliban, we should not hold the presidential election because that is more, bring more uh, tension. tension domestically. The country is already facing an existential threat and the peace process are going, so we need to be united. But he hold, election was a major mistake, that presidential election, because no one participated and it showed a shallow of the republic system, and the country became more divided. Uh, so I would say uh, we are as responsible as uh, here. Uh, so President Ghani and all of us are really responsible for that. I mean, kind of, he expedited the collapse of the republic. The republic could resist. The republic had resources. The republic had a better armed forces. So our, when, when this Doha deal was being negotiated, uh, we came with a, with a theory that this deal will not bring peace, but it's an opening for us. So we should prepare for a time when Americans will withdraw, then Taliban will, have a st will keep talking. Yeah. But the talk will not give any result. So because Taliban believe whether the American support will collapse. So whether the American support, we should be able 
to take the war in another stalemate. Then the real negotiation will start. So we didn't prepare for this scenario. You know, yeah. That was one of the major We have time reasons. for maybe one question, if there is a question. Um, and if there, if there isn't, um, I will uh, thank Mateen Beck very, uh, for his insights. And uh, let's hope that um, some people are listening to the, uh, to the ideas that you have, uh, because I don't think the Taliban are going to be in power forever. I think embedded in their DNA, they're going to make some mistakes. They might start recruiting Europeans. You know, um, they might also engage in ethnic cleansing against the Hazaras, which they did in the past. Uh, they, uh, there might be attacks against an American target in the region that be, you know, from traceable to Afghanistan. So things can change. And so, anyway, thank you very much, sir. Thanks for having me. Our next panel, or rather, our next, our next presentation is a video um, called How is the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force Approaching the Future of Security? It's our colleague Peter Singer, strategist and senior fellow in New America, professor of practice in the Future Security Initiative at ASU, interviewing uh, General Uchikura Hiroaki, the chief of staff of the Jap Japan Air Self-Defense Force. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce General Hiroaki Uchikura, Chief of Staff of Japan's Air Self-Defense Force. His roles and accomplishments over three decades of service range from piloting F-15 fighter jets to serving as Director General of the Defense Planning and Policy Department to Commander of Air Defense Command. But most important to me personally is that we were able to serve together when he was a military fellow in Washington, D.C. And I got to know Uchi both as a friend, but also witness uh, how he is an amazing researcher and writer, very appropriate to our gathering today. And during that time, he conducted uh, research and wrote a white paper on how interoperability is about more than just technology. It's about partnership. And I think that's a relevant lesson both for the conference, but also for the larger relationship between the U.S. and Japan. General, thank you so much for joining us. We'll start now with a question um, from uh, what's going on in the world around us. General, what lessons are you taking from what we've observed in the conflict in Ukraine? I am General Chikura, Chief of Staff of Japan Air Self Defense Force for Cobra Jetai. I'd like to express my gratitude to Dr. Singer, who invited me to this historic Future Security Forum. I have cherished my relationship with him since I was a fellow at the Brookings Institution. It is my great honor to be here today on behalf of Cobra Jetai. The views that are going to be expressed today are those of mine and do not affect the official policy or position of Koku Jedi, Ministry of Defense, or the government of Japan. Let me briefly talk about the lessons learned from the situation in Ukraine from two perspectives. The first one is at the strategic level, and it is the importance of deterrence to discourage aggression and the ability to respond in case of a contingency. The biggest lesson that we have learned from Russia's aggression against Ukraine is that it is critical to maintain sufficient vigilance to restrain opponent actions. We now see that when a country with strong military capability forms the intention to launch an aggression, it is inherently difficult to gauge its intent from the outside and conditions under which a threat may materialize always exist. Also, while no nation alone can defend its own security, there is a renewed recognition of the importance of not only strengthening our own defense capabilities, but also enhancing interoperability, which includes the commonality of aircraft and weapons and the connectivity 
of network that enable cooperation at a higher level with the ally, we have the intent and the capability to respond to invasion in a coordinated manner. Considering both vigilance and response perspective, it is also necessary to reinforce cooperation and collaboration with the allies, like-minded countries and others. The second key point is from an operational level, and it is the necessity of defense capabilities that can adapt to a new way of warfare. In the aggression against Ukraine, hybrid warfare has emerged with a combination of massive missile strikes by ballistic and cruise missiles, asymmetric attacks leveraging the space, cyber, and electromagnetic domains, and with a manned assets and information warfare. With this in mind, we have reached a recognition that it is urgent for us to build advanced integrated air and missile defense where we can combine kinetic and non-kinetic means appropriately. In the concept of IAMB, it is also vital to strengthen passive defense capability to mitigate damage and ensure functionality through dispersion, concealment, and camouflage, damage restoration, and others, as well as active defense capabilities such as air defense and ballistic missile defense. When I participated in NATO exercise Air Defender 23 in Germany in June, which focused on dispersed deployment, I exchanged views and shared this recognition with air chiefs from participating countries. General, as you look beyond Ukraine, other key trends that you observe shaping the future of security, and in particular, what scenario of the future might be the most challenging? I think there are two key trends. First, there is a global trend known as geopolitical competition. Looking at the Indo-Pacific region, where Japan is located, for example, there are a number of countries causing security concerns. Russia has launched an aggression against Ukraine and shaken the foundation of the international order despite its permanent membership of the United Nations Security Council. China continues to advance its unilateral changes to the status quo by force or such attempts in the East China Sea and South China Sea. North Korea escalates its activities, launches ballistic missiles at an unprecedented high frequency and uh, proceed with the development of nuclear weapons. Therefore, it is important for Japan in cooperation and collaboration with allied and like-minded countries and others to continue to demonstrate the intention and the capability to deter unilateral changes to the status quo by force and such attempts through our strategic alignment and the synergistic effects from our common effort. Based upon this idea, the Koku Jetai has conducted bilateral multilateral training with exercises with Australia, India, Germany, France, and Italy in the past year, with the Japan-US alliance as the cornerstone. The security of the Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific are inseparable. This phrase clearly expresses the recent trend. The second trend is to view security as a comprehensive national power which links the major function of a country, such as democracy. Oh, I'm sorry. Such as diplomacy, intelligence, military affairs, and economy, which is abbreviated as DIME, to technological innovation. 
When it comes to diplomacy and integrity, for instance, it is, it is critical to be able to communicate timely and accurate, accurate information through social media while discerning the authenticity of conflicting information. In terms of military, there is a greater significance of leveraging the space, cyber, and electromagnetic domains, as well as capabilities supported by state of art technologies, such as the use of unmanned systems and drones, in addition to traditional military power. From the viewpoint of geopolitical competition, the most challenging scenario is when an opponent utilizes genetic means such as A to AD, as well as cognitive warfare, with the goal of intentionally decoupling the cooperative and collaborative relationship between Japan and our allies and like minded countries and others, thus attempting to take advantage of opportunity to carry out unilateral changes to the status quo by force and such attempts all at once. Time, especially from a military perspective, presents a scenario where if the war fighting quietly begins in the space and cyber domains, and the C5 ISRT by functions due to unstable communications, significant loss of GPS position, accuracy, etc and existing assets are unable to respond in a timely and appropriate manner. Numerous missiles would be able to fly in and down, causing enormous human and material damage to the political and economic center of state. This would be the worst scenario caused by the negative effect from technological innovation. It used to be hypothetical but now it turns out to be an operational reality, exemplified by aggression against Ukraine, which is now widely viewed as an operational situation to be prepared for. General, as you look at these trends, you have a responsibility not only to respond to them, but also shape the force of tomorrow and 2040 from today? What capabilities might it have that it does not have now? Well, um, considering Koku Jedi's efforts, I'd like to share three big changes that we are anticipating. The first change is the improvement of space oper operational capabilities. Japan's national defense strategy states that the Japan Air Safety Defense Force will be renamed to Japan Air and Space Safety Defense Force. Only three years have passed since the establishment of our first space unit, and it is still at its initial phase. I think it will possess stronger space capabilities by 2040. The second one is an enhancement of traditional air power to defend the air domain. Taking our fighter unit as an example, it is estimated that by 2040, we will operate approximately 150 F-35, including F-35B with stowable capability, 70 upgraded F-15s, as well as next generation fighter aircraft, GCAP that we have currently developing in the UK and Italy. With these aircraft, Hoku Jedi, we have increased capability and flexibility, including the ability to operate standoff missiles. The third change is the progress in unmanned and coordinated systems. In accordance with the Defense Build-Up Program, Hoku Jedi will continue to promote unmanned asset defense capabilities. It is predicted that by 2040, 
in addition to the RQ4B already in place, we will be able to operate some unmanned aerial vehicles linked to this fighter aircraft. We will also promote the automation of various sensors and command control systems, enabling computer dive to be more efficient and capable of performing more missions with fewer personnel. First, regarding space operations, I predict that the Kokuzia dive will possess its capability to carry out wide range of missions apart from space domain awareness, both on the ground and in space. Secondly, it is also expected when it comes to integrated air and missile defense, we will be able to respond effectively to hypersonic weapons and missiles that flies on irregular trajectories at low altitude. Thirdly, we anticipated that the Kokuzia dive will possess stand of defense capabilities, including the capability to independently operate dynamic targeting, which the US military already possesses. Fourth, in order to prevent further attacks from an opponent by utilizing the standard defense capability, it is also expected that we will have counter strike capabilities to mount effective counter strike against the opponent. In each of those trends and capabilities, we see a variety of new technologies. General, um, what technologies do you see as being key to the future? Key technologies for the future will be AI, simulation using VR and AR, and database access technology. First, AI technology is expected to be used in the military field, not only to assist in command and decision making and to improve information processing capabilities, but also to be equipped with unmanned aerial vehicles and used in the cyber domain. Furthermore, generative AI represented by chat GDP is increasingly recognized as having a significant impact on social life. In addition, in order to win the battle where the combat situation will become even more rapid and complex in the future. It is necessary to make quicker and more accurate decisions than those of our opponent. AI plays a major role in improving the decision-making process itself, as well as makes it possible to build a man-on-the-loop system that allows humans to oversee the decision-making process. Second, Simulation technology using VR and IAR is becoming increasingly important as the complexity of combat situations makes it more difficult to create the same situation in actual training and exercise. High fidelity simulators not only enable mission reversals but also contribute to SDGs by reducing the number of flights using actual aircraft. Third, I believe that the technology to share sensitive information stored in databases with other military services and allies in real time is a critical technology as a range of utilization of passive sensors expands at an accelerating pace. Interoperability metrics are beginning to seek from network connectivity to database accessibility. General, I know as both a leader, but also as a writer, that you care deeply about the role of people in the organization. So what new uh, and different skills do you anticipate that military officers will need in this future? I think there are two skills that military officers will need in the future. First is the skill related to 
superiority in decision making. In order to control a battle where combat situations are becoming more rapid and complex, it is necessary to ensure superior decision making by having commanders or staff officers make appropriate decisions more quickly and more accurately than the opponent. Therefore, I think that the commanders who will make decisions in such an environment will need to acquire even more skills than they currently have to observe and orient information quickly and connect it to their decisions and their actions. If we look ahead to the day in the near future when frontline commanders will be using wearable devices such as smart glasses to take command, I believe that the skills required will become in extra capability linked to IT literacy. Second is a skill related to mission command. In a situation where combat conditions are becoming more rapid and complex, it is possible that command and control may be cut off due to the jamming of communications. When a commander can grasp information sufficiently, detailed command in which detailed instructions are given to subordinate commanders for their actions in suitable, is suitable. On the other hand, when the war situation is uncertain and rapidly changing due to disruption of communications, it is appropriate to take mission command delegating decision making and operational execution to subordinate commanders in accordance with the situation. Therefore, I believe that officers will be required more than ever before to have the skills and the mental toughness to deeply understand their own duties, missions, and to be able to command in a timely and appropriate manner even without the instruction and order from their superiors. General, you have been um, very generous with your time and also speaking with us across uh, multiple time zones. We very much appreciate you joining us and sharing your thoughts. Thank you. For our final panel of today, and thanks so much for spending your time with us, is uh, called What is the Future of Cybersecurity? Our colleague Peter Singer uh, doing an interview with uh, General Paul Nakasone, who is the commander of U.S. Cyber Command and also the director of the National Security Agency, chief of the Central Security Service. So again, thank you. and. If I tried to list all of General Paul Nakasone's accomplishments in his over three decades of service to the nation, it would use up all our interview time. So I'll just sum it up by saying that uh, when it comes to national and cybersecurity, he's been there and done that. Uh, his roles have ranged from command at the company, battalion, and brigade level to assignments in the U.S., Korea, Afghanistan, and Iraq, to finally serving as both commander of U.S. Cyber Command and director of the National Security Agency since 2018, during what has been inarguably one of the most dynamic times in not just cybersecurity history, but overall national security. General, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Peter. It's good to see you again. So um, let's jump right in. Uh, as you come to the end of uh, your time in military service, can you take us through how it started and evolved? What were some key lessons that you've learned along the way? Peter, uh, I was commissioned through the ROTC program at the end of the Reagan administration. So I enter an army as a career intelligence officer really at the kind of the height of the Cold War. Uh, and what I see is, first of all, the demise of the Soviet Union. Uh, I see the rise of the Balkans. And then I'm at the Pentagon on 9-11. And I think I would characterize everything in my military experience pre-9-11 and post-9-11. 
And so from the post 9-11, you know, opportunities like many of my peers to serve in Iraq and Afghanistan. But in 2007, I landed the National Security Agency to command a brigade. Uh, and I just happened to be at a time and a place where cyber is taking off. Uh, I've seen our experiences in Iraq where we were able to bring signals intelligence to war fighters in the front end and also seen in 2008 uh, the penetration of our classified networks. And so I'm there for the standup of U.S. Cyber Command. So uh, I guess a person that's been fairly lucky uh, in their experiences through their career. So let's look at um, what's changed over uh, that period of time. Um, let's break it down. Uh, what was the biggest change that you've seen within the military during that period? And then secondly, I'd like to ask you, what's the biggest change in terms of the types of threats that you've been dealing with? Well, so for the military, I, again, I entered the military right after Goldwater Nichols has been signed. And I would tell you the dramatic change in our military is the ability to operate as a joint force. I come into a service, you know, that's very parochial in the late 80s, but by the 90s, we have learned the lesson that it is all about being joint. Uh, and the way that we're going to do things in the future is through a joint force. And my experiences in Korea and Iraq and Afghanistan reinforce this idea that if we're going to have success, it's going to be part of the joint force. And with that comes this realization that with the joint force, we're able to take this concept, this tenet that we've always talked about, intelligence driving operations, and actually make it, make it real. And this is what we have done really since, I would say, since about 2005. So when you say make it real, can you give an, uh, a, a non-classified example to illustrate that for us? Yeah, I, I saw it specifically, you know, uh, in 2006, 2007, all the way in the, the mid-2000s in Iraq and Afghanistan, when you had, first of all, our special operations forces and then our conventional forces take what is you know, incredibly sensitive information from the National Security Agency and be able to utilize that in a series of missions where they're actually able to drive their operations. One mission, three missions, five missions, sometimes multiple missions in a night. And this is not just on our very elite operators, but also on our conventional forces. So let's talk about that threat side of things and the change in it. So over the course of your career, as you laid out, you know, you went from um, having to think about uh, the Warsaw Pact, Soviet Army, to then Iraq, to then um, insurgents, Taliban, to now great power competition. Um, talk to me about how it's not merely the way the threat has changed, but the way that you as a leader have to think about that threat. I think the last portion is really important, Peter, because uh, this idea of critical thinking, being dynamic in your thoughts, is something I've seen very successful leaders do throughout my career. Remember, you know, we come in with uh, really a, a bipolar world where we're all thinking about the Fulda Gap. Uh, we transition to counterinsurgency, violent extremist organizations, and then we're coming back to great power competition, where the lessons that you learn in the late 80s suddenly are coming back in, you know, the mid-2000s. And from that, I, I think that I would say is that, uh, you know, your ability to understand, you know, what are your competitive advantages? How do you think differently about the threat? How do you apply our competitive advantages to the threat are what makes very successful leaders and obviously separates those that have been successful from those that have been less successful as well. So we've got some folks listening who um, weren't around for that uh, lessons from the 80s and the Warsaw Pact that are coming back. Um, what's a particular lesson that you see coming back from that period of a different kind of great power competition, but there are some parallels? Well, I think, you know, we, uh, we come back to deterrence, right? I mean, deterrence is something we all studied uh, as we came into the military in the late 80s. It's something we practiced. I think we, you know, lost a little bit of our operational uh, knowledge of it, you know, as uh, counterterrorism and violent extremist organizations played out, and now it's coming back. But I think what's different and the way that I've seen it in cyberspace is it's not necessarily that our, you know, what we do have changed, but how we do it needs to change. And so when we think about deterrence, how do we use information differently? How do we use intelligence differently? How do we use our technology different to, you know, be able to signal to our adversaries of our capabilities? 
So let's go um, into that area that is uh, fundamentally different because, you know, literally it didn't exist back then, which is um, having to develop cyber strategy. So you've been part of um, doing this at both an organizational, but also a national level. Um, first, what do you see as the essential elements of cyber strategy? Peter, I've seen four different cyber strategies from our department, 2011, 2014, 2018, and now the, the latest one that's coming out uh, in the coming weeks. Really successful strategies, first of all, are able to depict the strategic environment in which we are in. Okay, that's one of the things that's necessary for a strategy. But the big piece that I think successful strategies have is being able to identify the one way or the one mean that we're gonna get to our ends much more successful. And let me give you an example. I think 2018 is a watershed moment in terms of the way the Department of Defense approaches cyber. Everything up to that, we were relatively passive. We'd have an intrusion, we would lose data, we would have an intruder in our networks, and then we would go to, to clean it up. In 2018, we said, this is gonna stop. We are going to have a much more proactive approach. This is defend forward. This is the idea of operating outside the United States to be in, in constant uh, contact with our adversaries to understand what's going on. For US Cyber Command, this is persistent engagement, informing and acting. And so to your question is, you have to describe the strategic environment, but importantly, describe exactly the ways and the means that you're gonna get after to make a difference in what the strategic environment is telling us today. So that's a really interesting that you've been there to witness and, and been part of the creation of multiple different strategies. So um, I'd like to ask you, I'm gonna put on my professor hat. I'd like to ask you um, to evaluate uh, not the strategy itself, but how we build strategy. What does the U.S. do well in terms of the building of strategy? And what do we need to up our game on when it comes to this building, the process of developing strategy in cyberspace? I think the U.S. military uh, does very well at a doctrinal approach, a methodology upon which we build a strategy. We've done this. We have a doctrine that, that uh, identifies how we do it. As Army officers, you learn this in Leavenworth. You learn this at the Army War College. You learn this in your joint force training. It's very laid out. And I think we, we write a lot of strategies. I think the challenge that I see with strategy right now is that we tend to be so siloed within the military that we forget that there's, you know, there's other means upon which we can accomplish our outcomes. How do we look differently at the interagency? How do we look differently at the intelligence community? How do we look differently at the private sector? These are all incredibly important in the environment in which we live today, particularly in the domain in which I operate, which is cyberspace. If you're gonna write a strategy, you're not talking about the private sector, or you're not talking about international partners, what's the value of the strategy gonna be? I, I would say probably less than uh, what you're hopeful. And so I, I think the challenge that we have is we've gotta think broadly about how we're gonna bring different players into and make them a part of our strategy and ensure that we, you know, and somehow incorporate their contributions or what we need from uh, their contributions to be successful on our own ends. Thank you. So you're at a um, uh, important moment of transition, uh, both for the nation, but also for you personally. Uh, as you look back, what are you most proud of uh, in your tenure at Cyber Command and uh, the NSA? And in turn, um, are there any areas of uh, unfinished business, so to speak? Personally, I, I would go back to 2018 and it's the Russia Small Group. Um, I come out of my confirmation hearings knowing that uh, there's gonna be a safe and successful election in the midterms in 2018, or there's gonna be a new commander and a new director of NSA. Uh, and so we got after it very quickly. We brought together the best of NSA and U.S. Cyber Command. He said, hey, this is our end. We're going to get a safe and successful election for the midterms in 2018. And what really kind of grew from that were a number of different ideas that set the course for us at both our agency and command. Things like hunt forward operations. You know, today we've done 50 different operations, 23 different countries, 77 different networks with partners to hunt for adversaries. This is an idea, again, that's, you know, akin to our defend forward, our persistent engagement. It also brings in this idea of the private sector. So in the fall of 2018, we say, 
hey, we found all this malware. Let's look at a, you know, a, a civilian company to see if they've ever seen this malware before. So this private public partnership is actually demonstrated then. And so what grows from the Russia small group is, first of all, on the agency, this idea that we need a cybersecurity directorate. And a year later, we do that. What grows from it is that, hey, what we are doing is not going to change. We're going to do signals intelligence, cybersecurity, and cyber operations at both our agency and command. But the how is dramatically different. We're going to operate in the unclassified space. We're going to operate with public sector partners. We are going to be able to publish things like cybersecurity advisories that we release to the nation and the world. This is different. And this is all from the Russia Small Group. Let me talk a little bit about unfinished business. For us, uh, I've talked about China as the generational challenge for our nation. Our current generation, our children, our children's children. It is a different nation in terms of the competition that we are experiencing now with China. As we look to the future, my sense is, is that we will continue to have this very, very high level of competition. But if we want to ensure that the future is one where we're able to uh, protect our homeland and, and uh, continue to uh, protect our allies and partners, we have to address the challenge that is China. The diplomatic information, military, economic power of this nation is different than we've ever experienced. In terms of the agency, unfinished business for me is really focused on our people. In the next five years, we're gonna hire half of our civilian workforce. We have to think differently about talent management. How do we onboard people? How do we train people? How do we do hybrid work? How do we look at things like well-being that is you know, akin to what we saw, what we needed during COVID-19? And then on the command side, the unfinished business for us really is getting to sustained readiness. Our op tempo has increased dramatically. How do we take service-like authorities and blend them into what we are doing and get the experiences of a force that is always ready and always able to continue to do multiple missions at one time? This is the unfinished business for us, Peter. So as you know, I work in that um, space between both nonfiction, but also sometimes fictional future. So uh, I'm going to ask your help. Um, can you paint a scene of what cybersecurity and cyber warfare will look like 10 years from now? Um, what will be the same? What might be different? Let me begin with what I think the same is. Uh, I think success in the future will always go to uh, the nation or the, the activity that has the best people and are able to leverage the people uh, and being able to apply those people in a manner that uh, gets sufficiently to the end state that they're trying to reach. That's not going to change. I don't think that the nature of warfare is going to change in terms of being uh, violent and bloody and incredibly uh, uh, challenging for a nation state. But here's what I think is going to change. The fact that speed is going to change dramatically. Uh, we see it in our domain. What was once weeks has become days. What has become days have become hours. In the future, it will be down to seconds in terms of what we're going to have to be able to process, what we're going to have to be able to do. Secondly, my sense is that partnerships are going to change. If we are going to be successful, particularly in the domain in which I operate, cyberspace, we have to have a much broader range of partners. We have to have partners that are not only within our government, but are within the private sector, that are international partners, that are academic partners, that allow us to get after very, very tough challenges in a very quick manner. And the last thing that I think is going to change is, is obviously, I think we will see, you know, a, a continuing challenge with regards to uh, how do we leverage the technology that is so quickly changing what we're doing, whether or not it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, whether or not it's encryption, whether or not it's future quantum, these are the things that we're going to have to master as first of all, a joint force, and then obviously as policymakers as well. So you've been very generous uh, with your time. So I'd like to um, close by uh, asking one last question that uh, in many ways is um, you know behind the scenes for uh, some in the audience, uh, particularly those at the start of their careers. Um, is there advice that you would give to someone uh, just entering the field of national and cybersecurity tips for, for how to thrive in the way that you have? So I think I'd begin, Peter, with the idea that um, 
treat your, treat your work a, as both as a profession and as being a professional. Uh, one of the things that I think I've been the beneficiary of has been really a career of continued education. Uh, and whenever I was moving towards another rank or a new job, it seemed like the service had sent me back to further training. This is part of being a professional and being a profession. I've also had the, the great fortune to work with incredible leaders, uh, people that really set the tone both in the policy making and, and also the operational force. Uh, you know, a series of, uh, of different folks on the joint force, uh, a series of folks of army leaders, uh, whether or not it's been Keith Alexander or Stan McChrystal or others, they have really kind of shaped this idea of what a professional does and how they operate. The second piece is, is that I've learned from my experiences that uh, one of the key things that you have to bring to your work is passion. It's passion. I, I mean, you get up in the morning and what you do matters and you feel as though what you do matters and you get excited to go to work. Obviously, some days you're more excited than others. But the key to success here is that find something that you're passionate about. Uh, and when you find that passion, you know, continue to continue to look at being a professional and, and, and enhancing the profession. And the last thing I would share, and this is probably a bit parochial, but I think many in uh, uh, many with my experience would say the same thing. Uh, it comes back in many ways to small unit leadership. When you're a, a rising uh, cadet, uh, before you get commissioned, one of the things that they do is they teach you to be a small unit leader, a fire team leader, a squad leader. And those lessons have never really left me. Set the example, lead from the front, establish and maintain standards, being able to articulate guidance clearly, moral and physical courage. You know, it seemed like at the time when you're learning those things, okay, okay, I got it. But every single job, every single day that I, I, I spend here within the agency and command, I come back to this same principles. And so small unit leadership really was among the most essential things that I learned early in my career. Thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you to our colleagues at Arizona State University. Uh, thank you to um, U.S. Army War College Strategic Studies Institute. Uh, we will share their insights on lessons learned from Ukraine in an upcoming video. Thank you to the James W. Foley Legacy Foundation also for joining. Uh, we're pleased today to continue ASU and New America's partnership as the Future Security Initiative. I look forward to seeing you next year. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Daniel Rothenberg, who's going to thank specific folks at ASU, and then I'll close it out. Yeah, thanks for, for spending some time with us today. And um, we have this unique partnership that binds Arizona State University, you know, one of the largest public research universities in the country, with New America, this innovative, you know, forward-thinking think tank. And we link, we're linked not just by doing events and things like this. We, we have structural connections where we share resources, share team members, have folks work together in all sorts of ways that we're quite proud of. And um, I, I really want to thank ASU leadership because the university has set up a situation where we can do interesting entrepreneurial things that are not typical for, for universities. Um, President Michael Crow, Chief of Staff Jim O'Brien, who opened the, the event for us today, uh, Pat Kenny, our Dean, uh, Magda Inahosa, Dean of Social Sciences, and our school director, Ganesh Marat Teskur. Um, and then we have a whole other team of, of faculty and staff that are just essential to all the things that we get done. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Daniel Rothenberg, for uh, being, you know, uh, <laughs> this partnership started with me and Daniel nine years ago, and it's uh, expanded since. I want to thank New America's president, Paul Butler, Peter Singer for doing a lot of those videos, Jason Stewart, Candice Rondeau, Lillian Corral, Shannon Lynch, Hila Rasul Ayub, Brian Hatfield, Joe Wilkes, and I want to particularly thank uh, Molly Martin, who did a huge amount of work on this, and David Sturman, who also did a huge amount of work on this, and also Angela Spidlatt. So um, thank you for joining us. You get some kind of award for staying the whole day if you, uh, thank you.